On October 7, 2007, 32-year-old Felicia McGuire's disappearance left her family and friends devastated. She was last seen in the Dorchester area of Boston and despite extensive investigations and searches, she was never found. The circumstances of her disappearance were shrouded in mystery and police received reports of suspicious activity by a person of interest. The case eventually went cold, leaving Maggie's loved ones with no closure. Was Felicia targeted by someone she knew? Was she the victim of a random act of violence? Today, we delve into the mysterious disappearance of Felicia McGuire to explore a mystery that remained unsolved for 15 long years until justice was finally served in 2023. But first, if you are new to the channel or haven't subscribed yet, please consider clicking the subscribe button as it helps us and motivates us to create more content for you. So without further ado, let's dive right into this mystery. Dorchester is a neighborhood located in the southern part of Boston, Massachusetts. It is the largest neighborhood in Boston covering a land area of approximately six square miles. Dorchester has a diverse population of over 90,000 people with a mix of ethnicities, including Irish American, African American, Caribbean American, and Vietnamese American. Dorchester has undergone significant development in recent years with new housing and commercial projects, making it an up-and-coming area in Boston. It is in this neighborhood that our story takes us today. Felicia McGuire was born into the picturesque world of Dorchester in 1975. Though her father's name is not known, she was raised by her mother, Erin McGuire, and grew up in a happy home full of laughter and love. In 1997, she gave birth to a baby boy and named him Nicholas Faye. From then on, he became the center of her world. However, the details of who Nicholas's father was and what happened to him are shrouded in mystery. Despite the hardships and challenges that life threw at her, Felicia continued to live in Dorchester with her beloved son and her mother, creating a home filled with warmth and love. She was also in a live-in relationship with a man named David Pena. Despite facing the challenges of being a single parent, she remained devoted to her child's well-being. With unwavering determination, she worked tirelessly to ensure that her child had the best life possible. Her love and dedication knew no bounds, and she went above and beyond to provide for her child, giving him all the care and support he needed. She was a shining example of a selfless and loving mother who put her child's needs above her own and never let the difficulties of life dampen her spirit. It was a cool autumn day on October 7, 2007, when Felicia McGuiver vanished into thin air. The 32-year-old mother was last seen in the neighborhood she called home, which was Dorchester in Boston, Massachusetts. She had been spotted on Rick Stun Street going about her business, but no one knows what happened to her after that. Her mother Sharon's heart ached with the absence of her daughter, and the uncertainty of what happened to Felicia made it even worse. She went through every phone book and every possible contact that she could think of, but it was all in vain. She felt as though she was drowning in a sea of loneliness, and there was no rescue in sight. As days went by, her friends and family grew more and more worried when Felicia failed to contact them. With numerous questions evolving in Felicia's mother's head and after all her efforts, she eventually reported Felicia missing after 10 days on October 18, 2007. As soon as the report was filed, the Boston Police Department launched an investigation into her disappearance. They discovered that Felicia's behavior was unusual and she had stopped communicating with her young son and other relatives, a troubling sign that something sinister might have happened to her. Her family was deeply worried about her safety and well-being as it was not in her nature to disappear without a trace. Where had she gone? What had happened to her? These were questions that remained unanswered, leaving her son and family to grapple with the uncertainty of her fate. As the investigation into Felicia McGuire's disappearance began, law enforcement officials worked tirelessly to uncover any evidence that might help them solve the case. Detectives interviewed family members, friends, and neighbors hoping to piece together a timeline of Felicia's last known movements. They also conducted extensive searches of the surrounding area, including nearby woods and bodies of water, looking for any sign of the missing woman. As the days turned into weeks and the weeks into months, Felicia's family grew increasingly concerned. Where had their beloved daughter and mother disappeared to? The Boston Police Department, too, was troubled by the lack of information surrounding her disappearance. In November of 2013, they took to social media to post photos of the missing woman, hoping for any information that might lead to her safe return. In the post, they described her in detail, her height, weight, hair, and eye color, and expressed their deep concern for her safety and well-being. 
She was a beautiful woman with chestnut brown hair and piercing green eyes that sparkled with life. She stood at a modest height of 5 feet 2 inches and had a medium build weighing around 140 pounds. The search for Felicia had been ongoing for over six long years and with each passing day, the mystery of her disappearance deepened. Despite dedicating an immense amount of resources and time to search for clues, her body had never been found. However, at this time in 2013, after the Facebook post, multiple witnesses' accounts surrounding Felicia's disappearance continued to raise suspicion. According to reports, the first unnamed witness who lived below Felicia and Panna's apartment at that time recalls Panna, her live-in boyfriend, showing up at his door in the early morning hours of October 7, 2007, wanting a ride to his mother's house on Devon Street. He was covered in blood and claimed that McGuire had stabbed him with scissors, but the amount of blood on Pena's shirt suggested something far more sinister had taken place. The witness said that Pena told him that he had shoved Felicia with force against the wall, causing her to hit her head on the bed or dresser. Pena, seemingly indifferent to her fate, stated that he did not know if she was still alive. But the witness's observations did not end there. They also noticed that Pena's right hand was swollen. When asked about it, Pena claimed that Felicia had struck him with a baseball bat. Days later, two other witnesses claimed to have seen Pena come back to the apartment that same night. Pena came back with another man at about 3 or 4 a.m. that night and went upstairs. After some time, they came back down carrying a rolled-up blanket down the stairs, possibly containing Magyar's body. Despite offering to help, the two witnesses were turned away and instructed to mind their own business. Adding to the mystery, another witness reported loaning Pena his brown 2005 Chevy Impala car in exchange for drugs and receiving it back with a broken and cleaned back seat, which could have provided access to the trunk. As the investigation continued, these unsettling details were raising questions about what really happened to Felicia McGuire and were drawing the police's suspicions towards David Pena. Investigators wasted no time and interrogated David Pena about the case. They also learned that he had a history of violence towards Felicia. Love can be complicated and messy, and this certainly seemed to be the case for Felicia and Pena. As Pena revealed to investigators, he was Felicia McGuire's live-in boyfriend at the time of her disappearance, and their relationship was far from smooth sailing. In fact, Pena had previously admitted to being involved in a violent altercation with Felicia at their apartment to the first witness who had spoken to the police. When investigators interrogated him about this, he confessed that Felicia lashed out at him with a pair of scissors, stabbing him in the shoulder. In response, Pena fled the apartment and sought refuge at his mother's house. But when he returned several days later, he was met with a startling discovery. Felicia was nowhere to be found and her possessions had been removed. With no further evidence against him and Pena saying nothing incriminating, police were forced to let him go. After this, the investigation into the murder of Felicia was a grueling journey filled with twists and turns that led to one dead end after another. Every possible lead was chased down. Every scrap of evidence examined, but the case grew colder with each passing day. The pain of Felicia's loved ones was palpable as they yearned for answers. Rumors and speculation circulated for years about the whereabouts of Felicia McGuire, the beloved mother who vanished without a trace in 2007. But in 2017, New hope was sparked as the FBI led a search in a dense wooded area in West Roxbury. The investigation, which lasted for days, was shrouded in secrecy and details were not released to the press, leaving the public wondering what had led authorities to that location. Finally, the truth emerged. The search was indeed connected to Felicia's disappearance and it was a crucial step in the long and arduous journey to uncover the truth. The search led the investigators to a witness who provided them with the shocking revelation that Pena had asked him to help remove items from the apartment, including a rolled-up carpet that was difficult to carry. He further stated that Pena and his accomplices had put Felicia's body in the back of a car and driven away at high speed. The witness who observed this claimed that he immediately suspected there was a body wrapped up in the carpet and blanket. Sadly, his suspicions were correct. The witness eventually helped Pena carry Felicia's body into a wooded area with a parking lot where they abandoned her body. The puzzle was almost complete, except for one crucial piece, the location of Felicia McGuire's remains. Despite multiple leads and witnesses, it seemed that the answer to this question would forever remain a mystery. The witness left the scene before discovering the fate of her remains. To make matters worse, this witness was not familiar with Boston and couldn't provide any clues as to where the body might have been dumped. 
The prosecutor was left with a frustratingly incomplete picture of the crime, unable to bring closure to McGuire's family and loved ones. The Boston Police Department's fugitive unit successfully apprehended David Pena on January 14, 2023, at the Baker County Detention Center in Florida. Pena, aged 33, had an outstanding warrant from Dorchester District Court for a murder charge related to Felicia's case. Pena was also wanted for trafficking cocaine as per an outstanding warrant sought out of Suffolk Superior Court. It has been over 15 years since Felicia vanished from Rockstun Street in Rochester, leaving behind her young son. Pena's arrest may provide some long-awaited answers to her family and friends who have been searching for her all this time. Pena appeared in court for his arraignment on February 15th for the charges brought against him. The case has garnered national attention and this latest development has rekindled hopes of finding Felicia's remains. After more than 15 years of uncertainty and heartbreak, there is finally a glimmer of hope for the family of Felicia McGuire. Despite her body never being found, law enforcement officials have reason to believe that her remains are located somewhere in the Boston area. The news of an arrest has brought some measure of closure to a case that had long remained unsolved. While it could not bring back their beloved Felicia, her family and friends can finally rest assured that someone will be held accountable for her tragic death. Suffolk County District Attorney Kevin R. Hayden expressed his hope that the arrest of 33-year-old David Pena will provide some measure of comfort to Felicia's loved ones. While the pain of losing her can never truly go away, it is hoped that justice will finally be served. Pena is set to appear in court and will likely go to trial very soon. Our hearts go out to Felicia's family and friends during this difficult time. We can only hope that they will find some solace and peace as they continue to heal from this unthinkable tragedy. The case of Felicia McGuire is a heartbreaking story that has lingered for over a decade. However, with the recent arrest of David Pena, there is finally hope for answers and justice for Felicia and her family. The dedication of law enforcement and the support of the community are vital to bringing closure to these kinds of cases. What are your thoughts on this case? Share your opinions in the comments section below. It was May 20, 1990, around 3 a.m. in the morning. The Sunfield vacation destination, Wildwood, was filled with people from around the state and country. As the place is a warm vacation resort, people were spending their time enjoying and partying. 20-year-old Susan Negersmith was having a great time too, but it didn't take long before the boardwalk of Wildwood wasn't fun anymore. At least, not for Susan. Her partially clothed body battered and left for dead were found in the morning behind a popular restaurant called Schellinger's. What could have happened to this 20-year-old girl who was just visiting Wildwood for Memorial Day? Was it homicide or something else? But first, if you haven't subscribed to our channel, please hit the subscribe and like buttons. Now without further ado, let's take a walk through this twisted cold case. Wildwood is a resort city in New Jersey filled with award-winning sandy beaches and world-class boardwalks. It is an ideal family destination to have a fun weekend or a vacation. It is also a place with a bustling nightlife. But the peculiar thing about Wildwood is that it has a crime rate of 1 in 16, which is more than 99% of the communities of New Jersey. And this unfortunate cold case also took place in the resort city of Wildwood. Susan Marie Negar Smith was born on December 30, 1969, in Carmel Putnam County in New York. She was the third child of Kent Nagar Smith. Her father remarried on March 29, in 1986, to Colleen Barker. Susan had two siblings and one step-sibling, Michael Negersmith, Don Stegel, and Emily Negersmith. Susan was pursuing her education in a New York State college, and she completed her second year from the college in February 1990. As an outgoing person, Susan always made her leisure time worthwhile. Be it hiking with her father or exploring the corners of the Adirondack Mountains where her father had a cabin. According to her loving father, Susan loved hiking, just like him. She was a former cheerleader. She used to be one of the most enthusiastic cheerleaders in college, according to her friends. Susan had an interest in skiing as well, and she started skiing from a very young age. She was very good at it, and used to ski competitively as well. That says a lot about Susan and how outgoing she was. Kent Nagger Smith, Susan's father, also expressed in his own words how much Susan loved the beach and the way she enjoyed the freedom of the bright blue ocean. Susan also enjoyed hanging out with her friends and often enjoyed going out on Saturday nights. Her brother, Michael, described his sister as fun. According to him, it was always a time full of enjoyment when he was with his sister. She was just a hazel-eyed, brown, hairy, spunky girl and she liked living her life to the fullest. 
But her promising life was soon about to change, and that change was waiting to devour all the hearts of the people who cared for Susan. It was May 20th, 6th of the year, 1990. And the warm city of Wildwood was cooler than usual. According to people, that Saturday night was around 57 degrees. The nights in Wildwood are filled with youth enjoying themselves and drinking the night away. People usually visited Wildwood for a party vacation. And consuming large amounts of alcohol was usually a part of the party. And that night was no different. People from different parts gathered and packed the boardwalk pubs and bars. Among those people was Susan with her friends. According to a witness, Susan and her friends had booked a motel nearby and had some late night drinks, getting quite intoxicated. After the party, Susan bid farewell to her friends around 11. People saw her being escorted by a man. The man appeared to be around 20 years of age. But in the early hours of Sunday morning, Susan's battered and bruised body was found behind a popular hotel. Shelling us, the events of the previous night weren't exactly clear. Another description of the story was that her friends last saw her around 8 in the evening on Saturday. She left with a man, drunk and intoxicated. But those two stories were not the only stories from that unfortunate day. A stranger believed that he had met Susan that Saturday night and he even wanted to escort her to the motel. But eventually, he left her in the area where she was found dead. When later he was asked if Susan could have been a victim of sexual assault, he replied that she was too intoxicated to be capable of consenting to sex. All the stories were quite different from each other, but they led to only one scenario. Her dead body, which was partially closed near a garbage dump. Her faded blue dungaree jacket was lost. Her pink t-shirt was lifted, and her black dungaree jeans were wrapped around her ankles according to the police. If the first story was true, with whom did she leave and for what purpose? If the second story is true, then who were the so-called friends she went to party with that night? And if the third story was true, what happened after the man left her near that restaurant? There were so many questions, but all were left unanswered. There were so many stories and reports, but what was the real scenario? Susan's body was found on Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m. by two employees of the restaurant Schellinger's. According to the reports, the police estimated that Susan passed away at 3.30 a.m. on May 27, 1990. She was found near a dumpster in an alley behind a popular restaurant called Schellinger's. Schellinger's was famous for its maritime theme and a wide variety of classic seafood. It was located on 3516 Atlantic Avenue in Wildwood. Her body was found in an agonizing condition. Her clothes were partially removed and she had bruises all over her body and bloodstains on her chest. She showed clear signs of being a victim of some sort of sexual assault. Her feet were clean, which meant she did not walk their point. One of her teeth was also chipped. With the superficial evidence of 27 external injuries, signs of an assault, and bruises, it was ruled to be a homicide. An autopsy said that she was assaulted before she took her very last breath. But after the medical examination of Susan's body, the cause of death was changed to accidental. After the second autopsy, a small silver glass was found in Susan's anal cavity. Doctor, Mary and Clayton even found semen in the victim's body, but she never mentioned it until later. On further examination by examiners throughout the state, a suspect's DNA was found vaginally and under Susan's fingernails. Collection of many DNA samples was done, but they did not match any profiles within the system. The medical report stated that the alcohol level in her blood was 0.285%, which was over three times the legal limit at the time. World-renowned forensic pathologist Dr. Michael Baden listed 26 points of trauma and declared that Susan had suffered from mechanical asphyxiation and that her death was accidental. Although asphyxiation requires nonspecific external force to decrease the level of oxygen flow in the bloodstream, the attorney's office refused to elaborate and denied that strangulation or suffocation could have led to the death. In the end, the cause of death remained accidental due to heavy intoxication. However, Susan's father, Kent Nagersmith, was not about to accept this fate. He believed that his daughter was a victim of homicide and he had no doubts about this. Kent knew in his heart that he had to do something to get justice for Susan. Kent Nunga Smith was a senior scientist for Bayer Corporation in 555 White Plains Road in Terrytown, New York before he retired. He was 42 years old when he first heard about his daughter. He was at his cabin in the Adirondack Mountains in Northeastern, New York. He was informed by his son-in-law through a phone call. Kent drove 180 miles to Cape May County Courthouse from Westchester County to visit the hospital. He could not imagine who could have done such a thing to his daughter. 
He knew his poor daughter was a victim of homicide, but that was not what he wanted to hear at first. After burying Susan under a pink granite heart in Raymond Hill Cemetery, the broken-hearted father promised himself that he would not give up and would continue his fight for justice till he drew his last breath. At first, the case had been treated as a homicide, but within a month it was changed to an accidental death by the county coroner doctor. John Napoleon Martin Tui, a lawyer who represented Susan's father, told him that it would be difficult to question any suspects and pursue the investigation as the first thing the attorneys would do is point out the cause of death on the certificate. So changing the cause of death was a big priority in solving the case. Taking the words of Toby seriously, Susan's father, Kent, sent out to try to change the cause of death. Susan's father, Kent, was not going to rest easy till he found answers. He appealed to the court to re-examine the cause of death. Even though the May County Coroner and Medical Examiner denied his request to change the cause of death on the death certificate, Kent never stopped fighting for the justice he wanted to give his daughter. Kent even took a brave step forward to ask for help from the governor. He knew his daughter very well and didn't believe that she had gone out to party with strangers. According to him, Susan enjoying herself with her friends on a Saturday night was normal, but going out with complete strangers was not possible. Ken even offered a $25,000 reward for leading to the conviction of the perpetrators of his daughter's death. Ken, after being denied by the medical examiner to change the cause of death, traveled across the state to find new results. And it was doing this that he caught a lucky break. Well, at a business convention in Texas, Kent took a bus to San Antonio to meet Dr. Vincent DeMeo, a board-certified forensic pathologist. Dr. DeMeo examined the reports thoroughly and had a totally different conclusion than that of the other examiners. According to him, all of the evidence he had seen in Susan's data pointed to a homicide and not an accidental death. He was sure of his findings that Susan was murdered. He agreed to provide his own report in order to help Kent. Kent met with more examiners and doctors and everyone came up with the same conclusion. That Susan was a victim of homicide and her death was not accidental. With a new ray of hope and Dr. DeMeo's report, Kent was ready to face the Cape County officials and change the cause of death on the certificate. Finally, after three years in 1993, a new prosecutor was named for Cape May County. The new prosecutor, Steve Moore, had the same outlook as Kent. A lawsuit was filed and it led to a review of the case and re-examination of Susan's preserved larynx was done. During those three years, from 1990 to 1993, for Kent had any medical reports to support his statement, many medical examiners were involved in the case. Dr. John Napoleon was the lead examiner in the case. He declared confidently that the cause of death was accidental. And after the declaration, all other examiners involved concluded with the same result. But now in 1993, a superior court judge was asked to replace former Cape May County medical examiner Dr. John Napoleon with Dr. Elliot M. Gross. The change of the former prosecutor and the medical examiner really gave new hope to Kent and the rest of the family. In April 1994, Cape May County hired a special defense attorney in connection with a lawsuit intended to change the official cause of death. And in May of the same year, Kent filed a complaint in Superior Court to change his daughter's cause of death in the certificate. Dr. Elliot later weighed in and after five and a half years, Susan's death was officially declared a homicide in 1995. A bone was found broken in Susan's larynx by Dr. Elliot, which changed the course of the case. According to Cape May County Prosecutor Jeffrey Sutherland, many law enforcement professionals and investigators were involved in this case. Many private detectives were also closely studying the case, but closing the case was harder than they thought. The press of Atlantic City continuously covered the case, and Yvette Craig was the lead reporter who covered Susan's story closely from day one. Susan's half-sister, Emily, was also a center character in this search for justice. She was only two years older when her sister Susan passed away. Although it happened a long time ago, and she does not remember much about her sister, Emily is now 34 and she still has vivid memories of the suffering they went through. Emily was very heartbroken and she believed that Susan in no world deserved to face what had happened that night in 1990. Susan's sister Dawn believed that the officials wanted to hide the truth so that Wildwood did not suddenly see a decrease in tourists. The state police investigators also inquired about hundreds of youths residing in West Virginia who were in Wildwood on that very weekend, but to no avail. To find a lead, many men who were of interest were asked to provide blood samples. Among them, the first suspect was Thomas Wolfe. 
an ex-resident of Wildwood, but he was found not guilty after his DNA sample showed that he had no relationship with Susan. Three forensic pathologists, including Marilyn's medical examiner, provided opinions for free. And the New Jersey Crime Victims Law Center took hold of the case. A resident of CL City in New York, Terry Downey, questioned the coroner's findings and protested why it took so long to find out what really happened. As it was so obvious that it was a homicide and that her father was right all along. According to the Cape May County Police report, Susan Nagger Smith drove to New Jersey with six of her friends for Memorial Day that fateful weekend in May 1990. They checked into a Wildwood Hotel which was located at 2700 block of Atlantic Avenue. The evening was spent partying, drinking alcohol and smoking marijuana. Later that night and around 8 to 10 p.m., Susan left the motel. She then visited a gym during the midnight hours. The report continued saying that she left with a man she met in the gym for a party at around 2 a.m. on Sunday morning. She was then seen on the porch of a nearby house according to the police reports. The police were told by the witnesses that she was very drunk, throwing up and couldn't even speak properly. She even rebuffed advances by a man. They also included that she refused to ride home. Some officers also saw Susan walking unsteadily on the street accompanied by many men, but the police left after talking to one of the men. Another witness told the police that he offered to walk Susan back to the hotel, but she was too drunk to tell him the location of her hotel. So he left her leaning against the restaurant Schellingos at about 2.30 a.m. The next morning, Susan's body was found behind that very restaurant. As the cause of death in the initial stage was declared accidental, it caused a problem for the investigators to prove otherwise. And even Susan's father struggled to get this changed for many years. After the cause of death was changed from lethal cardiac arrhythmia to hypothermia due to alcoholic intoxication and exposure to homicide in 1995, many suspects were found. But the case went cold again after this due to a lack of suspects. But later in 2018, new technology had developed which breathed new life into the case. It helped the investigators to match the DNA profile of the suspect. In 2018, Emily, Susan's sister, traveled to Cape May County to meet with prosecutor Jeffrey Sutherland to discuss the potential for a new avenue of investigation, something called genetic genealogy analysis. We'll never stop from the rest of my life until we can we can find someone. During the initial investigation, STR DNA or the short tandem repeat DNA was found in the victim's body, but it failed to match any suspect's DNA. But late in 2018, with a new knowledge of DNA technology, the major crimes unit of the prosecutor's office started a genetic gene trace of the DNA profile. And with much encouragement and sincerity from Emily, the Cape County prosecutor Jeffrey Sutherland, the STR DNA test finally got a match. After the genealogy investigation, they found the DNA which the investigators had found at the scene so long ago. Belonged to a man named Jerry Rosado. 62 years old Jerry Rosado was a resident of Millville, Cumberland County in 2022. He was accused and finally the authorities of Cape Town County arrested him on April 9, 2022. He was charged with second-degree sexual assault which is subjected to imprisonment for 5 to 10 years by the law of New Jersey State Prison. The 33-year-old cold case was finally coming to an end. But sadly, Susan's heroic father, Mr. Kent Nagersmith, could not be there to see his daughter getting justice. Kent passed away in 2016, still fighting for his daughter, and now rests together with Susan in the Raymond Hill Cemetery in Carmel. After being arrested, Rosado was extremely cooperative with the investigation. Rosado's defense attorney Shankas even mentioned that Rosado was not a flight risk and was voluntarily providing DNA samples at the trial. Rosado had a past of being accused of other crimes like larceny, burglary, and joyriding. But Shankas mentioned that those happened a long time ago and had nothing to do with what was happening now. According to him, the arrest of Rosado was neither justice to his client nor to the Negersmith family. Shankas argued the DNA evidence also did not hold up exactly. He pointed out that DNA evidence often results in matches of one in quintillions, which is 18 zeros after the first digit. According to Shankies, the DNA found under Susan's fingernails was a less certain match closer to one in 650, which could mean a match with many people in a community. Other reports that Shankis went through consisted of files from the day of the incident that took place in 1990. Those reports stated that Susan had indulged herself in sexual activities with at least three other men in the 24-hour window before her death. 
The witness who reported that he wanted to walk Susan to the motel but left her near Schellingos later stated that he also indulged in sexual activities with Susan that day. Emily Negersmith, Susan's sister, remained impassive in the court during the proceedings. Later, she said that she was not provoked or infuriated after hearing about Susan. What made her angry was denying the claim to the DNA match. Jerry Rosado, although arrested in 2022, was released in March 2023 after 11 months. A three-judge panel ruled on March 2023 that the case was out of the law's jurisdiction date. It stated that the statute of limitations in 1990 required prosecution to begin within five years of a sexual assault, and the year 2023 was very late to fall under the same. It ordered a trial judge to order dismissal of the accusations against Rosado, with no further evidence that he was the killer, and after pleading not guilty, Rosado was released. The case remains unsolved, but now the authorities are more than confident that they will close this case once and for all. Rosado is not accused of murder, but for sexual assault. But as per the Nagger Smith's family's emotions, Rosado was the criminal who ended Susan's life. The investigations are ongoing, but everyone hopes that there will soon be a conclusion in this 33-year-old cold case. The 33-year-old cold case still remains unsolved. Maybe this time, Susan's half-sister Emily will take the role played by her father. This time, all the questions might finally be answered. And then Susan and her and then Susan and her father's soul can rest in peace. What do you think actually happened that night in 1990? Was Rosado actually the killer? Share your opinions in the comments section and then Susan and her father's soul can rest in peace. What do you think actually happened that night in 1990? Was Rosado actually the killer? Share your opinions in the comments section. In the height of summer of 1978 on July 14th in Aberdeen, Scotland, the body of 32-year-old scientist Brenda Page was found in her home. Bloodied and beaten, it was evident that Brenda's death was no accident. The Aberdeen Police Department quickly began their work in trying to find her killer. Little did anyone know that it would take 45 years for her murder to be solved. It was DNA testing, the very thing that Brenda researched in her work that brought her killer to justice. Whose DNA did they find at the scene of the crime? What exactly happened to Brenda Page that took over four decades to solve? A 45-year-old cold case that was finally solved in 2023. But first, if you are new to the channel or have not yet subscribed, please consider clicking the subscribe button as it helps us and motivates us to create more content for you. So without further ado, let's dive right into this mystery. Aberdeen, Scotland is a city rich in history. Its stunning architecture and natural landscapes make it a popular destination for tourists from all over the world. Known as the Granite City, Aberdeen offers a great variety of attractions and activities for visitors and residents alike. A vast choice of restaurants, shops, bars, and music venues make Aberdeen a city of leisure. Just outside the bustling city, Aberdeen also has mountainous ranges and beaches, which are popular for skiing, snowboarding, and water sports. No matter the kind of activities you are into, Aberdeen has it all. On top of its fun atmosphere, Aberdeen is home to many top-tier schools and universities. The University of Aberdeen Medical School is the top choice for aspiring medical students looking to achieve a career in helping others. The victim of the story, Brenda Page, worked at the school in hopes of helping those in need. Brenda Page was born in Ipswich, England in 1946. She had a loving relationship with her older sister, Rita, who she always looked up to. Rita, along with other friends and family, described Brenda as being very loving, caring, and extremely intelligent. It was no surprise to them that Brenda would quickly excel in the world of science. Despite a 10-year age difference, Brenda greatly admired her older sister. Their bond was unbreakable, Rita often playing a motherly role in her young sister's life. Rita's motherly and protective nature over her little sibling showed the true sisterly love between them. While Rita was 10 years her senior, it was she who looked up to her little sister. Not only was Brenda incredibly intelligent, but she had a kind heart. She loved taking care of animals and owned and loved many pets throughout her life. Her kindness towards people and animals showed the true nature of her compassionate soul. Brenda also had an immense passion for learning. She never seemed satisfied with her vast knowledge and was always striving to learn more. Her love for animals and passion for science led Brenda to seek a degree in zoology at University College London. Graduating with first-class honors, Brenda happily and easily continued her education in pursuit of receiving her PhD. With flying colors, she achieved a PhD in genetics from the University of Glasgow. 
Brenda maintained her workaholic lifestyle and passion for learning throughout her career as a scientist. It was in 1970 when Brenda met her future husband at the University of Glasgow, Christopher Harrison. As a fellow student and skilled scientist himself, the two seemed a perfect match. On May 6th of 1972, they were married in Brenda's hometown of Ipswich. Together, the two scientists began work at the University of Aberdeen Medical School. To no surprise of anyone who knew her, Brenda's career quickly took off and she became a genetic researcher and principal of the genetics department at the university. In 1976, after only four years of marriage, Brenda and Christopher began filing for divorce. It came to light that Harrison had been physically abusive to Brenda throughout the entirety of their marriage. Brenda's older sister Rita said her sister described her relationship with Harrison as like walking on eggshells. Rita stated that Harrison was completely unpredictable and that he could either be very nice or very nasty. These are often traits of an abuser. Abusers tend to reel in their victims by showing a kind personality, only to lift the mask and show their true nature. They can keep their victims hooked by inconsistently showing their nice side. After four short years of marriage, Brenda had had enough of the abuse and filed for divorce. Harrison had been accused of assaulting Brenda on various occasions and in various locations between 1972 and 1976. He was also accused of breach of the peace by threatening violence to her and placing her in a state of fear and alarm for her safety, including at the genetics department at the University of Aberdeen Medical School. Following their messy divorce, Brenda confided in her elder sister. She stated that she thought Harrison was stalking her, which prompted her to get a court order to keep him away from her. It is alleged that between 1976 and 1978, he also committed a breach of the peace by threatening to kill her and keep track of her movements. The divorce was finalized in October of 1977, less than a year before her tragic death would occur. In the aftermath of the divorce, Brenda moved into her own flat located on Allen Street in Aberdeen in Scotland with her three cats. She lived alone for the remainder of her life, which was tragically cut short at the hands of a monster. On the summer day of July 14, 1978, Brenda's neighbor, Elizabeth Gordon, walked over to Brenda's flat. Elizabeth, aged 68 at the time, had heard strange noises coming from the apartment the night before. When she hadn't seen Brenda the entire day, she decided to pay a visit to check on her. Elizabeth was not incredibly close with Brenda, but Brenda always made sure to say hello and make conversation with her in passing. Elizabeth noticed Brenda's kindness from day one and cherished their casual conversation. Brenda always made sure to check in on her elderly neighbor. On that July day, Elizabeth took notice of Brenda's absence and felt it was her turn to make sure her neighbor was okay. Making her way to Brenda's flat, she knocked on the door and received no answer. Reaching for the doorknob, Elizabeth was surprised to find that the door was unlocked. With her nerves rising, she made the decision to make her way into the apartment. At first, Elizabeth did not notice anything out of the ordinary. She called for Brenda and got no response. This prompted her to walk further into the apartment. As she reached Brenda's bedroom, a feeling of dread washed over her senses. As she entered the bedroom, absolute horror struck her to her very core. It was an image that she would never forget. Lying in a pool of blood, Elizabeth found Brenda's body on her bed. Her face was beaten so badly that it was hardly recognizable. Elizabeth immediately ran to phone the police. When they arrived, she explained the horror that she had just seen. She told the police through a flood of tears. I saw nothing but blood and hair. Eric Grant was one of the first police officers called to the scene upon report of the death. As he walked into Brenda's bedroom and reviewed the scene, it was immediately apparent that a murder had taken place. The scene was like nothing he had seen before. Grant knew that a full forensic team would be needed due to the horrific nature of the crime. Brenda was lying face up on her bed, still dressed in her nightdress. She was completely covered in blood. Grant could tell that the lifeless body had received multiple pulled blows to the head as it was beaten so violently that he could barely make out her features. Soon after, another police officer and forensic scientist arrived on the scene. Eric Jensen. He noted that Brenda was lying across her bed with her feet on the floor and her hands up towards her neck. It appeared that she attempted to fight for her life but lost the battle. Based on her position, she had been struck while either lying down or sitting at the edge of the bed. Still in her nightdress, Brenda was likely preparing for bed before being brutally attacked. Jensen immediately began his analysis and collected any evidence that could be found in the apartment. 
Upon his walkthrough, Officer Jensen found blood on the bedroom door handle and on the front door of the apartment. The blood was consistent with Brenda's brutal death indicating that the killer made his way through the apartment covered in her blood. Pushing through the bedroom door and out the apartment door, the killer left a trail of Brenda's blood behind. Jensen also walked to the rear side of the apartment to search for signs of a break-in. At the back of the flat, he found a window that showed signs of being tampered with. Further inspection showed that the window appeared to have been forced open. From his examination, he concluded that a lever of some sort with a chiseled tip was used to pry the window open. Likely a crowbar or a similar tool. The detectives theorized that the killer had broken in through the back window and hidden Brenda's large wardrobe waiting until she got home. Signs of assault were visible as well, with stains visible on Brenda's duvet cover that contained traces of foreign DNA. The cause of death in the initial autopsy was deemed violent assault. All of these indicators told detectives that this was not a random attack or a robbery gone wrong. Someone had deliberately targeted Brenda and her murder was meticulously planned. During their investigation, detectives questioned multiple friends and family of Brenda to get any insight on who might want to harm her in any way and would be capable of committing such a horrible act. Immediately, fingers were pointed at Brenda's ex-husband, Christopher Harrison. Not one of Brenda's inner circle had anything good to say about Harrison. It had been apparent that Brenda was being abused by Harrison throughout their marriage. Elsa Christie, a close friend of Brenda's, told police that she had spoken to Brenda over the phone only a few days before the murder. She stated that Brenda was afraid for her safety and thought her ex-husband was going to hurt her. She really seemed quite terrified of him. She said to the detectives. Another friend, Diane Davies, stated to the police that Brenda was going to get a court order to legally keep Harrison away from her. Per Davy, Harrison had recently attacked Brenda. He had thrown hot tea over Brenda during an argument which left her with burns. Police also confirmed that Brenda had been hospitalized more than once due to Harrison's violence towards her. With all of the testimonies from friends and family, Harrison was arrested on suspicion of murder, interrogated diligently by detectives, Aresan professed his innocence and maintained the fact that Brenda was the best thing in his life. Even after the divorce, he did not give in to the pressure of the interrogation. When asked if he had ever been in Brenda's apartment, he denied ever stepping inside the home. To the dismay of the detectives, Harrison could not be convicted due to lack of evidence. Although he seemed a prime suspect, they did not have enough proof or conviction at the time. Detectives Grant and Jensen began looking for alternate suspects in hopes that their dead end would be reopened to more possible avenues to explore. Through further interviews with family members, detectives learned that Brenda was having money problems and had taken up a second job as an escort. While in modern society, an escort is seen as a sex worker, this was not the case in 1978. Rather, escorts of that time were only hired to meet up with men and accompany them in social settings or meet with them publicly for dinner and conversation. Brenda enjoyed the second job, as it paid well and she loved meeting new people. Brenda's escort services did not involve sleeping with her clients in any way. Police explored this avenue further wondering if Brenda was hired by someone who may have had bad intentions. Days, weeks, and months went by and detectives were unable to get anywhere with this lead. Two key pieces of evidence remained in police custody for decades in hopes that one day they could be re-examined with advanced technology. One of those was the DNA sample found on Brenda's duvet cover. The other was samples of the chipped paint from her back window, the very one that the culprit forced open to enter her home. While investigators found what looked like dried paint inside of Harrison's vehicle, there was no way at the time to prove it was a match to Brenda's window. At the time of the murder, DNA testing was not used during investigations. Luckily, the investigators had the right mind to preserve these small pieces of evidence. DNA samples, paint chips from the window that was tampered with, and blood samples were locked away in evidence for almost 40 years before the case was finally reopened. It was in 2015 when detectives decided to reopen the case for further investigation. On hearing this news, Brenda's sister Rita Ling gave a public statement pleading with the people of Aberdeen to provide any information they could. She and the rest of their family had already suffered for decades with no closure in sight. Some of their family had passed away in the time since the murder, never knowing who had taken their beloved Brenda from them and never getting the answers they so desperately needed. Thousands of tips flooded in, but none were substantial enough to prosecute any suspect Brenda's murder became one of the longest-running cold cases in Scotland's history. In 2020, a breakthrough in the case finally occurred. 
With advancements in technology, it became possible for the DNA evidence to be tested and compared to the detective's list of suspects. Genetics testing, the very thing that Brenda had been researching in her career, provided investigators with a DNA match to the DNA samples found on Brenda's duvet cover. Being that Brenda was a genetic scientist herself, it was fitting that DNA testing is what helped to solve her murder. In her lab, Brenda researched how DNA can be compared between individuals and how genetics plays a role in one's DNA. Investigators were able to find a DNA match to the sample found at the crime scene, showing that it was 590 million times more likely to belong to one person than any other man. This DNA match, paired with witness statements and other clues, provided investigators with enough evidence to officially make an arrest. It was, in fact, Brenda's very own ex-husband whose DNA was found at the scene. Christopher Harrison was charged and arrested for the murder in March of 2020 by Detective Constable Thomas Gorman. The DNA match was the missing piece of the puzzle needed to finally charge Harrison with murder. Harrison could not be charged through speculation alone based on statements by Brenda's friends and family about their relationship. In addition to the DNA evidence, a paint chip was found on the window of his vehicle during the investigation of the murder. The evidence remained locked up until it could be further tested with modern technology and compared to the crime scene. Testing showed that it was a match to the paint on Brenda's window that had been pried open with a crowbar. Harrison was further accused of attempting to defeat the ends of justice by disposing of a watch, a bag, and contents, including a pair of shoes with the intent to destroy forensic evidence and to avoid detection and prosecution. Prosecutors Alex Prentice, a leading advocate deputy and Crown Counsel, presented compelling evidence to disprove Harrison's false alibis, which he has stood by since 1978. Over the last four decades, Harrison has proclaimed his innocence, stating that he would never harm Brenda or know anyone who would want to harm her. He argued that the world lost a brilliant scientist by no hand of his own. The DNA evidence proved otherwise. It was established that the duvet stain contained traces of his DNA. With genetic testing that was not available at the time of the murder, forensic scientist Andrew Gibbs said it was 590 million times more likely that the duvet burn sample came from Harrison than any other male. It was believed Harrison had forced open a window at the rear end of the apartment and may have lain in wait for Brenda's return. After committing the late night murder, he walked out through the front door and disposed of his blood-stained clothes, watch, and other evidence. The cause of death in the initial autopsy was violent assault. In the 1970s, autopsies were not performed as thoroughly as they are in today's society. Today, violent assault could mean an infinite number of things and would not be a valid cause of death. For this reason, a forensic pathologist named Marjorie Turner was assigned to the case after it was reopened. She was to re-examine the original autopsy notes and make an accurate and more detailed analysis in alliance with how modern autopsy reports are written. Turner was able to describe the death in graphic detail based on the original autopsy notes and pictures alone. Defensive injuries were found all over Brenda's hands showing that she had put up a fight as much as she could. Benda had extensive bruising on her hands as well as a dislocated finger. These are telltale signs that she fought for her life as they were classic defensive wounds. The cause of death was deemed blunt force trauma by Turner. Brenda had been struck more than 20 times. This was indicative of severe aggression. Turner confirmed that a weapon had most definitely been used for the assault and possibly more than one. Turner confirmed that Brenda suffered an immensely violent death. With Harrison's track record for violence, Benda had feared he would one day be the cause of her death. In February of 2023, nearly three years after his arrest, Harrison's trial finally began. At 82 years old, he still pleaded not guilty to the murder. Presigned it over by Judge Lord Richardson, a lengthy court case ensued. The jury was not shown photographs of the injuries, but rather were presented with a 3D computer-generated model. After reviewing the evidence and hearing witness testimonies during the lengthy trial, the jury at Aberdeen's High Court made their decision in March of 2023. By majority, they found Christopher Harrison guilty of the murder of Brenda Page after almost three hours of deliberation. Lord Richardson, the judge on the case, handed out a life sentence to Harrison with a minimum of 20 years in prison. He ended his verdict by saying, as a result of your senseless act, you have brought the life of Brenda Page to a brutal and premature end. Harrison, now aged 82, will likely die in prison for his crimes. Harrison showed no emotion after the verdict was delivered and was led away handcuffed to a prison guard. 
the beautiful life of Brenda was tragically cut short at the hands of her own ex-husband. The accomplished scientist devoted her life's work to researching genetic testing. It was genetic testing that ended up solving her own murder, an accomplishment she would surely be thrilled to learn. A statement by her family was made after the guilty verdict was given. They stated, We as a family are absolutely delighted with the verdict of today's trial. Not a day goes by when we don't think about Brenda and the horrendous ordeal she must have suffered that night. Brenda was an extremely kind, intelligent woman with her whole life ahead of her. It hurts us to think of the great things she would have undoubtedly achieved. 45 years is a long time for her family to deal with Brenda's loss without receiving closure. Every time the case was reopened or reinvestigated, this only reopened old wounds for her loved ones as they had to relive her tragic loss again and again. Unfortunately, Brenda's mother was not able to live long enough to see her killer brought to justice. She passed 14 years after her daughter's murder, unaware that it would take 45 years for her killer to be caught. But Brenda's sister Rita did live to see Harrison put behind bars. She knew that Harrison had always been guilty and was delighted to see him answer for his crimes. At least Brenda can rest in peace. Detective Inspector Gary Winter, the lead detective in the reopened case, added Brenda was never forgotten and hope remained that one day her murderer would face the consequences of his actions. For Brenda's family, colleagues, friends, and everyone who has worked on this case over many years. After over four decades, justice was finally served. Brenda's family and colleagues have commented on how pertinent and fitting it is that DNA has played a part in solving her murder, given her research work in the 1970s as a genetic scientist. With future advancements in this type of research, Brenda would be elated to know her own research has helped so many others get the justice they deserved. What are your thoughts on this case? We would love to know your thoughts in the comments section below. Do not forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel. 24-year-old Aaron Fraser and his brother-in-law were building an outdoor shower and a swimming pool in the backyard of his childhood house in Jacksonville, Northeast Florida in December 2014. However, while digging through the backyard, he found something that initially seemed like a coconut but turned out to be far more gruesome. What was discovered in 2014 in that backyard by Aaron was later found to be the remains of his long-lost mother, Bonnie Hyam, who disappeared in January 1993. Who buried her in the backyard of her own house? Do you think Aaron knew anything about this event from his childhood? In this episode today, we will be discussing the twisted case of Bonnie Hyam. But first, if you still haven't subscribed to the channel, please go and hit the subscribe button and the bell icon down below. And now without further ado, let's get started. Jacksonville is located in the northeastern region of Florida, 350 miles up the coast from Miami and less than an hour's drive from Georgia. It is one of the largest cities in terms of area in the United States Continental Territory with 747 square miles. It is the 12th most populous city in the United States and the most populous city proper in Florida with just about 950,000 people living there. Jacksonville's cost of living is 7% less than the national average, making it an affordable home for many. The Florida-Georgia game, the annual college football game between the rival, Florida Gators, and Georgia Bulldogs has been held in Jacksonville almost yearly since 1933 and is one of the largest sports events there every year. Jacksonville is also home to River City Pride, which is Northeast Florida's largest gay pride parade. But it was here in Jacksonville that a terrible crime took place in 1993. Born on May 20, 1969, in Scotland, Bonnie Lynn Pesciuto was one of the five daughters of parents Robert Pesciuto and Patricia Pesciuto, who also had one son. Unfortunately, there is very little information recorded of Bonnie in her early life, but testimonies from her family and everyone she was close to suggest she was calm and a peacemaker in the group. She was full of love and cared deeply for people she was close to. Bonnie was married to Michael Hine on September 12, 1987, when she was 18 years old, and the couple lived in their family home in Jacksonville, Northeast, Florida. In 1989, the couple had their first and only son, Aaron. Bonnie and Michael worked in the same construction supply company, which was owned by Evie Anaheim and her husband. Evie Anaheim was Michael's aunt and was a very close friend to Bonnie. While Michael was a manager in the company, Bonnie was an accountant. Bonnie had a very problematic marriage where Michael was often found verbally abusive towards her in many incidents. Yvonne, who was quite close to the couple, claimed that she and other employees of the company had often witnessed situations where Michael would shout at her and verbally abuse her in public. 
She recalled an incident where the verbal abuse went on to become physical abuse when Michael slammed the car door on Bonnie's hand while they were having an argument in the parking space of their workplace. Bonnie ran back crying to Yvonne. Yvonne, along with Bonnie's sister, Liz's peak, was aware of the fact that Bonnie wanted to separate from Michael and take Aaron with her. To do this, she had created a different bank account to save money. But unfortunately, Michael somehow learned about the separate bank account and forced Bonnie to close it. Although she did what Michael wanted her to do, she ensured that she was still saving the money for her separation. And trusted Yvonne for that and was keeping her money with Yvonne. On the day of Bonnie's disappearance, January 6, 1993, Bonnie and Yvonne had plans to meet around 8 p.m. at Yvonne's place. Bonnie reached her own house in Jacksonville around 6.30 p.m. However, around 8.30 that evening, Bonnie called Yvonne to inform her that she wouldn't be able to visit Yvonne's place that night as the couple had an argument which had really upset Bonnie. When Yvonne asked if she wanted to call her later, Bonnie assured that she would call Yvonne in the morning. Throughout the call, Yvonne noticed that Bonnie was crying and seemed very upset with the fight. Later that night is when she allegedly left the house and never returned. Michael allegedly said that he contacted his mother Carolyn Hyam and requested her to keep an eye on Aaron while he went in search of Bonnie the same night of January 6, 1993. He went away for almost 45 minutes. After reportedly doing so, he went home, waited until the next morning without contacting the police and then called in to inform his employer that both he and Bonnie wouldn't attend the office that day, as she had left the night before. The following morning, Bonnie's purse, which included her cash, credit card, identification, and other items were found in a trash can behind the red roof in very close to Jacksonville by a maintenance worker. Upon the discovery of the purse, Michael reported Bonnie missing and said she disappeared on January 6, 1993, the previous night. Detective Robert Henson was the lead investigating officer in the missing case of Bonnie Hyam in 1993. The police quickly discovered Bonnie's abandoned automobile near the Jacksonville airport, which was close to the Red Roof Inn. Michael had admitted that Bonnie had left the house voluntarily at 11 p.m. on the night of January 6, 1993. They noted that the driver's seat was placed for someone of Michael's stature. It was pulled back more than what would have been comfortable for Bonnie. Authorities examined it and discovered a shoe print on the floor of the driver's side. It was discovered that it matched a certain style of sports shoe that coincidentally Michael owned. Daddy hurt mommy. Daddy shot mommy and daddy placed mommy in timeout were the phrases used by three-year-old Aaron when Detective Henson took a bold attempt to uncover the truth by arranging a child psychologist for Aaron. From what Aaron told them, the authorities began to look at Michael as a suspect in his wife's disappearance. They believed that there had been a domestic dispute that Michael Hyam had killed his wife and taken her away and that Aaron Hyam, the couple's three-and-a-half-year-old son, had seen this. Later, Michael's parents' rights were taken away because Aaron was the only living witness to Bonnie's murder. The judge believed he was in danger of being mistreated. Another of Aaron's childhood claims was proven to be true in 1995. He revealed to psychologists that immediately after killing Bonnie, Michael threw a shotgun out of the car. After some time, he told his foster mother which bridge Michael had thrown it off of. It was discovered in the water below and it was found to have been there ever since Bonnie vanished. It matched one that was discovered at Michael's house. Bonnie was ruled legally deceased in 1999. Aaron's name was changed to Aaron Fraser after being adopted by his foster family. His foster mother also stated that his version of events did not alter over time. He consistently told her and the police that Michael was Bonnie's murderer. He also drew images of himself shooting her when he was younger. In addition, he described her murder and how Michael's parents assisted him in disposing of her body in an essay he did in eighth grade. Later, Aaron and his adoptive parents sued Michael, blaming him for what happened. A civil court judge commanded him to pay Aaron $26,300,000 in 2005. And Aaron also received his childhood home in Jacksonville as part of the settlement. The main suspect in Bonnie's disappearance was Michael. He was suspected of abusing her physically and verbally. When he learned that she had created a bank account in her own name, he was furious. Yvonne saw that she was agitated and sobbing that night before she vanished following a disagreement with Michael. The day after she vanished, he decided to take a sick leave, but he did not initially report her missing. He didn't seem worried about her going missing, said Yvonne. He seemed to worry about the money she was keeping from him instead. The seat of Bonnie's automobile was further back than it would have been comfortable for her when it was discovered at the airport. 
it suggested that someone bigger, like Michael, had driven it. The last individual to do so left a shoe print behind. Michael wore identical shoes and the sand and plant matter used in the print came from the same place as the material extracted from his shoes. The most shocking assertion made by Aaron was that he saw Michael murder Bonnie. The legitimacy of his claims as a three-year-old was called into question, though. Although Michael's aunt Evian testified of witnessing incidents where Michael abused Bonnie verbally and physically on multiple occasions as she could see them at work regularly, Bonnie's father, Mr. Robert Pesciuto, kept on believing that his daughter had gone away voluntarily. And Michael had no role in the disappearance of his daughter, Bonnie. When the authorities presented the evidence, such as the footprints from the car that were a match to Michael's shoe, Mr. Pesciuto commented that he was unsure of what it implied. He further claimed that just because his footprints were found in his wife's car didn't mean he had ever hurt her. Moreover, the evidence of his grandson did not convince him. He commented that one must evaluate a child's credibility in the context of other factors. Although detectives had claims from Evian and Aaron which directly pointed out Michael Hyam as the culprit for the following two decades, Michael Hyam was just a suspect. Since there was never a corpse to be found and insufficient proof of physical evidence that could bring charges against him, the case went cold. Aaron acquired the home where he had previously resided with Michael and Bonnie as part of the settlement with Michael after the lawsuit filed against him by his foster parents. Almost a decade later, in 2014, Aaron went to his Jacksonville childhood home to renovate the pool area with his brother-in-law. That is when he discovered a big plastic bag in which there was something that looked like a coconut shell initially. However, as he observed it closely, he was horrified when he realized what he was holding was a human skull. Aaron immediately called Robert Hinson, the primary investigator of the Bonnie High missing case, and also his therapist and told them that he felt the human remains were his own mother's. The reason for Aaron to call Robert Hinson was because deep down Frazier thought of the same person who Robert suspected from the very beginning. As the remains were collected, the authorities also found a 22 caliber bullet casing. In August 2015, the human remains found in the backyard of Jacksonville were conclusively recognized as Bonnie's after DNA testing was conducted on it. The DNA test concluded that the body discovered by Aaron Fraser in the backyard of his childhood house in Jacksonville in August 2015 was, in fact, that of his own long-lost mother, Bonnie Hyam. Michael Hyam, being the prime suspect, was arrested by authorities from North Carolina on August 24, 2015. Since 1999, when Bonnie Hyam was officially declared deceased, Michael had been living his life with the life insurance of his deceased wife. Although Michael Hyam was arrested in August 2015, he pleaded not guilty to the allegations brought against him and was released on bail initially. However, on April 8, 2019, his trial finally started after multiple delays. Prosecutors Mac Hevener represented Aaron Fraser in this trial with evidence and witnesses that pointed out Michael Hyam to be the killer of Bonnie Hyam in 1993. On the other side, Janice Warren represented Michael Hyam and his innocence. The panel consisted of honorable judges like Lori Rowe, M. Kimberly Thomas, Rachel Nordby, and Stephen Whittington. In his opening remarks for the murder trial, Assistant State Attorney Alan Mizrahi said that the truth was always hidden in the backyard. In the trial, Mizrahi also pointed out that a 22 caliber shell was discovered close to the remains of Bonnie Hyam in 2014. And Aaron mentioned that Michael Hyam had tossed his 22 caliber shotgun off a bridge shortly after killing Bonnie. In fact, officials discovered the gun in 1995 beneath the water of the same bridge. Bonnie's death was not conclusively proven by the medical examiner, but Mizrahi claimed that Michael Hyam had shot Bonnie in 1993 and buried her thereafter. He asserted that Michael's actions and body language both before and after the murder show his heinous disregard for Bonnie Hyam's life. When Aaron was asked to give his statement, he said that when he picked up the thing that looked like a coconut in my backyard in December 2014, it turned out to be the top of her skull. He claimed that as he turned it to face the hole, he saw what seemed to be teeth. It was quite difficult, he remarked. I think everyone can picture picking out a skull, even if it isn't a loved one, and what it would do to someone. Needless to add that it was, in fact, my own mother's. The 53-year-old Michael Hyam, who was wearing spectacles and an olive-colored suit, was emotionless when Prosecutor Hevener pointed at him during final arguments. As he has done ever since his wife vanished, Michael stood and insisted on his innocence during the entire trial. I loved my wife, he affirmed in court, and I would never hurt my wife. 
Mac Hevener chronologically set out all of the events in the courtroom that happened during the day of Bonnie Hyam's disappearance. Based on the reports and claims of the witnesses at that time, he tried to focus on the areas that led to the certainty of linking anyone other than her husband behind her murder. Bonnie Hyam skipped work on January 7, 1993. She left the house alone at 11 p.m., according to Michael Hyam, who would subsequently claim that the pair had argued the previous evening. Hevener informed the jury that the defendant had the intent, the means, and the capacity to murder his wife. He was aware that Bonnie Hyam intended to take their three-year-old boy and separate from him. She called her close friend Evian the night before she vanished. She was upset and weeping. She promised to talk with Evian in the morning. Michael Hyam was referred to as Mr. Ill Will and Mr. Evil Intent by Prosecutor Hevener, claiming that he was the owner of the specific gun used to murder Bonnie Hyam, and that a footprint in the sand on her car's floor matched his size 10 Nike sneakers. Hevener remarked, you'll hear the truth scream from those floor mats. In this case, the shoe print says volumes. Just then, he had completed preparing the burial near Jacksonville International Airport, where police eventually discovered Bonnie Hines' automobile in an airport parking area. Bonnie Hines' handbag was initially discovered behind a red roof in. Bonnie's car keys, according to Hevener, were in her handbag. She had left her house key and another car key at the couple's home. The prosecutor said that it was pretty strange to think that a woman could leave her son, her job, and leave her house without a set of keys that she normally uses, leaving all her earthly belongings inside. Aside from Michael Hines' assertion of innocence, the state's case, according to Michael Hines' defense attorney Janice Warren, was founded on innuendo and hypotheticals that don't exist. Michael Hines' innocence was asserted by the defense. Not because they believed he is innocent, but rather because that is the case's legal position. If the case of Bonnie Hyam is examined carefully, there may be many grounds for reasonable doubt. Warren said that the prosecution was fabricating evidence in order to obtain a conviction. In response, Assistant State Attorney Alan Mizrahi reminded the jury that justice was necessary because the facts of this case demanded it. Bonnie Hyam is unable to receive justice. It depends on those who are looking for it on her behalf. In the courtroom, Michael Hine testified about his love for Bonnie Hine. He also provided testimony on his wife's mental state on their final night together in 1993. Before she vanished, Bonnie may have been unhappy for a month or two, according to him. He went on to say that she wasn't as bubbly as she had been in the months before her disappearance on that tragic night. In his opening remarks, defense attorney Warren argued that the prosecution lacked sufficient proof to establish Michael's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. We agree that she is dead. Her body is there. We all agree but they have to show that he committed the crime, she remarked. Ladies and gentlemen, when you listen to the evidence and after you're finished, you're going to see the lack of evidence in this case far outweighs any evidence they brought you. Initially, Michael Hyam appealed to the court that Aaron's statement from his childhood should be kept out of the trial as he was just a toddler, and his perception towards the whole situation of his mother's disappearance and his testimonies related to his father hurting her might have been from his own imagination. Michael Heim insisted that Aaron's statement was baseless as he was too young to even remember what happened to his mother the night she disappeared. However, the honorable judge decided to keep Aaron's statements and testimonies a big factor of the trial because back in 1995, Aaron's claims about the location of the shotgun had been proven true. Evie and Hyam, who was close to both Bonnie and Michael, gave testimonies against Michael, confirming that Michael had been very abusive and controlling towards Bonnie. She believed that Michael was absolutely capable of killing and burying Bonnie in their backyard. Additionally, two prisoners claimed that Michael Heim admitted to killing his wife in 2015 when he was in prison with them. Terence Richardson, one of the inmates, said that Michael started telling them about how he strangled his wife to death, how her kid was furious with him, and how he buried her in the backyard. Apart from this witness, two significant pieces of evidence that stood out and directly pointed towards Michael as the culprit were the footprints on the car seat that matched Michael's shoe that was found in the family home of Heim. The second was the 22 caliber shell that matched the gun that Michael owned. The jury heard testimony from the witnesses about aggravating circumstances that could result in a longer sentence for him, including whether the crime was committed in front of a family member, whether evidence was tampered with whether it was committed in a heinous, atrocious, or cruel manner, and whether it caused the victim's family great emotional distress. The judge concluded that the crime was not conducted in a terrible, awful, or cruel way while agreeing on three of the aggravating circumstances. 
The jury found Michael guilty of second-degree murder on April 12th based on the available information and witnesses. He received a life sentence on May 21st, 2019. Domestic violence can take different forms. It can have a severe impact on children who witness it. And in cases like Bonnie Himes, it can cause children to have lifelong trauma. Here, a father named Michael Heim, who was supposed to be the protector, the hero to the son, Aaron, turned into his biggest nightmare. Although Michael received his sentence of life imprisonment and Bonnie was served justice, it still did not bring back a mother for her son. Evidence and witnesses helped Bonnie's family win the trial after over two decades of waiting. And this hopefully brought her family some form of peace. Today, we are walking through the 34-year-long cold case of Barry Crane, which was finally solved in 2019. Before starting, we would like you to take a minute of your time to hit the like and subscribe button. Also, press the bell icon to be the first to discover all the new cold cases. Now, without wasting any more time, let's jump into this twisted cold case. To the west of the famous Hollywood Hills lies Studio City, Los Angeles, originally known as Laurelwood. Studio City is a very sophisticated and luxurious place, and living in the city was like a dream come true for many stars. Studio City is known for its costly mansions and celebrity residence. Many famous Hollywood actors and celebrities, like Bruno Mars, George Clooney, Will Smith, and Tom Cruise, live here. The crime rates in Studio City are 28% higher than the national average, but violent crimes are 33% lower than that of the nation. This city was not supposed to be the deathbed of an energetic producer. But unfortunately, this is the place where a dreadful homicide took place in 1985. But first, we go back to the beginning when Barry J. Cohen was born in Detroit, Michigan on November 10, 1927 to the family of Louis, Lou Cohen, and Sylvia Cohen. He had one sibling, Elliot David Cohen, and he was the younger of the two brothers. From a young age, the brothers spent a great deal of time with their father, who was a well-rounded man with varied interests. Their father-son bond became even stronger when the boys started learning to play the game of bridge from their father. Since his childhood, Barry was exposed to the entertainment business when he saw his father's business of movie theaters. His father, Lou, was the owner of many theaters and worked on civic projects while also continuing to play the game of bridge. Barry Crane got married to Arlene Anderson from Los Angeles in 1944 when he was just 17 years old. But it did not take long before the relationship fell apart. After two years in 1946, he got married again to Shirley Complin of Southfield, Michigan. He had two children in his second marriage, Sherilyn and Ben. Barry was 20 years old and was attending the University of Michigan when his father Lou passed away in 1947 at the age of 53. The death of his father devastated him and he dropped out of college. Unlike the successful professional life he was soon going to have, his personal life wasn't at its peak. The second marriage did not last long too, and in 1954, he got divorced for the second time. Barry, after failing in both of his marriages, wanted to change his life completely. He was looking for a fresh start and changed his surname from Cohen to Crane for professional reasons. In 1955, Barry moved to Los Angeles, California, with the aspiration of turning his life into something successful. Barry really needed a change in his life, and soon his hopes were about to become true. He first worked in the Pasadena Playhouse, which is a venue for performing arts. He started his career in television entertainment and shopped an original screenplay that became part of the three-picture deal between RKO Pictures and King Brothers. The title of the script was The Seven Lanterns of Japan described as The Asphalt Jungle, a 1950 film noir directed by John Huston with a Japanese setting. The film was not made, but that was the starting point Barry needed in the industry. He was the associate producer and later on the producer of a 1966 TV series called Mission Impossible. He also produced Mannix in 1967, The Magician in 1973, and many more. He was also credited with directing Trapper John, M.D., The Incredible Hulk, Hawaii 5 to 0, Chips, Dallas, Wonder Woman, and Super Train. Very soon, Barry became famous among the movie stars and was appreciated by many of them. One of the actors whom Barry had worked with, Mike Connors, described him as a problem solver and said that Barry was very talented. It was not long before Barry started getting recognized for his job in his career. He made some important connections which helped him to be a part of some of the most influential series of the 1960s and 1970s. 
Although Barry was beginning to become famous for his dedication to his work and was becoming well-known among fans and co-workers, information on Barry's personal lifestyle was very scant and he was great at deflecting questions. A rumor started about Barry's sexuality when he moved to LA. However, Barry deflected questions like he usually did when asked about it. During those years, being a homosexual man was like being a witch in the dark ages and Barry knew that very well. Although he wasn't vocal about it, he never denied any rumors of him being homosexual. He surely was looking to adjust somewhere in the big city, looking for a place where he could have some freedom following his choice of lifestyle. Even though Barry was very focused on his work, his mind was not at ease. When he was interviewed in 1972, he explained that he was married twice, but both marriages ended in divorce and that didn't let him relax. He continued saying that in February, he went on a vacation to the Caribbean, which was supposed to last three weeks, but he could only stand it for five days. And he concluded by saying that his mind was overactive and barely let him rest. Apart from being quite successful in the movie line, Barry was also an excellent bridge player. He liked playing the cards from a young age and started his professional career from the late 1940s. While being an important character in the TV industry, Barry's interest for bridge never stopped. Playing bridge competitively became his weekend job. He often played with Peter Graves and actors between scenes. It should be noted that he won the prestigious McKinney Award named after American contract Bridge League Executive Secretary William McKinney at the age of 25. This award was given to the player in North America who accumulated the most master points in tournament play in a calendar year, and Barry Crane dominated this competition for 30 years, either challenging or winning most of them. In his lifetime, he won the McKinney Trophy six times in 1952, 1967, 1971, 1973, 1975, and 1978. He also won the Moat Smith Trophy twice, the Ashka Trophy four times, the Stoddard Memorial Trophy once, and the IBPA Award for the Best Personality in the year 1985. Barry Crane was even the 15-time North American champion and a Grand Life Master in the Ace BL. Throughout his career, Barry won many other awards and earned tremendous respect as a bridge player. He had the record of the highest master points in bridge history even after his death in 1985. It was only in 1991 that his record was broken by Paul Soloway. In honor and memorial of Barry Crane, the American Contract Bridge League, also known as ACBL, renamed the award given for the highest bridge master points in a year to the Barry Crane Trophy. Ten years after his death in 1995, Barry was inducted into the ACBL Hall of Fame. Barry was a friendly person and was often praised by his co-workers in the TV line and also in his bridge career. One person known to be close to him was his bridge partner, Carrie Schumann, with whom he won the World Mixed Pair title in 1978 for a bridge competition held in New Orleans. His aggressive gameplay and Carrie's strategic defense made them one of the best teams in the history of the game. Barry's iconic TV series from the 1960s and 70s made him a star producer and director. His luxurious house in Studio City and his white Cadillac El Dorado were proof of how successful he was becoming in Hollywood. Some of his last works were in the early 80s, including directing episodes of Flamingo Road, Seven Bridges for Seven Brothers, The Powers of Matthew Starr, and A Movie Conquest of the Earth. The third and final chapter of the Battlestar Galactic Trilogy. It was the month of July in 1985 and Barry was in Pasadena for a Bridge Week regional tournament being held in the Pasadena Convention Center, California. He was part of a four-person team poised to win the tournament. He also played a two-session pair game with Billy Miller, a Silver Life Master, and a Bridge Bulletin columnist. It was the 4th of July, a Thursday, and Barry invited Miller and his ex-wife to a dinner at a restaurant nearby. They accompanied Barry in his car, but when they reached there, he excused himself, saying that he wasn't feeling well. Before leaving, Barry was seen making a phone call. It was July 5th, 1985, and his team was waiting at the tournament center, but Barry was absent. Although his absence created a murmur among the players, Kerry Schumann, Barry's favorite teammate, took his place and played the game in his stead. While Barry's team was dominating the tournament, he was in his home, which was located in the 4200 block of Colfax Avenue, relaxing on his holiday Friday, or that was what everyone had thought. Thursday might have gone as usual, but what happened on the early morning of Friday was unexpected. In the afternoon of July 5th, a Friday, the regular housekeeper for Barry's home reached his place before 3 p.m. and went to the second level of the house through the front door. But Barry was nowhere to be seen. 
She saw a blood trail leading up to the third floor bedroom and she followed it. She reached the bedroom but Barry was not there. There was evidence of a struggle in there and she noticed that some bed sheets were missing. There was blood splattered all over the apartment and she saw a broken ceramic statue on the ground which was covered in blood. She immediately started looking for the owner of the house and finally reached the garage on the lowest level. What she found was a sight she could not forget. Barry's bludgeoned body was lying on the ground, his head having been repeatedly beaten seemingly by the ceramic statue. His neck was strangled with a telephone cord. His naked body was wrapped in bed sheets and his wallet and the 1984 Cadillac El Dorado were missing. This was reported to the police immediately. Barry's team won the finals the next day on July 6th, but Barry wasn't there to witness another great win on that Saturday. The news of his death had already created a panic in the tournament, but the tournament had to go on. In the end, Carey led the team to victory. It seemed like a perfect tribute to Barry and the players gathered for the tournament applauded loudly to honor Barry Crane. After witnessing the crime scene and the bloodstains, the police believed that Barry was killed in his apartment and then dragged from the third floor bedroom to the garage. They considered that the killer could have been someone whom Barry had some unresolved issues. The LA County Coroner's Office completed Barry's autopsy not long after the day of the incident. It was concluded that Barry died of blunt force trauma to the head. The investigators pursued the case and a few days later, on July 10th, Barry's stolen white Cadillac was found near Los Padres National Park to the west of Gorman Town on Interstate 5 on a mountain road 60 miles away from the crime scene. The detectives also went to the bridge tournament and collected DNA samples from the players who had been in contact with Barry. They were asked to provide samples of hair, fingerprints, and blood for the DNA reports. According to Dennis Sorensen, an accomplished bridge player, the interrogation was quite exhaustive. Some cigarette buds were found in the car, along with some blood samples. Using the help of forensics, some tests were done on the DNA collected from the cigarette buds. Five of the buds had a different DNA sample than that of Barry. The DNA was collected and they also took a fingerprint which they believed might have belonged to the suspect. It seemed that the case would close very soon and the suspect would be found, but that was not what happened. Even after the DNA was found, matching it to a person was a very difficult task for the investigators. The search continued for many years, but to no avail. The police interrogated many people in and around the area, but arrested no one and not even a suspect was found. They interrogated people, but very little information was gathered from them. The case slowly faded after 1986 and remained a mystery, eventually turning cold. The sudden death of Barry Crane sent a wave of shock through the hearts of many bridge players who were in the city for ongoing bridge competitions. As a first-class bridge player, Barry's death was heartbreaking in the whole bridge community. The LA Police Department started in negating the players who were in Pasadena for the competition and had seen Barry or known him. The entry slips that had been filled out by the tournament player were taken in as evidence, but no one was accused or taken into custody. Barry's partner, Carrie Schumann, was heartbroken and she couldn't believe that Barry would be a victim of homicide. She had no clue who could have done something like that to Barry, but she was definitely in the hope that the case would be solved quickly. According to LA Police Lieutenant Ron LaRue, Barry's home was not ransacked and there was no evidence of forced entry. He believed that Barry must have known the killer and let him into his apartment by will. In the year 2006, a Los Angeles Police Department detective from Robbery Homicide Division, RHD, requested that evidence, including fingerprints, be retested. The retest was done, but to no avail. The case still remained unsolved and two decades had already passed. The search for the suspect continued, but the police and the investigators found no clue that could lead them to the solution. Later in 2018, the RHD requested to test the fingerprint and other evidence gathered once again. After an attempt in July of 2018, RHD received a forensic match to Barry's suspected killer. Through the means of social media and by serving search warrants on Facebook and Verizon, the police were finally able to find and locate the suspect Edwin Hyatt, who was working in a car repair shop in Burke County, North Carolina, and was living in a camper van. It was obviously difficult to connect the evidence to hide it, as he was living about 3,000 miles away from the place of the incident. After locating Hyatt, the FBI was on constant alert and looking for a chance to collect Hyatt's DNA sample without his knowledge. It was finally possible when Hyatt stopped in a parking lot near his car repair center and drank a cup of coffee and smoked some cigarettes. 
An FBI surveillance team took the disposable coffee cup and discarded cigarette butts without Mr. Hyatt's knowledge according to court documents. These were then sent for testing. And by January 19th, the police finally got the DNA match. Edwin Jerry Hyatt was born in 1967 and grew up in North Carolina. Hyatt from a very young age showed signs of delinquency and indulged himself in drugs. The murder of Barry Crane was not the only accusation that Hyatt was charged for. Even before his arrest, for the 34-year-old cold case of Barry Crane, he had faced a charge for stealing a vehicle. He was caught with a stolen car in Utah in 1985 in the same year of Barry Crane's homicide. In 1997, Hyatt was charged with domestic violence. A witness told the court that Hyatt had beaten and choked his wife till she vomited. That was when Hyatt's fingerprints were uploaded to the police database. After he was found guilty, Hyatt got a divorce. That's not where Hyatt stopped. He apparently threatened to burn down the house where his ex-wife lived. In 2013, Hyatt moved to Connolly Springs and he started working for Turning Leaf Tree Service until he had an accident. And in 2014, he started volunteering at the Oak Suite and Creek Assisted Living Center. Later in 2018, according to the LAPD, homicide detectives traveled to Rutherford College, North Carolina, and interviewed Hyatt on the 8th of March 2019, where Hyatt confessed to murdering Barry Crane. The Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office charged Hyatt with one count of murder with a special allegation that he used a deadly and dangerous weapon during the commission of the crime. And they also issued an arrest warrant on the 3rd of May. The motive was not found, but if Hyatt was found guilty, he could face the maximum sentence of life imprisonment. Edwin Hyatt was later arrested by the FBI Fugitive Task Force on the 9th of May 2019 in North Carolina for the murder of Barry Crane. From there, he was moved to California. As Hyatt was led out of a sheriff's station in May 2019, he told reporters that he had been living in Burke County, North Carolina, and working at a Mercedes-Benz auto shop in neighboring Caldwell County. When asked about details of the case, Hyatt replied that he had no memory of that day and even of that time. He said that he had only bits and broken pieces of memory, which too could only be brought back by suggestions. He didn't even remember Barry when he saw his photograph, but later recognized him after the officers mentioned Barry's name. When the reporters gathered around Hyatt while he was being taken to court, he answered that he is trying his best to pass through that phase. On further interrogation, Hyatt confessed that killing Barry was very possible back then as he was addicted to drugs during that time. He would have been 18 years old when Barry was killed in his apartment. Even though Hyatt had a terrible and chaotic past, his co-workers mentioned Hyatt as a generous man. At the time of his arrest, Hyatt was working at Second Chance Engine Repair, a car repair shop in Rutherford College, North Carolina. He was described as a very humble and generous person by all of his co-workers. A co-worker, Jason Smith, said that Hyatt used to share his small earnings with him and even compared Hyatt to a father. He continued to say that Hyatt had known him for just two or three days and had earned $40 and still shared half of it with him. Another co-worker, D. Hall, told the investigators that Hyatt was very polite and he would never even hurt a fly. The most interesting part of the interrogation that they had with Hyatt's co-worker, D. Hall, was that when she was asked about Barry Crane's murder, she hesitated to speak up and Hall ended up saying that she had nothing to say about it. She said that even if it was a homicide, it might have been self-defense from Hyatt's side, and the story should be told only by Hyatt and not by any of them. Hyatt believed that whatever he was back then, he was nothing like that now over 30 years later. He believed that everything was left in the past, which he didn't even remember, and that he had changed into a completely different man. His co-workers had the same belief and said that whatever happened happened 30 years ago, and he was different now. From Hyatt's friend, Ernest Ward, it was understood that Hyatt started believing in Jesus and helped everyone in the name of Jesus. Ward said that Hyatt had shared his past drug and drinking problems, and that he was glad to be delivered by God. He believed that Hyatt had faced horrible demons in his past and he needed someone to be with him. And Ward accepted that role. It was initially unsure if Hyatt had a lawyer. When asked about anything more or reasons for the killing, Hyatt denied to speak before he got a lawyer. He was appointed a lawyer Stephen Chevron, who defended him for his court appearances. And on his first court appearance on Friday of May 9, 2019, Hyatt was using a wheelchair and spoke in a mumble. The court session was dismissed as a result of a plea agreement with the district attorney's office.
The court decided on setting the next date for the proceeding and the 7th of June 2019 was selected. Till then Hyatt had to be held in custody without bail. Joshua Smart took over from Stephen Chevron as Hyatt's attorney and was to defend Hyatt in the upcoming proceedings. According to Joshua, Hyatt was obviously willing to take responsibility and was a religious man. It was concluded that if the prosecutors didn't find any evidence by early August, Hyatt would be released from jail. During his time at Morgantown Jail in West Virginia, Hyatt started holding Bible study groups. And one of his friends from North Carolina, Ernest Ward, said that Hyatt had become a devout Christian and had been praying to be free from that phase. On the 5th of August 2019, Hyatt was served with the governor's warrant which ordered he be extradited to California. Hyatt was then extradited to Los Angeles, California on the 15th of August 2019. On October 8, 2019, Hyatt appeared in a Van Nuys courthouse in Los Angeles and was charged with one count of murder to which Hyatt pleaded not guilty. Deputy District Attorney Beth Silverman of the Major Crimes Unit became the prosecutor of the case. According to the law, if Hyatt was found guilty, he would have to serve the maximum sentence of life imprisonment in jail. Hyatt was scheduled to appear in court on the 17th of December 2019, and on October 7th of 2021, Hyatt pleaded guilty to voluntary manslaughter of Barry Crane. Hyatt was sentenced to 12 years of imprisonment. The most interesting part of this case is that not a single motive could be gathered as to why Hyatt killed Barry. Even though there was no conclusion on the reason for murder, there were many theories. Some theories suggested that Hyatt just wanted drug money and didn't care what he had to do for it or if he was picked up by someone back then as an escort. And it was Barry who did that. There is a theory that Barry was homosexual and wanted to take advantage of the 18-year-old Hyatt. Many believe that is the only explanation to this is Barry had nothing in common with Hyatt and he had no reason to welcome Hyatt to his apartment. Another theory says that Barry was a very cautious man and would never pick up someone he didn't know. So Crane must have known Hyatt. And maybe they had a relationship unknown to others. And more importantly, it was confidential, but it is believed that although Barry was closeted, he was homosexual and Los Angeles gave him the freedom that he needed. In a 2017 article, Michael Bertzold explained that though Barry was discreet and not vocal about his lifestyle, his contemporaries in Hollywood and in Bridge knew he was homosexual. So this might actually support the theory of the incident that day. Another theory explained that Barry's reports and search were kept to a minimum because he was homosexual and it was a big deal during that time. The AIDS epidemic also struck the nation during that time and gay men were the most affected by AIDS. So it was believed that Barry's case was not taken seriously for so long because of that prejudice. Another source of speculation centered on Perry's imminent plans to disinherit his children. According to the source, Barry had an appointment with his business manager regarding his will. The late Bill Melander, a Michigan physician who played against Crane in his Detroit days and treated his mother, learned that Crane's son, Ben, owed money to Las Vegas gamblers. And after learning about Barry's plan on changing his will, Barry's son planned the murder. Although Hyatt was arrested and eventually pleaded guilty, the motive of the murder still remains unsolved. The case might have been simple from the evidence first collected, but the colder the case gets, the harder it becomes to solve, and this case was no different. Nothing can be perfectly concluded for now. It's almost clear that Hyatt had something to do with the murder, but the case was made confidential after 2019. And there's nothing to say for certain and that's what made it the longest running cold case in the Hollywood industry. Barry Crane lived a life of the rich and shown during his days dominating the game of bridge and engraving his name in the television industry. But ultimately his $900,000 net worth and luxurious life came to a sudden end. And we hope he now rests in his grave in Mount Sinai Memorial Park in Hollywood Hills. So what are your thoughts on this cold case? Was Hyatt the killer or was it just self-defense? And what could have been the motive behind the case? Share your opinions in the comments section. In 1999, a mysterious disappearance occurred in the United States that still haunts people's minds today. An 11-year-old girl was left alone for 90 seconds and literally vanished. Years later, police would find a bill with I am alive written on it in the girl's name. In this video, we've compiled all the information we have on what happened to Michaela Bix. On January 2, 1999, in the American city of Mesa, Arizona, two sisters, 11-year-old Michaela and Kimber, were walking close to home. It was a chilly evening and just beginning to get dark outside. Despite the height of winter, Arizona is a warm southern state, 
so Michaela brought her bike and rode alongside her sister. At one point, the girls thought they heard the sound of an approaching ice cream truck. They put speakers on them and turned on music to alert children to the approach of a favorite treat. The girls hurried home to ask their mother and change for ice cream, then returned to the street. However, the ice cream truck was nowhere to be found, and the girls had to wait. At some point, Kimber got cold. She told her sister that she would run inside to get a jacket and come back. When she arrived back, Michaela was no longer there. The bike was lying on the road with its wheels still spinning. Beside it lay the two coins the girls prepared to buy ice cream. Kimber came home and told her mother that Michaela was missing. Neither she nor her mother had yet allowed even the thought that anything could have happened to the girl. The mother thought that Michaela had gone to a neighbor with whom the family was friendly, but the girl was not there, and the mother realized that something terrible might have happened to her daughter. Immediately thereafter, she went to the police. It is worth noting that the police response was very fast. Already in 30 minutes, a helicopter was in the air, the law enforcers stopped all suspicious cars and bypassed the surrounding houses. That day, volunteers from the girls' school handed out and posted flyers with her picture. Those pictures would later appear in storefronts and on billboards along roads throughout Arizona. Police searched dumpsters and inspected hundreds of homes. Detectives Butch Gates and Jerry Giselle were assigned to the case. The cops questioned every ice cream vendor in the state and could not establish that at least one of them was in that area at the time of the girl's disappearance. Detectives reconstructed the chronology of events and came to an eerie conclusion. The girl disappeared in just 90 seconds. That's how long Kimber had been missing. The spinning wheel on the bicycle confirmed the fact that the abduction had taken place extremely quickly. Search dogs, whose help was used by the investigation, could not get a trace of the girl, and when they did, they took only a few steps in the direction of the road. The fact that the dog takes the mark of the person only when the missing person left on his feet only reinforced the main version of the police. The girl was put in a car, taken away, and it all happened in a matter of seconds. The situation was complicated by the complete lack of witnesses. Despite the fact that the girls were playing in a street filled with houses, none of the neighbors saw them that night. Later, there was information that a man tried to kidnap the two girls right out of school. The children were 10 and 11 years old at the time. Police checked the information for a connection to the disappearance of Michaela, who was just 11, but the kidnapping turned out to be a failed prank. There was less and less evidence, so police began working out the standard theories. When a child goes missing, parents and other relatives are always checked. Given that Michaela's mother was at home at the time of the kidnapping, investigators focused on the girl's father, Darian Biggs. From the beginning, no one really believed in his involvement. Why would a father kidnap his own daughter, especially in such a way, in the middle of the street, in a short period of time when his other daughter was running home? However, it soon became clear that the man had lied about his alibi. During the first interrogation, he stated that he was at work at the time of the abduction, which turned out to be untrue. In reality, he was spending time with his mistress. What happened next was even more interesting. The man failed the polygraph questioning. His wife admitted that she knew about the cheating. Darian himself had told her about it a month before it happened. The couple thought about divorce. Despite the fake alibi, the police eventually stopped considering the father as a suspect. Even in the event of a divorce, his wife had no plans to forbid him from seeing his children. He simply had no motive. In addition, the detectives acknowledged that the lie detector results may have been influenced by the emotional state of the father whose daughter had just been abducted. He may even have laid some of the blame on himself and thought that if he had been home with his family, the tragedy could have been avoided. Detectives also tracked Darian's movements that evening and determined that he simply would not have had time to hide Michaela. The man showed up at home very quickly after his spouse called him to report his daughter missing. Detective Giselle later stated that Michaela most likely did not know her abductor. If it had been the father, she would not have thrown the bicycle and change on the ground. The girl tried to run away from the stranger but simply did not make it. During the investigation, police regularly had leads that led nowhere. An anonymous man called detectives and reported that Michaela's body was in an abandoned factory on the outskirts of town. Police combed the area but found nothing. Later, they received an email from an anonymous man claiming that he was the one who had kidnapped the girl. 
The FBI fairly quickly traced the sender's IP address and sent a SWAT team to his home in the city of Phoenix. It turned out that the sender was a 12-year-old boy who had just decided to make a joke. Meanwhile, the police had reached a stalemate, beginning to process even the most incomprehensible theories. They combed through 35 abandoned gold in the county, and then even questioned nearly 500 psychics who could supposedly help the investigation. Of course, this went nowhere. One witness was found who had seen a mint-colored sheep shortly before Michaela was kidnapped. The driver was quickly found and proved innocent. After that, the police were already desperate to find the girl because there was literally not a single clue left in front of them. This went on until September 27, 1999, when the quiet county was shocked by another shocking event. A woman living near Biggs returned home and walked into the kitchen to find a middle-aged man with his pants unbuttoned. Without uttering a word, he jumped on the woman and began strangling and abusing her. The perpetrator then set fire to the house and left. Apparently, the attacker thought his victim was dead, but the woman survived. Her neck was broken, but she was able to reach the phone and call an ambulance. Already on her way to the hospital, she whispered to the doctors from her last breath. Michaela Biggs, the girl who was missing, he took her. You must save her. The whole town was on its ears again. Events swirled rapidly. The police took the case and arrested the assailant. He turned out to be D. Bullock. The man was a well-known alcoholic in the area, who lived with his wife and three children, repaired wrecked cars, and occasionally disrupted public order. His house was only two blocks from Biggs. D was one of the first to volunteer to help find Michaela and willingly let police into the house to search, but not into the trailer in the backyard. For the trailer, he demanded a warrant. Agree, this behavior is extremely bizarre. A man with a bad reputation volunteering to help find a missing girl, giving the police a look around his house without any questions, and suddenly forbidding them to look in the trailer. From then on, Bullock became the prime suspect. Even though his wife provided him with an alibi for the time Michaela was kidnapped, no one believed her story, and most likely she was just afraid of her husband. Detectives began digging into Bullock's past and discovered that he had been tried three times for violence and molestation, as well as for kidnapping minors. He didn't get out of prison until 1995. And at that time, none of the neighbors had any idea what kind of monster lived next door. Several times a week, Michaela took private piano lessons from a neighbor who lived across the street from Bullock's house. This suggested that the man may have known the girl long before she disappeared. After Bullock was arrested for assaulting the woman, the police searched his house again and planned to investigate the trailer he had kept them out of earlier, but they were disappointed. The trailer had disappeared without a trace. This was a major blow to Michaela's parents. They were sure their daughter was there, alive or not, but he had disappeared and the police were unable to trace his location. Bullock was sentenced to 15 and a half years in prison for the September 27, 1999, attack on the woman. He categorically denied any involvement in Michaela's disappearance. This is not surprising. For the attack on his neighbor and the atrocities he did to her, 15 years in prison would be a lenient sentence by U.S. standards. A confession to kidnapping an 11-year-old girl, on the other hand, could have landed him straight in the electric chair. The parents could not accept that their only hope for the truth was gone. The mother and father wrote Bullock a letter directly to the prison, and the ultimate question whether he had anything to do with Michaela's disappearance. No one hoped to get a confession, but the criminal answer took the parents by surprise. He wrote that the conversation was too personal and suggested that her parents visit him in prison. At that moment, hope rekindled in the hearts of the parents that Bullock would confess, but they were greatly disappointed. Sitting across from the perpetrator, the father asked if he had anything to do with his daughter's disappearance. Bullock simply replied that he had nothing to do with her disappearance. The conversation continued in this vein for several more minutes, after which the perpetrator simply picked up and left accompanied by security. It looked as if he was just teasing the parents, giving them false hope, and destroying it by looking them in the eye. For a sadist like Bullock, the suffering of others can bring unsurpassed pleasure. This is apparently why he arranged the meeting with the grief-stricken grandparents. Afterwards, Michaela's father confessed that he was convinced that Bullock was involved. He stated, I was sitting a few feet away from the guy who killed my daughter, and there was nothing I could do about it. At this point, 
even the most staunch hopes of solving the case were abandoned. Absolutely everyone believed that no new leads would ever emerge. Years later, they would realize that they were wrong, but more on that later. On the fifth anniversary of Michaela's disappearance, the parents buried an empty coffin, finally saying goodbye to their daughter. During this time, their marriage broke up. They changed residence and were reluctant to contact journalists. Until 2018, the case went into a long drawer. The police simply had nothing to work with. But out of the blue, an event occurred that stirred up all of America. On March 14, 2018, a dollar bill excellently dropped at a police station in Nina, Wisconsin. On it was written in stubby handwriting, My name is Michaela Biggs, kidnapped from Mass, I am alive. The bill was found by a local resident who was collecting coins and dollar bills in a jar. He was the one who came across the dollar, after which he reported the find to the police, and they instantly reopened the investigation. Michaela's mother rushed nearly 2,000 miles away to look at the handwriting and see if the message was actually written by her daughter. Other relatives also came to the station, but they all made a disappointing statement. The handwriting looked nothing like Michaela's, and the name was misspelled. The mother suggested that the bill might be someone's extremely unfortunate prank. The other relatives also supported this theory. Despite this, the police attempted to trace the bill's path. Alas, it was almost impossible to do so. Paper money changes owners so many times that it was impossible to find the author of this inscription. Experts who studied the bill suggested that he was made by an adult man who was trying to imitate the handwriting of a child. Despite all this, the message on the paper bill seems highly suspicious. Could it have been someone's prank? The chance of police and relatives finding out about the bill is extremely slim. It could have been passed around for years, or it could have settled in a bank vault and no one would have noticed it. The fact that it ended up in the hands of a concerned person who reported it to the police is more of a miracle than inevitability. As for the handwriting, the most obvious version cannot be ruled out. Michaela may have written in a hurry for fear of being caught. Besides, she'd been missing for nine years before the bill appeared, assuming someone helped her captive. Did they give her something to write all that time? In nine years without practice, handwriting can change beyond recognition. There is another question no one knows the answer to. How long ago was this writing made? The bill could have been in circulation for years, or it could have appeared shortly before it was discovered. It's worth remembering Bullock, who was supposed to be released from prison in 2017. Perhaps the cynical prank is his doing. Suffice it to recall how he tormented unhappy parents by giving them false hope. Perhaps we will never know the answer to all these questions, or this case will once again shake the world with unexpected details. Kimber, who was the last person to see her older sister before she was kidnapped, still can't forget that gruesome January night. For a long time, she blamed herself for going home to get her jacket, but now she realizes that against an adult kidnapper, she would have been helpless. Kimber raises her young son, to whom she constantly talks about his Aunt Michaela. She calls her an angel who looks out for him. The girl, as well as the rest of her family, is sure that Michaela was kidnapped by Bullock. But without evidence, it can never be proved unless the criminal himself decides to confess to deal another blow to the missing girl's family. Do you think there's any hope that the writing on the bill was done by Michaela herself and she is still alive? Write your thoughts in the comments below the video. A young girl was found dead in her own apartment in an upscale building under 24-hour security. The police tried to solve this gruesome mystery for two weeks, and only dozens of surveillance tapes helped them discover the sad truth. Sasha Samsudian was born on July 4, 1988, in New York City. After high school, she moved to Florida, where she graduated from a local university. After receiving her degree, she took a job as a social media manager for a real estate agency in Orlando. Her career took off quickly, receiving solid bonuses and awards for her good work. Sasha's friends spoke of her as a friendly, sweet, and outgoing girl with a big heart. She was a member of several charitable foundations, taking an active part in their activities. On October 16, 2015, the last day of the soccer season in Orlando, Sasha and her friends went to the stadium to support their favorite team. The match ended in victory, and the company went to the popular Attic nightclub downtown to celebrate. After spending a few hours there, Sasha left the club around half past one. As it turned out later, she hadn't told her friends where she planned to go. She could have gone home or to another bar. 
Before she left, she arranged to have breakfast in the morning with a friend, Anthony, who was at the club that night. The next day, he arrived at the cafe at the appointed time, but the girl never showed up. She also did not answer her cell phone or social media messages. Such behavior was not typical for Sasha, who was always in touch and would not ignore Anthony, especially when they had agreed to meet in advance. At first, he thought she was just sleeping it off after the party last night, but several hours passed and there was no answer. Then the young man began to seriously worry about Sasha. Anthony, along with two of Sasha's closest friends, went to her apartment in the secure Uptown Place apartment complex, where she had rented an apartment for the past six months. When they drove up to her house, they found a girl's car parked in the parking lot. Inside the car, the friends noticed a box of children's toys. On that day, Sasha was supposed to go to a baby shower at her friend Quentin's house, but the gift was still in the car. When they got to the door of the apartment, they started knocking and calling out for Sasha, but all they got was silence. It all looked extremely disturbing, and the friends decided to call 911. The squad arrived at her house around 8 p.m. The cops asked the guards to open the apartment door with a spare key and went inside. At first glance, there were no signs of a struggle in the apartment, but as soon as the officers entered the bedroom, a gruesome discovery awaited them. Sasha's arm and hair were sticking out from under the blanket of the bed. It was clear almost at once that the police were dealing with a murder. There were clear signs of strangulation on her neck. In addition, her torn t-shirt was lying nearby, the same one the girl wore to the stadium. This could indicate that the attack took place immediately after Sasha came home. The pendant she always wore was also torn from her neck. For Sasha's relatives and friends, this event came as a real shock as she had always been a kind and cheerful person, and it simply didn't make sense that someone would hurt her in such a cruel way. In talking to the police, her family and friends couldn't name a single person with whom Sasha might have had problems. Detectives began their search for evidence, and the first thing they noticed was the persistent smell of detergent in the apartment. The cabinet with household chemicals was open, indicating that the perpetrator was trying to wash away traces of his presence. However, he only partially succeeded. Detectives also found an empty contraceptive wrapper in the hallway and a shoe print near the girl's bed. In the bathroom, they found that the toilet seat was up despite the fact that the girl lived alone. Experts found a fingerprint on it that didn't belong to Sasha. No other clues were found in the apartment. In addition, there were no keys, no smartphone, and no purse belonging to Sasha. Soon after came the report of medical experts, confirming that the girl died of strangulation. One of the doctors said he had never seen such severe injuries to the neck as in this case. This would seem to indicate that the attacker was physically well prepared. In addition, the experts determined that Sasha had been abused. They were also able to find a DNA sample from an unknown male on the girl's body. Unfortunately, there were no matches with him in the databases. In the meantime, the detectives began searching for witnesses and first questioned the security guard who was on duty that night. It was 33-year-old Stephen Daxbury, a former Marine. The management of the apartment complex had hired men with impressive experience in the police, army, and other specialized services, but even that did not help Sasha. Stephen said he saw the girl that night, mentioning that she was very drunk and tried to get into the building, but she couldn't. The girl was missing her ID, badge, and smartphone. According to the rules, the security guard could not open her door without a valid ID or proof of residency. For this reason, Stephen refused to let her in. Sometime later, he went on a routine patrol and saw that Sasha had somehow made it onto the compound after all. He assumed that the girl had entered the building with another resident who opened the door with her pass, but the girl ran into a new problem. To get into the apartment, she needed a key, which she did not have. Each door in the complex also opened with a code lock, but Sasha couldn't remember the right code. She turned to Steven and asked him to walk her to her car to look there for the keys again. Without the guard with his pass, she would no longer be able to get into the complex. Steven went with her, but there were no keys in the car. Sasha suddenly stated that she remembered the code to the door, and they went back to her apartment, but there again, the girl was unable to enter the correct password. After that, the guard said he had to go back to his post. He promised to help her solve the problem if at the time of his next round Sasha still could not remember the right code. However, 
The next time he went to patrol the area, Sasha was nowhere to be found. It was not until the morning that Stephen noticed her in the company of a man he had not seen in the complex before. The guard failed to describe his appearance in detail, so the police had to look for this unknown man practically at random. We could only hope that this man might have been caught on one of the 15 security cameras set up on each floor of the building and near the exit. In addition, the detectives requested footage from cameras located along Sasha's route from the club to his home, a 10-block stretch. On such a stretch, there was almost a 100% chance that the girl was caught in the lens of at least a few cameras. After studying the footage from the club and the surrounding area, investigators immediately spotted Sasha. They could see her leave the establishment and head in the direction of the house. She stood out with her brightly colored outfit, wearing white pants, a purple t-shirt, and flip-flops. It was apparent in these dark shots that the girl was stumbling and staggering slightly, indicating that Sasha had been drinking quite a bit of alcohol in the club, which matched the security guard's testimony. It was also apparent that Sasha left the club alone. A little later, another camera caught her, and this time, she was walking in the company of two girls. The police showed her pictures to Sasha's friends, but no one recognized them. This led the detectives to believe that the three met on the street. It was important for the detectives to find these girls because they might have valuable information. To do this, they sent their photos to the local media, and soon the women were identified. During the interrogation, the girls said that they saw Sasha on the street. At that moment, two men approached her and tried to get acquainted with her. Given that it was late at night, the girls were afraid for Sasha and decided to walk home with her. This helped get rid of those annoying men. After walking some distance, the girls suggested that Sasha call herself an Uber since she didn't have her phone or any other personal belongings with her. They went with her to her house and awaited until she got inside. Given that she didn't have a pass, Sasha had to wait for some other guests to open the door. At 1.46 a.m., the cameras caught a man approaching Sasha and talking to her about something. It turned out that it was a resident of the complex who opened the door for her with his pass. Thus, investigators learned the exact time when the girl was able to get into the building. The man was no longer on camera, so the detectives did not consider him a suspect. The cops continued to study the footage and 20 minutes later noticed something else interesting. All the cameras in the building also recorded sound, and at one point outside the camera's field of view, they heard footsteps. The investigators concluded that Sasha was walking next to this camera in the corridor of the building. The next time she was spotted was at 2.25 a.m., but already in the company of a security guard. They headed in the direction of the parking lot and then returned to the compound. This also coincided with Steven's story. After that, Sasha was not caught on any cameras, and other detectives were at a standstill again. The police decided to question the guys Sasha had been in a relationship with in the past. This idea had to do with the method of murder. More often than not, strangulation is motivated by passion, and the culprit is someone close to them. The first guy's name was Taylor. Again, Sasha broke up a long time ago but continued their friendship. He worked as a bartender and was on duty until 9.30 p.m. on October 16th. He voluntarily provided the detectives with his DNA sample, which did not match the sample found on Sasha's body. A man named Ben was called next for questioning. In addition to being in a relationship with Sasha, he was also the last person she wrote to before she died. Detectives discovered that at 5.12 a.m., Sasha had sent him a text message that only included his name, Ben. This was very strange, especially when you remember that according to the story of the security guard and the two girls, Sasha didn't have her phone when she returned from the club. Investigators also learned that Sasha had planned to meet Ben this weekend. However, the man had an alibi. On the night of the murder, he was with friends. In addition, he voluntarily provided a DNA sample, which also came back negative. By that time, the detectives had finished examining all the available camera footage and noticed something strange. The questioned security guard, Stephen Duxbury, said that his shift ended exactly at 6 in the morning, after which he went home, but one of the cameras captured him leaving the building at 6.36 a.m. And that was not all. He was holding two large trash bags with red handles. Exactly the same ones were lined in Sasha's apartment. After speaking with the management of the apartment complex, the police learned that it was not the responsibility of the security guards to take out the trash. 
A logical question arises. Why was Stephen late for work for almost an hour? Hiding this fact from the police and carrying garbage bags allegedly taken from Sasha's apartment? Given all these suspicious points, investigators offered the security guard a polygraph interrogation. When asked if he had ever entered such an apartment, Stephen answered in the negative, and the machine recorded the lie. Next, he was asked if he knew how Sasha died. Three different questions came up. Was she poisoned, attacked with a sharp object, or strangled? At the last question, Stephen's post jumped sharply. Information about the girl's cause of death had not been released anywhere, and the guards simply couldn't know. Even when the police came to Sasha's apartment with the other guards, they were not allowed inside. It turns out that Stephen could only know the correct answer if he was in the girl's apartment at the time of the murder. Despite all this, it is almost impossible to convict a person on the basis of a polygraph reading alone. So the police had to look for additional evidence. Investigators asked Stephen to show them the shoes he was wearing that night. He provided them with a pair of shoes, and their soles did not match the footprint found in Sasha's apartment. However, the police also obtained a search warrant for his apartment, where they found other shoes, and they showed an exact match. Moreover, the fingerprint from the toilet in Sasha's apartment matched the events. By taking his DNA sample, experts quickly found a perfect match with a sample found on Sasha's body. Police learned even more gruesome details after examining Stephen's phone. At about 5 a.m., he was searching on Google for how to quickly pick a combination lock door. The same one had been installed on the door of Sasha's apartment. Detectives finally found a severe bite mark on Stephen's arm, as well as numerous scratches on his body. All this was enough to arrest the man and charge him with murder. With that set of evidence, no one had any doubt about a conviction anymore. According to the investigation, Stephen saw that Sasha was heavily intoxicated and decided to take advantage of it. After waiting for some time after the girl entered her apartment, he opened the electronic lock, and then he abused and killed the girl. Only one question remains unclear. Judging by the bites and scratches on Stephen's body, Sasha struggled to fight back and most likely screamed. How come none of the neighbors heard that? The house she lived in was quite old, and the noise insulation there must have been extremely mediocre. After Stephen had finished with Sasha, he began to cover his tracks. The man took cleaner from her closet, spilled it all over the apartment, and even near Sasha's body. He then collected all the evidence into bags, which he later got on camera with. Apparently, he either didn't think about the fingerprint on the rim of the toilet bowl or he forgot. Stephen's trial began in November 2017. His lawyer immediately demanded that several key pieces of evidence be excluded from consideration because his client had allegedly been misled. This included boots found in his apartment, as well as polygraph evidence. The news media hyped the story as if the judge was ready to honor the request, but that never happened. All the evidence remained in the case file. However, even without it, Stateman's chances of an acquittal were too small. The lawyer also tried to play on the fact that the investigation did not have any camera footage showing his client entering Sasha's apartment, but this attempt was debunked by the fact that his fingerprints and DNA were inside the apartment. Finally, the lawyer stated that there may have been voluntary sexual intercourse between Stephen and Sasha that night, and when the security guard left, someone else broke into the apartment and killed her. Of course, this attempt also went nowhere. The trial lasted only a week, which is very short by U.S. standards. After a four-hour deliberation, the judge handed down a verdict, life in prison for the murder and an additional 15 years for the breaking and theft. After the verdict was pronounced, Sasha's parents made a speech. They thanked the police for their quick and high-quality investigation and expressed their condolences to Stephen's mother, who was present at the hearing. They noted that Stephen's parents had also lost their child that day. Shortly thereafter, Sasha's family sued the management of the complex, which was responsible for selecting security guards, as well as the manufacturer of the code locks. During the proceedings, it emerged that other residents of the complex had repeatedly complained about Stephen's molestation, but management took no action. As for the lock, lawyers for Sasha's family insisted that the model did not meet security requirements. They cited as evidence an article that described how to open such a lock with a simple screwdriver in seconds. In February 2019, Stephen tried to appeal his conviction, but the court dismissed his claim. In memory of their daughter, 
Sasha's parents decided to help the families of other victims cope with their grief. With such a tragic experience under their belt, they could find the right words and phrases to ease their suffering. The outcome of this story is very sad. The man who had been tasked with guarding people turned out to be a murderer. Just a few queries on Google helped him open the door of someone else's apartment without too much trouble. The two girls who met Sasha that night deserve special mention. They didn't just call her a cab on their own account, but drove with her to make sure she got home and was safe. Unfortunately, it was within the walls of her own home that the main danger to Sasha lurked. A Native American, Serena Shelley Fay, was born on June 18, 2003, on the Indian reservation of Bighorn County, Montana, in a town called Harding. People she knew described her as a kind, cheerful, and very active girl. She loved to play basketball, had many friends, but her main hobby was horseback riding. Selena seriously considered opening her own farm when she graduated from high school, as well as participating in races at the professional level. Even with all the tragedy her family had endured, she kept a positive attitude. Originally, a family of five children, Selena's 11-year-old twin sister committed suicide in 2014, leaving no hint as to what prompted her to complete such a tragic move. In 2017, Selena's brother was killed by a police officer. In that same year, Selena's older sister was killed under the wheels of a car. She was walking along the road when an unknown driver hit her and fled the scene. That left only two of the five children. It's hard to believe how much pain and suffering one family can endure. Alas, the tragedies in their lives did not end there. Selena spent New Year's Eve 2020 with friends. They went to a party at a country house where they stayed until the next day. On January 1st, Selena and five of her friends, which included four young men and one girl, drove back to Harding by car. Then the story gets weird, to say the least. Nevertheless, this is the official data from the case file, and we will read it first. And so the car malfunctioned on its way into town. The driver parked it at a nearby stop and tried to fix the car. He managed to fix the problem temporarily, but he stated that the car could break down again at any time. For this reason, he asked Selena and her friend Orlando to wait at the stop until his mother drove up there to pick them up since she was just under 15 minutes away from the stop by car. The story sounds highly questionable. Why did the girl's friends decide to drive on, leaving them at a bus stop in the middle of nowhere? But that is exactly the way things were according to the driver. There was also a version that after fixing the car, the driver had to leave immediately. Otherwise, the car risked to stall again, and Selena and her friend at the time had gone too far, and the guys decided to leave without them, sending the mother of one of them after them. But this version is not reflected in the police documents, but only cited by the local media. What follows is actually confirmed information. The driver's mother had indeed come to the bus stop to pick up the girls, but they were no longer there. Thinking they might have been walking around somewhere nearby, the woman began to look for them. At one point, she did come across Orlando who was sitting in a ditch looking lost. Her shoes were missing and all her feet were covered in scratches. Selena was nowhere near her. The shocked woman tried to ask Orlando what had happened, but she said she had absolutely no memory of how she got here and didn't even know where she was. Then the woman contacted Selena's parents and told them she was missing, and they immediately contacted the police. The first thing the police did was talk to Orlando. She still couldn't remember the details of what had happened. She only told the detectives that she had seen Selena just walk off in the direction of the road into a field, and her friend never saw her again. Upon hearing this story, Selena's parents couldn't understand why their daughter would go off in some unknown direction for no apparent reason. The problem was that it was freezing outside, and the girl was clearly not dressed for the weather. She was wearing a light jacket, sweater, and jeans. I think you've already realized how strange this whole story is, but that was just the beginning. On the same day, police organized a large-scale search within a radius of about 6 kilometers of the place where the girl was last seen. Hundreds of people, including service dogs, mounted police, helicopters, ATVs, and even drones with heat sensors, were involved. The FBI also became involved very quickly. The case may have taken on such proportions because of a sad statistic. Native Americans in Montana go missing far more often than other segments of the population. 
Most of the time, police are as reluctant as possible to investigate these cases and sometimes refuse to do so at all. Locals regularly come out in protests and try to reach out to the federal government, but Native Americans continue to go missing. In addition, Selena's relatives immediately turned to news outlets for help in making the story public and speeding up police work. News of Selena's disappearance quickly spread throughout the city, and hundreds of volunteers joined the search for her. Most were also Native Americans, including students from her school. Adults helped scour the area, and teenagers posted flyers and distributed information about their classmates' disappearance throughout the city, but the search yielded no results. Of course, police examined the car in which Selena and her friends drove home, and also questioned all her friends who had been with her that day, and here are things that are just as strange. Investigators have not released any information related to this. The friends may not have told them anything useful, but the public was waiting for at least some details. Then the police decided to pursue another theory. What if Selena had been kidnapped from that bus stop? This theory ran counter to the story of a friend who claimed Selena had gone into the field, but the kidnapping theory received some support as well. A witness reported seeing a green car with Wyoming plates near the bus stop. As the days went by, the search yielded no results. So most people began to consider the kidnapping version as the main one. Reports poured into police that people had seen the girl in various places. But all these leads proved useless. Police examined security camera footage of the places where Selena was allegedly seen, and she was not there. The police also tried to track the location of the girl's smartphone, but they were unsuccessful. It was turned off. The investigation continued in such ignorance until January 20th. On that day, three weeks after Selena's disappearance, the most mysterious event in the whole story happened. The girl's body was finally found. It was found just a mile from that very bus stop. The body was discovered by the Bighorn County Sheriff who went by the Indian name Big Hair. Let's refresh your memory on key points. Hundreds of volunteers on foot, dozens of horseback riders, service dogs, a helicopter, drones with heat sensors, and a search radius of about 6 kilometers. For all that, the body is found within a kilometer of the bus stop. At this point, everyone had one question. How could they not notice? Of particular note is the fact that the place where Selena was found is practically a bare field. The Bighorn County Sheriff's Office said the preliminary version is that death was due to natural causes. On February 20th, 8th, more than a month after the body was found, the results of the medical examination came back. The report signed by four doctors cited hypothermia as the cause of death. All of this raised even more questions and distrust on the part of the public. Not only were search parties unable to locate Selena in an open field for 20 days, but she also allegedly died of hypothermia, a kilometer from the road. Let's take a look at what the temperature was that day. According to a local news site that publishes daily weather information, it was about 8 degrees outside in the afternoon, January 1st. Selena was wearing a light jacket and sweater. Although it was not enough for a long and comfortable stay outside, it is possible for a healthy 16-year-old girl to freeze to death. After all, there was a highway just a kilometer away from her where cars passed by regularly and she could call for help. How should events have developed so that the girl deliberately waited to die in one place and managed to freeze to death at 8 degrees Celsius? Of course, all these questions fell on the police. Investigators said that drones and a helicopter were obstructed by poor visibility that day due to heavy fog, and that foot and other units simply did not notice Selena even though they were passing within a few hundred meters of her. As for the dogs, they were service dogs, but not search dogs. In addition, they were kept on a leash because many strangers were involved in the search and the police were afraid to let the dogs go so that they would not attack those present. To Selena's family, as well as the entire Native American community, these excuses seemed utterly unconvincing, and they demanded a thorough investigation into her murder. To them, it looked as if the girl's body had been placed there after the first wave of the search ended. But there was one big problem here. The Bighorn County Sheriff who led the police in this case and personally discovered Selena's body had a very murky history behind him. In 1995, when he was still a simple officer, a Native American woman accused him of violence, but the man denied the charges and was not convicted. Two years later, his service weapon was used in a murder and the would-be sheriff was put on trial again. 
There, he claimed his weapon had been stolen and had nothing to do with the case. All charges were dropped again, but here's the strange thing. He paid the victim's family a portion of the amount they demanded in the lawsuit. Later, he went to court again for assault and battery, but here too, he received no serious punishment. Not surprisingly, the community was slow to take this man at his word. Despite the FBI's involvement in the case, relatives and acquaintances of Selena began to suspect that the sheriff himself might have something to do with the murder of the girl and the further cover-up of this fact. But here, another question arises. Even if we imagine that the sheriff grabbed Selena that day and took her to an undisclosed location, what next? The four medical examiners signed a report that clearly stated there were no marks on the girl's body indicating a violent death. They could only confirm death from hypothermia. Given the FBI's involvement, could the sheriff have gotten the four doctors to cover something up? Or could he have kept Selena outside until she actually died of hypothermia? Sounds doubtful. There is another version of what happened. The teens were drinking on New Year's Eve as the initial toxicology report indicates. But number one knows what they did the next day. They may have continued drinking or taken some kind of illegal substance. As for alcohol, it is unlikely to be relevant. A person would need to drink a lot to just go into a field, lie on the ground, and lie down long enough to die of hypothermia. Even taking into account the fact that Selena was only 16 years old, this theory is somehow not believable, but the version about banned substances could explain a lot. First, let's remember Selena's friend who was sitting in a ditch with no shoes and scratched feet. Then let's remember the extremely strange story about the broken-down car and the unclear reasons why the boys left the girls at a deserted bus stop. Perhaps the teens did take something, but it was too much for the bodies of the two girls. The boys could have gotten scared and just left them at the bus stop. But this theory is greatly undermined by the fact that the driver did call his mother who came to pick up the girls just 15 minutes later. Would he have done so if the girls were in an inadequate condition? Most likely teenagers would not have involved their parents in such a situation. But there are a few odd things about their company. First, Selena's friend posted several short videos on Snapchat from that trip. One of the moments shows someone standing in front of the open hood of the car trying to fix something. At the same time, near the back passenger seat, two guys are arguing aggressively about something. What was going on there is still unknown. All the people who were with Selena that day are silent. What's more, Two of them have moved to other states, and Orlando has deleted her Facebook page. It's all very strange. It's been over a year, and none of them have responded to the questions that are still troubling the local Native American community and other concerned people. Nor have the police made any comment about the other teenagers. There is a persistent impression that something is being carefully hidden in this story. As a result, we have a closed case where the official version seems too dubious because according to it, Selena just went into the field, walked for a few hours, and then just lay on the ground. After all, the police were already on the scene a few hours later. And if she had continued to walk around, she would definitely have been spotted. Further, she could not be found by hundreds of people with modern technology, and 20 days later her body appeared a kilometer down the road. It looked as if she had been placed there after the active phase of the search was over. Although the police assure us that there were no tire tracks or other evidence that the body might have been moved near this spot, one can't trust the police in this case. Given the history of the sheriff, one seriously doubts that the police investigation can be considered objective. However, the FBI was involved in the case, and they certainly wouldn't cover up some provincial sheriff. As we can see, each version faces its own contradictions. Now one and a half years later, the girl's family is still trying to find answers. How do five children? They have only one son left. They are asking to spread the story about their daughter so they can have a chance at a new honest investigation. What do you think happened to Selena after all? Share your opinion in the comments. Tara Grinstead was born in 1974 in Hawking, USA. During her high school years, she actively participated in beauty contests, winning prizes. The girl, from an early age, set a goal to get a quality education. So the money earned in competitions, she put aside to pay for her education. After college, Tara earned a master's degree in education and landed the job she had long dreamed of. She became a high school history teacher in Asala, Georgia. This tiny town was a typical low-rise America. Its population did not exceed 4,000 people, 
most of whom knew each other well. Life was quiet and measured. None of the locals could think that any serious crime could occur in Asilla. Sarah Grinstead had worked at the local school for several years. And during that time, she had developed a great relationship with both staff and students. She was a kind and outgoing person who was always supportive and helpful. In October 2005, this help came in handy for Tara's students who were preparing to participate in a local beauty pageant. Given the fact that their teacher had won prizes at similar events many times, the girls were thrilled to have her support. On Saturday, October 22nd, Tara helped the students with the final touches before the pageant. Afterward, she went to a picnic with her high school friends and didn't return home until 11 p.m., having parked her car outside under a carport. Since then, Tara had stopped making contact. Her mother, who lived in another city, was the most worried. Her daughter always picked up the phone or called back. But this time, there was no answer. On Monday, October 24th, her anxiety reached its peak, and Tara did not show up for work. Such behavior was highly unusual for her. The girl took her job seriously and would certainly have warned her bosses that she needed time off. Concerned acquaintances of Tara called the police chief Billy Hancock and asked him to see if she was all right. At 10 a.m. that morning, he went to her address. The policeman thought the woman's phone was just dead and that she was either sick or had overslept. When he arrived at her house, he found Tara's car in its usual spot. Her doors were unlocked, but that didn't surprise Billy. In a town this small, the residents had no worries about their cars being stolen. Then he noticed an envelope on the dashboard containing $100 in cash. It was already strange. How could someone as responsible as Tara leave money in a prominent place? Billy knocked on the door, but no one opened it for him. After that, he decided to look around the house. At first glance, everything seemed perfectly ordinary. No signs of a struggle or a break-in, but in Tara's bedroom, the detective found a real mess, quite uncharacteristic for a woman. Her belongings were on the floor, including the clothes she had last been seen in. Her cell phone was on the nightstand charging. It looked as if Tara had left the house briefly, but she was nowhere to be found. On the ground outside the house, the police found the first piece of evidence that suggested a possible crime. There was a latex glove lying around that someone might have used to conceal her fingerprints. The detectives did not consider the possibility that the glove might have belonged to Tara. Hardly anyone used such gloves at home. Since then, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, the equivalent of the FBI only at the level of one state, got involved in the case. The main version of the investigation was kidnapping. There was very little evidence. Besides the glove, the detectives found only two questionable things. Tara's torn chain was lying on the bedroom floor, and her alarm clock was not in its usual place. But all this did not help detectives solve the mystery of her disappearance. For the small town, this Monday was truly a terrible day. Tara's house was cordoned off, and the school had a meeting. Tara's co-workers and students tried their best to help in the search by forming a group of volunteers. They printed out a stack of flyers with a woman's picture and information about her disappearance. And within hours, the flyers were posted all over the city. Volunteers stayed home that day until 1 a.m. Agents from the Bureau of Investigation interviewed Tara's neighbors and investigated a neighborhood in which she lived. The search involved sniffer dogs which had been brought in in the hope of picking up the missing person's trail. Investigators still had hoped that Tara had simply left on foot, and the dogs would find her easily. In the meantime, the latex glove was given to experts whose goal was to collect as much data as possible. They managed to get a DNA sample, but no matches could be found in the FBI database. All that was known was that the sample belonged to a man. Alas, all yielded no results. Tara as if she had evaporated from her own home. Then investigators began to dig into Tara's personal life and past. It often happens that when a woman disappears, someone from her inner circle is to blame. After studying the man with whom Tara was in a relationship, detectives were unable to identify any suspects. She dated Marcus Harper, a former policeman and military officer, for the longest time. The couple broke up at Tara's initiative about a year before she disappeared. The reason was that the woman wanted to build a family, and Marcus was not ready for that. After the breakup, they maintained an amicable relationship, calling and texting each other. Detectives later uncovered one interesting detail. 
Marcus had come to Asilla three weeks before Tara disappeared, but he had not told her. Upon learning of Marcus's arrival from mutual acquaintances, the woman became very upset. She repeatedly called him trying to find out why he had not informed her of his arrival. Soon, her conditions turned into real hysteria. Her relatives were very worried and even wondered if Tara was going to do something reckless. However, the girl soon came to her senses, and the police did not consider Marcus a suspect. The couple had been together for a long time, but their relationship ended, and a detective could not find a motive for the crime. An interesting twist soon awaited them. Please learn that Tara had been threatened by her former student on March 30, 2005, seven months before the girl disappeared. He came to her house and behaved extremely aggressively. When Tara refused to let him in, the guy started banging on the door, and the neighbors had to call the police. It turned out that the young man had been in love with the teacher since high school. According to her acquaintances, the former student was emotionally unstable and behaved strangely and even frighteningly. Tara tried to help him deal with his problems for a while, but his mental state only worsened. After that incident, when the young man tried to break into her house, the woman filed a report against him. She seriously feared he might hurt her. After Tara went missing, the police tracked the young man down. He worked in a neighboring town about 150 kilometers from Mozilla. The boy provided detectives with an alibi for the night of his former teacher's disappearance. It was impossible to establish his involvement in the case. A business card of a certain police officer was also found in the woman's house. It turned out that Tara had been dating him for some time. At the time of her disappearance, he was already living in another city. The policeman also provided an alibi for the night of Tara's disappearance. This effectively ended the list of possible suspects. With no leads in hand, the police decided to organize a search for the girl two weeks after her disappearance. Such a belated decision seemed strange. After all, it was clear from the first minutes Tara had not left home of her own free will. Hundreds of volunteers were called in to search the area around the Scylla. Volunteers went through forests, ditches, and rivers, but they couldn't find a single trace of Tara. During the search, it was reported that a house and car had burned down near Tara's home. Locals unanimously agreed that the incident had something to do with the woman's disappearance. Perhaps the perpetrator was trying to cover his tracks, or the people were so shocked and frightened that they found each event suspicious. Whatever the case, the search yielded no results, and the police were faced with a grim reality. They simply had no leads left. The next few years brought the police no closer to solving the mystery. It wasn't until 2009 that an event occurred that brought the missing Tara Grinstead back into the spotlight. A user created a YouTube channel and posted an extremely creepy video. A man was sitting in the frame, his face plastered over, and his voice altered. In the video, he claimed to be involved in the disappearance of 16 girls, naming them by name. Among them was Tara Grinstead. The unidentified man added that he had hidden the body securely and would give clues about the burial site in new videos. Please immediately check the video and found that all 16 names did indeed belong to the missing women. The FBI was able to track down the author of the video fairly quickly. It turned out to be 27-year-old Andrew Haley. After his arrest, he said that he was just joking. The police could not connect Andrew with any of the 16 missing girls, but he still could not avoid a trial. For perjury and tampering with evidence, the man was sentenced to two years of forced labor and 13 years of probation. Momentary hopes of solving this cold case faded. And once again, the police were left without a single lead. In December 2010, Tara Grinstead was officially declared dead because there was simply nothing to work with. As the years passed, the townspeople remembered Tara Grinstead's disappearance perfectly. Remembered, but less and less discussed talk of terror remained only behind closed doors. The topic hardly ever came up in everyday life. The town had changed forever. Fear and mistrust permeated the locals for years to come. It wasn't until 2016 that something happened that got people talking openly about Tara again. Atlanta-based journalist Payne Lindsay created his own podcast devoted to mystery cases. And for the first issue, he took on the Tara Grinstead case. The man and his colleague traveled to Asala, where they met private investigator, Maurice Gutwin. Together, they began working on the case literally from scratch. They had no access to police records, so the only available source of information was the people of the town.
At first, they were only able to talk to friends and relatives of Tara. Outsiders avoided talking about the missing girl in every way, but it didn't last long. Lindsay's enthusiasm managed to revive interest in the case, and soon the people of Asala were discussing it again. Lindsay and Gutwin worked through every possible lead. They considered three possible suspects, Tara's ex-boyfriends and the student who tried to break into her house. Along the way, they talked to anyone who might have any useful information. They were so passionate about the case that on several occasions, they thought a clue was literally one step away. One day, Payne received a call in which an unknown person suggested they look for remains on Tara's property. The police did so, and at some point, they managed to find the bones. True, experts quickly determined that the bones belonged to an animal. Despite the excitement and a new wave of interest in the case, no serious progress was made. Or rather, they failed to solve the case directly during the creation of the podcast, but it was this amateur investigation that was decisive, and the long-awaited denouement came completely unexpectedly. In early 2017, Brooke Sheridan came to the police. Her story shocked the detectives, who no longer believed that the truth would ever come out. Brooke told investigators that her ex-boyfriend named Bo Duke had once confessed to her. He had helped his friend dispose of Tara Grinstead's body. Upon learning of this, the girl repeatedly begged the guy to confess to everything. But he remained silent. After listening to Brooke's story, the police did not rush things. Who knows? Maybe this woman just wanted fame and attention, especially when a successful podcast got everyone talking about the case again. The detectives decided to play it safe. They asked Brooke to wear a wire and go to Bo to beat out a confession, and it worked. The man didn't deny his involvement, and the police had probable cause to arrest him. To their surprise, Bo immediately cooperated with the investigation and laid all his cards on the table. Later, detectives would say that he was just tired of living with his burden on his soul. Late that night, he got a call from his friend and former classmate, Ryan Duke. He asked to borrow a truck to help him with something. Then added, I've broken into Tara Grinstead's house to steal some money. But something didn't go according to plan, and I killed her. According to Ryan's story, after a party with friends, he went for a drive. At this point, he decided to break into someone's house to steal money, and his choice was Tara's house. He was under the influence of illegal substances at the time. After opening the door with a credit card, he broke into the house and began looking for money. Tara spotted him. A struggle ensued between them, from which only Ryan came out alive. When Bo arrived at Tara's house in a truck, they loaded the woman's body into it and drove her into the woods. The two of them then got rid of the body for several days. This story shocked the residents of Asala. Jukes and Duke were never considered suspects for they simply had no motive. Nor were there any clues that could link these two to the disappearance of the woman. Despite a full confession, Bo Dukes would not testify against himself in court. At the trial, he spoke to Tara's relatives, wept, and apologized for what he had done. Bo spent a long time in the military, was a veteran, and had many decorations, but the court ruled 25 years in prison for helping cover up a crime. Tara Grinchstead's murder trial by Ryan Duke was set for April 1, 2019, but the Georgia Supreme Court postponed the trial on March 28, 2019. After Duke's attorney said they were unconstitutionally denied funding for experts to testify on Duke's behalf. The trial began on May 9, 2022. At trial, Ryan Duke pleaded not guilty to murder and charged Bo Dukes with murder. On May 20, 2022, a jury found Ryan Duke not guilty of murder, aggravated assaults, and burglary, but guilty of concealment of death. At trial, Duke testified that his confession to the murder was false telling the jury that he had done it under the influence of drugs and in fear of the real killer, his friend with a similar last name, Dukes. He said, Bo Jukes woke him up in the mobile home where they lived together in 2005 and told him he had killed Tara Grinstead, then showed Dukes their teacher's purse and wallet. Although her body was never found, investigators matched Grinstead's DNA of bone fragments found at the location where Ryan Duke testified to investigators that he and Bo Dukes had burned her. On May 23, 2022, Ryan Duke was sentenced by the Erwin County Superior Court to 10 years in prison for concealing the body. The sentence imposed by the judge was the maximum penalty allowed. By the time Ryan Duke was sentenced, he had already served about half of that sentence while awaiting trial.
Prosecutors insisted that Duke's confession included details that only the killer knew, such as Duke telling investigators that he called Grinchstead's home from a payphone after running away from home to see if she would answer. When she didn't, he returned and found her dad. Investigators also found Duke's DNA on a latex glove found in Grinstead's yard. However, his testimony raised enough doubt in a jury's mind that he was acquitted of all charges except concealing her death. Mo Dukes was subpoenaed to testify but refused to answer the court's questions, citing his Fifth Amendment right against testifying against himself. When the truth about this high-profile case came out, Tara Grinstead's friends and relatives relieved themselves of the burden of obscurity. Her mother confessed that all these years she had secretly hoped for a miracle, that her daughter would return to her alive. Alas, reality turned out to be cruel, senseless, and devoid of any miracles. At least now, the whole world knows exactly what happened in that little town back in 2005. Write your opinion about it and give it a like. Casey Joe's daughter was born on December 21, 1989, in the American town of Pocatello, Idaho. The locals were mostly religious and close-knit, accustomed to a quiet and measured life. As was often the case, none of them could have imagined that something so terrible could happen in the town. Cassie was a cheerful, kind, and responsible girl who never got into trouble. She was an excellent student, listened to her parents in everything she did, and helped her family whenever possible. In September 2006, Casey, who was 16 at the time, agreed to look after her in-law's house. Her uncle Frank and his family were planning to go out of town for the weekend. Someone had to feed and walk the dogs while they were away in case he had no problem agreeing. Even though their house was in the middle of nowhere, her parents weren't afraid to let Cassie go there alone for a few days. She had watched the house many times before in her uncle's absence, and with two Dobermans, it wasn't so scary to be in an empty house. Cassie had gone there on Friday, September 22nd, and was supposed to stay there until Sunday. In the evening, she called her mother and asked permission to call her boyfriend to watch a movie with him. But her mother said no. Then the girl said she would watch the movie alone and go to bed. The next day, Cassie did not contact her parents, but they did not care. The girl was responsible and independent, and what could have happened to her in their quiet little town. But the next day, Sunday, Cassie didn't come home at the appointed time, and that already alarmed her mother. After waiting a while, she got into her car and headed for Frank's house around noon. When she arrived, she saw that her brother and his family had already returned home. Only there was a heartbreaking sight waiting for them. Frank's 13-year-old daughter, who entered the house first, saw Cassie's lifeless body on the floor. Her parents immediately called an ambulance, but the girl had been dead for days. The police arrived at the scene and immediately realized that they were dealing with a murder. Everything pointed to the fact that Cassie had been stabbed repeatedly with a sharp object. Upon examining the crime scene, they noticed several potential leads. One of the basement windows had been broken, and the electrical panel door was ajar. Frank assured investigators that he always kept the fuse box closed, and Cassie was unlikely to go in there since she wasn't an electrician at all. In addition, the back door was unlocked. It was through this door that the perpetrator could have entered the house. The version of a robbery was quickly dismissed as there was nothing of value missing from the house. The perpetrator took neither money nor any belongings. Almost immediately detectives encountered one suspicious moment. Both Dobermans were locked in a room on the second floor. A reasonable question arose. Who had locked them in there and why? According to Frank, his dogs would not obey a stranger and might have attacked him. This indicated that it was unlikely that the perpetrator would have taken the two adult Dobermans to the room and locked them in there. Much more logical was the theory that Casey had locked the dogs herself, except why would you do that? The only possible explanation was that a friend had come over to her house on a Friday night, and she had to lock the Dobermans in her room to keep them from attacking her guests. The situation became more and more complicated. Based on the above, the killer could be someone Cassie knew well and had let into the house. The police, however, did not have to puzzle over this mystery for the next significant clue emerged almost immediately. News of the murder quickly spread throughout the city whose residents had never seen such a crime. Within hours of the discovery of the body, virtually everyone knew about it. While the detectives were working on the crime scene, a woman drove up to the house and said she had valuable information. It turned out to be Cassie's boyfriend, Matt Beckham's mom. 
According to the woman, her son did go to Cassie's house at night to see a movie. The girl hid this fact from her mother because she had forbidden her to have guests. The police questioned Matt and his mother. According to them, his mother called him at about 10 p.m. and demanded that he go home, but Matt refused. He said that something strange was going on in the house. The lights had gone out several times, and a window had broken in an unexplained way. Cassie was frightened by what was happening, so the boy decided to stay with her, but his mother didn't believe the story. At this point, she thought Matt was simply making it all up to stay with Cassie. Then she decided to pick him up herself and drove to the house. Once there, the woman listened to Cassie's account of the oddities in the house, and what was happening no longer seemed fictitious to her. Then she suggested that the girl go away with them, but Cassie refused. For one thing, the electrical trouble and other strange things had already stopped. Second, she felt safe in the company of two Dobermans, deciding that there was really no cause for serious excitement. Matt and his mother left for home at about half past 11. The boy had no idea who might have killed the girl after they left. The detectives were in no hurry to take the young man and his mother at their word. At this point, the odds were not in Matt's favor at all. He was the last person to see the victim alive, and his mother's testimony might have been fabricated to protect her son. On the other hand, there was no evidence against him either. While Matt was under interrogation, medical examiners examined Cassie's body and drew some disturbing conclusions. The girl had been stabbed about 30 times with a sharp object. With a high probability that two different weapons had been used, this suggested that there might have been two assailants. In addition, Cassie had not been assaulted, which made the motive of the killers entirely unclear. All of this led the detectives to believe that Matt might have been the killer. They conceded that there might have been an argument between the couple during which the guy had taken up knives. That would have ruled out two versions at once, robbery and assault with intent to commit violence. Then investigators decided to press the guy and offered him a polygraph interview, and it paid off. Matt suddenly stated that he had actually withheld one detail from the police. According to him, that night, he called two mutual friends from the school where he went with Cassie. The guy's names were Brian Draper and Tori Adamsick. They were friends with Matt and Cassie. And that night, they agreed to come over to their house to watch a movie, except they didn't stay long because they found the movie boring. Shortly after they arrived, they said they would rather go to the local movie theater and left the house. As Matt was driving home with his mother, he called Tori and said he was on his way home. The guy had planned to meet his friends that evening, but they were already sitting in the movie theater. Matt explained to the detectives that he hadn't let his friends in for that very reason. They hadn't been in the house long and couldn't have had any useful information. Nevertheless, this confession closed the dog issue for the police. Cassie had locked them upstairs precisely because of Brian and Tori's arrival. Apparently, the Dobermans were familiar with Matt and were not aggressive towards him, but they reacted negatively to strangers. The police interviewed the guys, and they corroborated Matt's story completely. When they left Cassie's house, they went to the movie theater for a late-night showing, so they had an alibi. Detectives looked into their backgrounds and concluded that the guys most likely had nothing to do with what happened. Both did not have any problems with the law and were in good standing. However, the police still decided to check their alibis and went to the movie theater. To their surprise, the cashier stated that Brian and Tori had not been there that night. The girl who worked at the cashier's desk had gone to school with them and knew them both personally, so she was sure that the boys had not been to the movie theater. This was suspicious, but the detectives were in no hurry to accuse the two friends of murder. They didn't rule out that Brian and Tori had lied to cover up some minor infraction. Perhaps instead of going to the movie theater, they had gone out for a drink or two to spend time in other not-so-legal ways. But the cops couldn't ignore the false alibi either. They began to think of ways to get the guys to tell the truth. At one point, they even planned to start tapping their phones, only to find that it quickly became unnecessary. Detectives and city residents were in for a very unexpected twist. The very next day after Cassie's body was discovered, Tori Adamsek came to the police station with his parents who forced him to tell the detectives a shocking story. Tori claimed that Brian had killed the girl and that he had unwittingly witnessed the crime. According to his story, that night, the boy simply decided to scare Cassie and make a practical joke of their own. Before leaving her uncle's house that night, they discreetly opened the back door. 
Next, Tori and Brian lie that they were headed to the movie theater but instead parked their car across the street, put on plastic masks and dark clothing, and walked back. After entering the house through the back door, they proceeded with their prank. The guys broke a window and started turning the electricity on and off, thereby scaring Cassie and Matt. They hoped that the couple would go down to the basement to check the electrical panel, but that never happened. At about the same time, May Mother arrived at the house and Tori and Brian fell silent. They heard the woman talk Cassie into going with them, then pick up her son and leave. As soon as the girl was left alone in the house, the boy started turning the electricity back on and off. They wanted Cassie to go down to the basement, but she was apparently afraid. Then Tori and Brian went upstairs from the basement and ran into the girl. At this point, according to Tori's story, his friend suddenly pulled out a knife and began stabbing Cassie, turning a harmless prank into a brutal murder. What happened shocked Tori, and he was afraid that Brian might kill him too. They left the crime scene and went to Tori's house where they spent the night. All night long, the boy could not sleep and was afraid that Brian might attack his family. During this story, Tori cried, but the detectives thought what was happening was just a routine play. They knew from the medical examiner's report that two people had struck. So Adam's ex-story made no sense. On the contrary, the detectives were well aware that if Brian had attacked Cassie, Tori had been in on it too, but they were in no hurry to accuse the guy of cheating. In the place of what they decided to play along with him, they needed physical evidence so they reassured Adam's act that he had nothing to fear. It was further explained to the boy that they could only put Brian in jail if Tori showed them where they had hidden the clothes and masks after the murder. This work Tori told them that immediately after what they had done, they drove out of town and buried all the stuff near Black Rock Canyon. The detectives drove him to the spot, and he gave them the exact location of the hiding place. Near where the evidence was buried, the police also noticed ashes from a campfire. Tori explained that he and Brian first wanted to burn the stuff, but it didn't work out. The thing is they had tried to start the fire with hydrogen peroxide and found to their surprise that it didn't ignite. The police dug into the cache and got an unexpected surprise. They hoped they would only get their hands on clothes with traces of blood on them. But under the ground, they found much more useful evidence. The masks, gloves, and other articles of clothing were covered with blood. There were also two knives which the detectives immediately mistook for murder weapons. There was also a partially charred piece of paper on which Adam Sack's handwriting detailed how he and Brian had killed Cassie. All of this might have been enough to arrest both suspects, but above her hold lay perhaps the most gruesome piece of evidence. Investigators discovered a videotape, the contents of which shocked them. Tori and Brian had recorded what they called an appeal to would-be serial killers. In it, the boys revealed that they were planning to kill two of their friends, Cassie and Matt. They outlined their plan and wished good luck to all the other killers. The tape also contained footage from the day of the murder. Tori and Brian did some sort of interview with Cassie and Matt in the school hallway, then once again announced on camera that they were going to kill them. But the creepiest part came next. The next footage was taken after the murders when the guys were driving in the car to get rid of the evidence. They were laughing, shouting, and cheering. Tori and Brian couldn't hide their excitement and were amazed at how easy it was for them to take someone's life. Of course, with such a set of evidence, Adam Zack could no longer pretend to be an innocent victim. It was obvious to the cops that he was directly involved in the murder, and the guy in tears admitted that he had actually stabbed Cassie several times. In the end, both perpetrators were arrested, but the cops had another important discovery waiting for them. They noticed that on the tape, Brian was constantly writing something down in a notebook. The detective searched his room and found it carefully hidden from view. The notebook contained a list of things to buy before the murder, but what followed was something really creepy, a list of 20 names. It turned out that the perpetrators were going to kill 20 people over the next two years, pausing for a month at a time. Among them were friends and teachers, and even relatives of Tori and Brian. The police talked to all the people on the list, and it came as a real shock to them. They all thought they were on good terms with the people who were actually going to kill them. Once under arrest, the guys began to shift the blame onto each other in the hope of avoiding punishment. Despite the fact that both perpetrators were 16 years old, they were tried as adults. The trials began in 2007 and were conducted separately. Then it was revealed that Tori and Brian had been inspired to kill by the cult movie Scream, 
and even tried to imitate the masked maniac. This explained their choice of weapons and attempts to frighten the victim with a blackout. In addition, they idolized serial and mass murderers such as Ted Bundy or the Columbine Rifleman. In other words, their only motive was to kill, and they wanted to turn it all into a show. The boys expected that after all the murders they had committed, they would become legends and make history. In spite of all that, medical experts declared them sane, so they should not have been indulged by the court. On April 17, 2007, Brian Draper was found guilty of murder and conspiracy to commit murder. On June 8, Tory Adams Act was found guilty of the same charges. Both were sentenced to life without parole and 30 years on top of each for conspiracy. Adams Act's family resented such a harsh sentence. They felt that the court should have imposed a more lenient sentence because their son had led the detectives to the evidence. However, the judge was well aware that no credit was due to Tory himself. The boy was just scared and tried to blame it on his buddy, and that does not entitle him to any leniency. In the years that followed, Tory and Brian appealed repeatedly trying to get their sentences reduced, but each time they were turned down. Most likely, the two will never get out of prison again unless the U.S. authorities decide to cut them some slack. What we have in the end, undoubtedly, Tory and Brian are the most real psychopaths, but they were fully aware of what they were doing. They started preparing for the murders long before the attack on Cassie, trying to think through every move. It was partly fortunate for the police that the two maniacs were not brilliantly intelligent. They didn't even think about the fact that their fake alibis could be checked in a few minutes, and that would make them prime suspects right away. Now they continue to serve their sentences in the same prison, only now, they hate each other for their mutual attempts to blame each other. Cassie's family has never been able to return to a normal life after all this horror. Frank's 13-year-old daughter, who first discovered Cassie's body, later tried to end her life. Frank and his family were also forced to move out of the house because no one else could be there. Even though the police department sent an expert to clean up the crime scene, the residents of the house never went in there again, except to get their belongings. Frank had been trying to sell it for years, but couldn't find any buyers. Everyone knew the history of the house and didn't want to live there. For Cass' mother, the only consolation was the fact that the killers had been caught and sent to jail, even though it wouldn't bring her daughter back. Share your opinion on the story in the comments. On June 10, 2006, 24-year-old Lori Slilsinski disappeared without a trace from Auburn, Alabama. This came after confirming that she would be attending a pre-planned girls' night out at her best friend and co-worker's house. At her trailer home, her dog was left unattended, the air conditioner on, and the telephone cord missing. What could explain her mysterious disappearance? Did Lori leave town in a hurry? Or was it something more sinister? Today, we're looking at a bizarre disappearance solved after 16 years, located in Lee County. Auburn is the largest city in eastern Alabama. It's also Alabama's fastest-growing metropolitan area and the 19th fastest-growing metro area in the United States since 1990. Unofficially nicknamed the loveliest village on the plains, Auburn is a melting pot for cultures with its southern hospitality. This historic college town is the home to Auburn University, one of the most recognized public universities in the nation. Today's story involves a former student of this university, Lori Slisinski. Lori Ann Slilsinski was born to parents Casey and Arlene Slilsinski on September 21, 1981. Gifted with blue eyes and blonde hair, Lori was always adored by her parents and her big brother, Paul. The family was originally from New York State but later moved south to the rural Alabama farm country near the town of Auburn when Lori was just 13 years old. As a country girl being raised with animals, Lori was an avid animal lover. According to her friends, Lori was absolutely beautiful. She loved spending time with friends, watching movies, riding her bicycle, and playing video games. In addition to all that fun, she was also very studious, and her family tried to support her as much as they could. After finishing high school, Lori enrolled in nearby Auburn University, where she majored in psychology with a minor in criminology. Her parents bought her a mobile home so that she could live off campus in a manicured trailer park that was popular with students. She was living alone with her beloved dog, Peanut, a Yorkshire Terrier. Her close bond with her family remained intact, with her mother calling every day to check up on her. In 2005, she graduated with honors from Auburn University. 
Soon after graduation, she took up a job in the East Alabama Mental Health Center while still living in the trailer park. She also made plans to go for her master's degree in psychology in the near future. Lori's family was proud of her achievements, unaware of any foreshadowing of evil that was looming over her head. On June 10, 2006, 24-year-old Lori had made plans for a girl's night at her best friend Lindsey Brown's house. They had plans to have a few drinks and watch a movie. Lori first met Lindsay in their junior year at Auburn University, already impressed by Lori's sweet, charming, and outgoing personality. The two girls became friends. The bond only grew stronger when they both got a job at the same mental health facility after completing graduation. Around 6.30 p.m. on June 10th, Lori called Lindsay saying that she had to stop at the store, and then she'd head over to her house for the movie night. Unfortunately, she would never make it there. Lindsay grew worried when she did not hear from Lori again that night or the following day. She called Lori several times and left messages on her home answering machine, but she never heard back from her. When Lori did not show up at her workplace on Monday, June 12th, Lindsay's concern skyrocketed. It was very unusual for Lori to miss work and not inform anyone. After another no-show at work on the following Tuesday, June 13th, Lindsay, along with another co-worker, went to Lori's house to check on her. When they reached the trailer home, Lindsay could not find Lori anywhere. Upon entering, she found the door unlocked and the air conditioning on, which was pretty surprising. She also observed that Lori's dog, Peanut, was inside his crate. He looked well-nourished and happy, as if someone was taking care of him. Amazingly, his crate was unsoiled, even though Lori had been missing for several days at that point. Lindsay felt that something was amiss as it was unlike Lori to leave her beloved pet alone and unattended. Lindsay remembered that Lori had placed three rugs on her kitchen floor as the dog refused to walk on the tile. These rugs were missing, along with the outside trash can when Lindsay entered. Later that same day, June 13, 2006, Lori's mother, Arlene, got a call from her workplace regarding Lori missing work two days in a row. Arlene immediately tried to call her but could not get a hold of her. Afraid for her daughter's well-being, Arlene immediately left for Auburn after her husband Casey informed her of their daughter's disappearance. Upon arrival, she entered Lori's trailer and found a disturbing scene. She noticed the door was slightly ajar, and her bed was perfectly made, but there was no sign of Lori. Her car was also missing. With a closer look, she noticed Lori's kitchen rugs, a pillow from her couch, a Galileo thermometer, a green trash can that Lori put a rake and shovel in, and the phone cord for her landline were all gone. Alarm bells rang as Arlene instantly realized something was horribly wrong. She officially reported her daughter missing, while still hoping that she would show up eventually. As the initial investigation was launched, and police scanned through Lori's trailer home, they could not find any significant evidence that could link a possible suspect. However, they noticed there were obvious signs of struggle and scuff marks on the wall. There was semen discovered on Lori's bedsheet, and traces of blood were also found on the doorknob. A coat hanger and a single golden hoop earring were also found at the scene. Police would soon recover surveillance footage on June 10, 2006, showing Lori stopping at an Alabama Walmart. That was the last known sighting of Lori, and nobody had any clue what happened to her after that. A tip would, however, soon come in later that afternoon. Arlene got a phone call from one of Lori's friends, 25-year-old Daryl Richard Dennis, commonly referred to as Rick. Rick told Arlene that he met Lori the day she went missing, and he thought she might have gone off to make a drug deal. Lori had met Rick Dennis at a bowling alley where he worked. She often hung out there when she was still a student. Arlene knew him because Lori invited him to spend Christmas with Lori's family in 2005. Lori felt bad for not having a family of his own. However, Arlene could not believe what Dennis was claiming despite her daughter's close friendship with him. She did not believe that Lori would ever be involved in drug dealing. She thought that he was simply lying through his teeth but didn't have any clue as to why. On June 14, 2006, for days after Lori's disappearance at approximately 4.40 a.m., her car was found fully ablaze on an impasse near the bowling alley where Rick had previously been employed. From that point on, the investigation shifted from a missing persons case to a possible homicide. According to investigators, the fire destroyed any traces of evidence that would have possibly been found inside the car. 
However, Lori was not inside the vehicle at the time it was burnt. A hand-rolled cigarette was on the ground near the car, and a gas can was also found close by in the woods. This horrified Lori's family, and they were almost certain now that something very bad had happened to her. Investigating the information Innes provided to Arlene was their only clue at the time. When Innes was brought in for questioning, he repeated the same story he told Arlene, only adding more details this time. He claimed that he and Lori grew marijuana together, suggesting she might have gone off to sell her share of the weed they grew. He also added that Lori could have been dealing with shady people. Police raided Lori's trailer. However, even after a thorough search, the police were unable to find any evidence of Lori dealing drugs. During the interview, investigators also took note of several scratches on Rick's hands and arms, which he claimed came from his dog. More concerning things came to light when investigators talked to Lindsay. According to Lindsay's account, she had heard Rick Innes speaking in the background when she and Lori last spoke on the phone the day she vanished. Since Innes was known to be a friend of Lori, Lindsay did not think much of it at the time. Lindsay claimed that when she texted Rick inquiring about Lori's whereabouts, he said that she was fine when he left her. Lindsay also informed the investigators that before her disappearance, Lori had told her that Rick had written a love letter to her, feelings that were not reciprocated. Lori had mentioned she was not romantically attracted to Rick and was planning to discuss it with him. Investigators found out that Innes told her friends about his letter and Lori's rejection. When police re-interviewed him, confronting him with the new information collected from Lindsay, he admitted meeting her hours before her disappearance but insisted that Lori was fine and was preparing to go to the store when he left her house. However, Investigators discovered several inconsistencies in his statement. They began focusing on Rick Innes as their prime suspect. Their suspicion only grew stronger after searching his car, finding several items of interest, including a knife, cleaning supplies, and handcuffs. To gather more evidence, investigators delved into his past, uncovering a shockingly dark history. Innes had murdered his mother and stepfather when he was only 12 years old. On March 3, 1993, just 10 months after their marriage, Ennis beat his mother to death with a baseball bat after shooting her in the face in their trailer in North Montgomery, Alabama. He similarly murdered his stepfather with a shotgun. After the murders, he revealed his plans to kill his stepsisters, which shocked investigators. Although his past murders were gruesome, due to his age at the time, he could not be tried as an adult. He spent nine years in jail for the double murder. After his release, he moved to Auburn, where he met Lori. Following Lori's disappearance, Ennis became the prime suspect, but without direct evidence or Lori's body, charging him for her murder was impossible. Ennis left Auburn, moving elsewhere and eventually settling in Huntsville, Alabama in 2007. By then, Lori's case had gone cold. Even after moving to Huntsville, Ennis remained the prime suspect. Investigators reopened Lori's case in 2016, and Agent Mark Whitaker of the Alabama State Bureau of Investigation, along with his team, started reinvestigating. Innes remained their main suspect, given his past, but without more evidence or a body, proving his guilt was challenging. In a surprising turn, Agent J.W. Barnes discovered a crucial piece of evidence while reviewing the case files. He discovered a report in an envelope that had not been opened for 10 years. After Lori's disappearance in 2006, police collected evidence from the trailer, but no one followed up with it until the results came in. The results showed that semen found on Lori's bed sheet and blood on the interior side of the front door contained Rick Innes' DNA. After organizing all the evidence, investigators built a strong case against Rick Innes and were eventually able to get an indictment order in 2018. By this time, Ennis was happily engaged to a school librarian named Elena Atkinson and was living in Pilot, Virginia. There, he was working for a company that designed and built portable living structures called EARS. On August 6, 2018, on his 38th birthday, 12 years after Lori Slasinski went missing from Auburn, Rick Ennis was arrested by a task force of U.S. Marshals. While it came as a relief to Lori's family, Ennis's fiancé and co-workers were shocked by this turn of events. After being arrested on two counts of capital murder, his trial was postponed due to COVID-19. The trial finally began on April 1, 2022. While the prosecution presented all the evidence that suggested Ennis's involvement in the crime, 
including the cigarette, but in Lori's bedsheet containing his DNA. The defense argued that police could have taken the cigarette from Innes' home and planted it at the crime scene. They also attacked Lisinski's character by trying to portray her as a drug dealer. To explain how his DNA got on the bedsheet, Rick claimed that he had consensual sex with Lori before her disappearance, suggesting that they were still intimate despite Lori's rejection of his advances. However, his story did not seem very convincing, especially when two more witnesses came forward with jaw-dropping information. One of his former co-workers in Alabama, Jeremy Brooks, stated that on June 9, 2006, just one day prior to Lori's mysterious disappearance, he received a call from Ennis asking if he could bring him gas and if he could keep the gas tank. Jeremy rejected his request. Later after police found Lori's scorched car and a gas can, it matched the description of a gas can that was missing from the bowling alley where Ennis worked. Another of his former co-workers from South Carolina, Terry Booth, testified about the chilling experience she had with Ennis years prior. Terry remembered asking Ennis why he moved from Auburn. Ennis told him that he had to get rid of a body. Although he thought Ennis was just joking with him, the announcement of his arrest for Lori's murder proved otherwise. Although Rick Annis continued to deny all allegations against him and maintained his innocence, jurors came up with a guilty verdict after two days of deliberation. He was facing the death penalty for the crime, but the DA agreed to take the death penalty off the table after consulting with Arlene. Arlene later said that she felt agreeing to a life without parole sentence for Rick Ennis would save her from years of potential appeal hearings, but would also ensure that Ennis would never be free. On April 14, 2022, he was sentenced to life without parole. He remains incarcerated in William E. Donaldson Correctional Facility in Bessemer, Alabama. For Arlene Slasinski, the outcome was bittersweet. With tears in her eyes, she shared that it meant she had to finally accept that Lori was never coming home, an incredible hope that a portion of her heart always clung to. Let us know in the comments section what your thoughts are on this tragic case. Do you think Rick Ennis will ever give up the location of Lori's remains? On July 31, 1999, 17-year-old high school seniors and best friends, J.B. Beasley and Tracy Hallett, began their journey from their hometown of Dothan, Alabama. They were headed towards a birthday party for J.B. in Headland, Alabama, but the girls ended up getting lost along the way. In a phone call to her mother from Ozark around 11.30 p.m., Tracy informed her mom that they were heading back home. However, neither girl would ever make it home. Their lifeless bodies would be found the next day in the trunk of their car, raising the long-debated question of what might have happened to them. Did it have something to do with the party? Or did the girls run into trouble on the road heading back from Ozark, located in southeast Alabama near the Florida border? Ozark is known as the home of Rucker situated in the heart of Dale County. It's a typical charming southern town, home to nearly 15,000 people. It's a nice place for both raising a family and spending retirement years. However, the town was not the sort of place to hit the headlines until the gruesome double homicide of two high school seniors in 1999 which baffled the community for years to come. J.B. Hilton Green Beasley was born on July 31, 1981, to parents Cheryl and Hilton Lanier Beasley in Troy, Alabama. After her parents separated, she moved to Dothan with her mother in 1984. She was adored by her mother as well as her stepfather, Joey Begun, whom her mother married after a few years. She grew up in a nice home in Dothan, along with her four sisters. JB grew up to be a very outgoing girl who was involved in various activities, including cheerleading, dance, piano, and swimming. She even modeled for several agencies along with her sisters. Besides all of her hobbies, she loved hanging out with her friends and family. It was high school when JB met fellow cheerleader Tracy Hallett, and the two did not take long to become best friends. Tracy Jean Hallett was born on March 3, 1982 to parents Carolyn and Robert Hallett. Unfortunately, her father, who worked in the Dothan Police Department, died when Tracy was only five years old. Her mother later remarried a man named Mike Roberts, who helped raise Tracy along with her mother. Unlike JB, Tracy was a bit shy but never hesitated to put people before herself. She was also very protective over her two brothers, who were much younger than her. Even at a young age, she was a responsible older sister. Tracy also attended Northview High School and regularly received good grades and was a cheerleader alongside JB. 
As both girls were blossoming into their adulthood, JB and Tracy were oblivious to their dreadful fate which would strip them of all their future hopes and dreams. On July 31, 1999, at around 10.05 p.m., JB and Tracy left Dothan in JB's black 1993 Mazda 929 to attend a birthday party organized in JB's honor in Headland just a few miles north. However, the young girls, being unfamiliar with the roads leading to their destination, soon found themselves in trouble. Within a few minutes of starting their journey from their hometown, they got lost. Around 10.30 p.m., JB and Tracy stopped at BP Gas Day near the intersection of Routes 173 and 431 in Headland in search of directions. Using a payphone at that gas station, they called their friends to get better directions to the party. After the call, the girls kept driving to reach their destination but instead ended up in Ozark, Alabama, about 24 miles northwest of Headland, realizing they still did not understand the directions to the party. At 11.30 p.m., the girls stopped at the Big Little store. Although the store was already closed by then, Tracy called her mother from the store's payphone. She informed her of how they got lost and ended up in Ozark and that they were now planning to come back home. At the same time, a woman named Marilyn Marin and her daughters stopped at the gas station to buy a soda. The girls then asked her for directions back to Dothan. Marilyn tried to explain the way as well as she could, and the young girls seemed to understand. Marilyn would later say that she noticed that the girls looked nice and polite with a clean and tidy car. Marilyn remembered seeing the girls pulling out of the parking lot and turning right just as Marilyn had directed. Although nothing seemed amiss at the time, J.B. Beasley and Tracy Hollett never made it home. The following morning, August 1, 1999, at around 8 a.m., Tracy's mother called the police to report her daughter missing. It did not take police long to find their first clue regarding the girl's whereabouts. Later that day after Tracy was reported missing, cops successfully located JB's car, which had been parked on Herring Avenue in Ozark. The most bizarre thing was despite having filled the gas tank the day before, the tank was almost empty. The car was muddy, the driver's side window was partially down, yet the doors were locked. However, police could not find any signs of a forced entry into the vehicle. Inside the car, JB's driver's license was lying on the dash. The purses of both girls were still inside the car, along with their cash. The only known missing item was JB's car keys. However, there was no sign of either of the girls. A pump was recovered from the trunk lid of the locked trunk, which gave the police a foreboding feeling that something was horribly wrong. Assessing the scene, cops theorized that the locked trunk could provide them with significant clues. But without the keys, they could not open the trunk. It took them six long hours to discover that they could open the trunk of the car with the help of an interior latch without needing a trunk key or a locksmith. Upon opening the trunk, police made a grisly discovery. The lifeless bodies of the two girls were stuffed inside. Both girls were fully clothed, but their pants were soiled from the waist down. Both girls had been shot once in the head, Tracy in the temple, and JB in the right cheek. Tracy had a 9mm shell casing on her leg, scratches on her arm, and her jeans had thorn briars on them. JB's clothes, on the other hand, were muddy and dirty, especially her newly purchased shoes. Although authorities concluded that the teenagers were killed execution style, they had most likely been killed inside the trunk. As the families were informed about the heart-wrenching discovery, authorities formally started their homicide investigation. Although investigators were considering robbery as a possible motive during the initial phase of the investigation, it was quickly ruled out after confirming that not only the girls' purses but also their jewelry, money, and credit cards remained inside the car. Autopsies later confirmed that there were no traces of alcohol or drugs in their system. The report also suggested that neither girl had been sexually assaulted prior to their demise. This basically ruled out the possibility of the crime being sexually motivated. However, more than two months later, the state crime lab issued a report indicating that there were traces of unknown semen on JB's bra, panties, and skin. The palm print recovered from the lid of the trunk also remained unidentified. With no matches in the system and number one to compare their evidence against, authorities were left without much to go on. As word of a double murder of two teen girls spread like wildfire, authorities were no closer to zeroing in on a suspect. 
A reward was also put out in an attempt to gather information regarding the murder, but it did not uncover any new leads. However, authorities seemed to soon get an unexpected breakthrough. On September 1st, exactly one month after the bodies of JB and Tracy were found, a longtime Ozark resident, 28-year-old Johnny William Barentine, walked into the Ozark Police Department to tell a bizarre story. He claimed that he had been a witness to the high-profile double homicide of the Dothan teenagers. Barentine told police that on the night of the murders, around the same time Tracy Hollett called her mother from the payphone at the Big Little store, he went out to buy milk for his two-year-old son. He claimed that while he was out, he had witnessed the horrendous act. He returned home at 1 a.m., visibly upset, and told his wife that he'd been hit by a black truck near Herring Road. In the days following JB and Tracy's murder, when he shared the information with some of his friends, they convinced him that he should go to the police with this information as it could be linked to the murders of Tracy JB, which would not only help police crack the case, but could also get him the reward as well. Disturbingly, in the four hours of interview with Ozark police, Barentine changed his story six times. According to then Ozark police chief, Tony R. Spivey, Barentine initially said that on the night of the kill, he had seen a black truck speeding away from the area where the girls were found. But as the interview continued, his story kept evolving and changing. Finally, he claimed that he'd picked up a tattooed man he didn't know, and the two drove by the Big Little store. He further claimed that the man, to whom he'd given a ride, got into the car with two girls, whom Barentine identified as the deceased Dothan teenagers. He said they ended up on Herring Avenue, where the man forced the girls out of the car. A struggle occurred between the men and the girls as they were trying to get away. After placing them in the trunk, Barentine said he saw something in that man's hand moments before hearing two gunshots. And when the man returned, Barentine again gave him a ride from the scene and then went home. In another version, Barentine confessed to investigators that he knew the man he'd picked up and given a ride to and identified him to be his neighbor. Alarmingly, Barentine himself lived less than a mile from where police discovered the bodies. Police did not buy his story, naming him the prime suspect in the murder of J.B. Beasley and Tracy Hallett. Ozark police arrested Johnny Barentine on the spot, charging him with two counts of capital murder. But there were several problems with his accounts. Barentine never mentioned sexual activity that would account for the semen on J.B.'s clothing and body. Besides, the neighbor he implicated had an alibi for the evening. Several people noted that he looked startled and like he had just awoken from a deep sleep in his mugshot. Just after arrest, Barentine immediately admitted that he had fabricated the whole story in order to collect the reward money. However, police at the time believed they arrested the right person. In the preliminary hearing on September 20th, Alabama Bureau of Investigation agent Charles Huggins testified that Barentine was able to describe the girl's clothing and other items consistent with the crime, suggesting he was there at the scene. From the time of his arrest, Barentine was held without bond in the Dale County Jail in Ozark. In an October 18th bond hearing, Barentine denied he was involved in the killings, confessing to the judge that he never picked up a tattooed man and didn't see anything the night of the murders. He said that he simply went to the BP at about 11 p.m. to get milk for his little boy and later fabricated the whole story to claim the reward money. However, he was denied the bond and sent back to jail. Even during this turbulent time, Barentine's family members never stopped supporting him. They even gave interviews to the media, professing his innocence, saying he was incapable of hurting anyone. Barentine's lawyer, Bill Kimmons, also maintained that his client was not responsible for the double murders in any way, shape, or form. He further stated that the four hours of continued interrogation took a toll on Barentine, who had wrapped himself in this massive ally. During police questioning, he was never told that he could go to the bathroom or was free to leave whenever he wanted. Barentine's defense also pointed out the fact that Barentine only finished the seventh grade and a portion of the eighth grade. He said his client was in special education classes, indicating his inability to plan this heinous crime. Barentine was finally released from jail on December 17, 1999, after it was revealed that Barentine's DNA did not match that from the semen found on JB's body and clothing. In January 2000, a Dale County grand jury declined to indict Barentine and cleared him as a suspect in this double murder. 
After Johnny Barentine was cleared of suspicion, the investigation endured a setback. The methods employed by investigators were also criticized. There began to be mutterings that the Ozark police were incapable of handling the case. However, police still had some potential suspects on the radar. One of the most viable suspects was a man from Michigan who was at a party the night of the murders near where JB's car was later found. Investigators discovered that the man, who was not publicly named, left town within days of the murders. Investigators had even traveled to Michigan three times to interview him. He could not account for three or four hours of time on the night of the murders and later made some suspicious statements to people. However, the police declined to elaborate on these alleged statements. As it turned out, he was also later ruled out by DNA. Another significant lead police were chasing during the initial phase of the investigation was the driver of a small white pickup truck. A video surveillance camera inside the Big Little store caught a grainy pork image of what appeared to be a small white pickup truck at the gas pumps at the same time JB and Tracy were at the payphone calling Tracy's mother. No digital trail could be traced, though, as there was no record of a gas purchase at the pump at that time. The video neither showed anyone getting out of the truck nor did it show the driver clearly. After releasing a photo of the truck to the media a month into the investigation, police urged the public to come forward with information. Unfortunately, both the driver and the truck vanished into thin air as the lead faded away. The last lead for the investigators was a man from Mississippi. Police said the man, who was extradited from Jones County, had been arrested there on an outstanding warrant for possession of drug paraphernalia issued in Ozark. The man had been staying with relatives in Ozark, but left two days after the murders. According to Spivey, investigators wanted to question a min connection with the case. However, no significant information came out in light of this lead. Without any evidence, investigators were forced to let him go. In March of 2000, a woman called police and said she heard screams and two gunshots near Highway 123 South just inside the city limits on the night of July 31, 1999. When asked why she did not come forward earlier, she claimed she was scared to get involved. Based on her description, police thoroughly searched the area and discovered a 9mm bullet, the same type used to kill the girls, but the brand name of the bullet did not match the brand of bullet shell casing found on Tracy's body. Furthermore, the unspent bullet had no markings that would help with forensic comparison to other evidence in the case. Again, another dead end for investigators. Although several leads over the years proved to lead nowhere, investigators never lost hope in the search for a DNA match. As the heartbroken families of JB and Tracy tried to get on with their lives, the case turned cold. Then years later, another twist in the case added another layer to the thrilling mystery. After remaining cold for years, 2015 would mark a bombshell allegation in the murder case of J.B. Beasley and Tracy Hallett. Rena Crum, a sworn Ozark Auxiliary police officer, came forward and openly accused an Ozark police officer of murdering J.B. Beasley and Tracy Hallett and others of covering it up. Rena alleged that on the night of July 31, 1999, a police officer for Ozark police pulled over Beasley demanding to know the whereabouts of some cassette tapes that contained recorded conversations. According to Rena, these tapes could have incriminated Ozark police officers regarding the illegal business of cocaine distribution and profits. The incident escalated into the murders of two innocent teens, she further alleged. Rena claimed that she'd been threatened by multiple law enforcement officials who had knowledge of the murderer's identity and covered it up by getting rid of evidence. Rena named three cops. Gary Butch Whittington, Rex Tipton, and Eddie Henderson, accusing them of harassing and threatening her. She went as far as to say that then-police chief Tony Spivey, who handled the original investigation, had also helped cover it up. However, she shied away from revealing the name of the police officer who she claimed had actually committed the murders. Renowned American journalist and newspaper editor John B., Carroll wrote an article saying that he believed the officer in question presumed the two girls intended to use tapes in a court case that was scheduled for August 2, 1999, less than 48 hours after they were murdered. The tapes were to be entered as evidence into that case. In this article, Carroll also stated that Rena was severely beaten with a fall bat after coming forward, which stopped her from naming the actual killer. 
Law enforcement officials Rena accused had all denied having any involvement in the murders of J.B. Beasley and Tracy Hallett. Without any physical evidence, none of them were ever formally named as suspects in the case. Regardless of that, the allegations blew up on numerous true crime websites and social media, leading to a defamation lawsuit. On January 29, 2016, Keith Kaufman, Rex Tipton, Tony Spivey, Eddie Henderson, and Gary Butch Whittington, all Ozark, Alabama police officials, filed a lawsuit against Rena Crum, John B., Carroll, and Dean Matthews for libel, slander, and defamation of character. That case was dismissed in 2018. In May 2016, Rena Crum received a suspended sentence and a $250 fine after being convicted for harassing J.B. Beasley's sister. Over the years, authorities investigated many theories. They interviewed hundreds of people and took DNA samples from several suspects, but to no avail. It would take 20 years in the innovation of new DNA technologies before police could apprehend a suspect. In March 2019, investigators sent the DNA found on JB's body and clothes to the Virginia-based Parabon Nanolab, which specializes in DNA phenotyping and genetics using public genealogy databases. After analyzing the DNA, the lab finally made a connection to a suspect, Colleen McCraney. 45-year-old Coley Lewis McCraney was never on the radar of investigators in the brutal 1999 murders of J.B. Beasley and Tracy Hallett until DNA implicated them in the crime. McCraney, who's an Alabama native, graduated from Carroll High School in Ozark in 1992, where he was an athlete as well as the president of the library club. After that, he joined the U.S. Air Force and served there from 1993 to 1997. He was married in 1992 but separated from his first wife in 1994 and later divorced. According to the reports of Dothan Eagle at the time, McCraney's ex-wife filed a complaint with the Air Force in 1994, stating that McCraney had assaulted her. McCraney remarried in 2001 and had children with a second wife. Other than failing to pay child support in 1990, McCraney had no criminal record in the past 20 years or so. He'd been working as a trucker all of his life and had worked for several trucking companies in Alabama over the years. In recent years, he co-founded a church and worked as a bishop there. At the time of the killings, he was around 26 and living on Listenby Drive in Ozark, about one mile away from where the bodies of J.B. Beasley and Tracy Hallett were found in 1999. Two decades after the slain high school seniors J.B. Beasley and Tracy Hallett were found, Coley McCraney was arrested after a traffic stop in Daleville, Alabama on March 19, 2019. In the interview with police after he was taken into custody, McCraney said he did not know the investigators did not clarify any motive for the murder. The news of his arrest was a great shock to the Ozark community and the Ozark police chief, Marlon Walker, who went to school with McCraney. As it seemed that the many twisted strands in this baffling case were finally all being tied together, there was to be one more revelation. The now 53-year-old Rena Crum, who previously accused the Ozark Place Department of covering up the murder, recanted her allegations as she testified during a hearing for McCraney in August 2022. McCraney, now 49, is facing five counts of capital murder charges for the shooting deaths of J.B. Beasley and Tracy Hallett. He now sits behind bars in Dale County Jail as of the time of arrest. His bond has been denied pending his trial on April 17, 2023. The news of finally apprehending the killer was a relief to the families of both girls. However, reliving all the haunting memories through the trial and hearings is another painful journey still to come. We can only hope that the families can heal through a sense of peace that their daughters are finally getting justice more than two decades later. Do you believe McCraney is responsible for the murders? If so, what was the motive? Do you find any validity in the police cover-up claims? Let us know what your thoughts are in the comments section below. On November 24, 1989, Central Washington University student, 18-year-old Mandy Static, suddenly went missing after taking a jog through her neighborhood. Her body was discovered by a search team three days later in a nearby river. So what exactly happened to Mandy? Did she drown while taking a swim? Or did something much more sinister happen to her? Today's case will take us to Acme, a town in Whatcom County, Washington, United States. 
It's located in the South Four Valley between the Northern Cascade Mountains and Lake Whatcom. The town is locally known as a scenic area and contains several camping opportunities along Lake Whatcom. Many people who live in the place choose it because of its good reputation, as well as its close-knit proximity to several parks and recreational areas. Mandy was born on the 16th of April 1971 to Glenn and Mary Static. She was not an only child but had three siblings by the names of Brent, Lee, and Molly. In 1974, Glenn and Mary's marriage came crashing down, and they went their separate ways. Brent, who was Mandy's older brother, died the following year at the age of 17 during a hunting trip in Alaska. Following this, Mary relocated from Palmer, Alaska, to Acme with her three children, and they began a new life there. Mandy was in the seventh grade around this time. She soon got used to her new environment and also became a popular face around the neighborhood. She was full of life, and it was just impossible not to love her. At school in her new environment, Mandy excelled, not only in academics but also in other extracurricular activities. She was a member of the school band, and she could play the flute, clarinet, and saxophone. She also had a love for athletics, which made her join the basketball team. Her passion for sports did not stop there as she could also play softball and ride on horseback. She wanted to do everything, wanted to be very good at everything she did, and she was. She was a high achiever, said Mandy's mother. She wanted to do well in everything she did. She had it all going for her. She had a bright future ahead of her. The house where Mandy lived with her mother and siblings was located on Strand Road and was about a mile from the highway. About five miles from the house was a river, popularly referred to as Nooksack River by the locals. Mandy was in the habit of jogging around her neighborhood. She'd often start from her house and run westbound toward the west side of the Strand Road and down to the Nooksack River. It was her favorite route, and her mother, Mary, and the family German shepherd named Kyra joined her occasionally on a run. However, Mary usually rode a bike instead of jogging alongside her daughter. By the time Mandy graduated from Mount Baker High School, she was conversant in sign language. To top it off, she graduated as an honors student, and her mother's joy knew no bounds. Mandy had big dreams and hoped one day to become a commercial pilot. With this burning desire, she went to Central Washington University at the age of 18, believing that in a few years, she would have obtained her commercial pilot's license. However, after only a few months of experiencing university life, she realized that being a commercial airline pilot was not something she was passionate about. She just couldn't see herself sitting for long hours in front of the flight instrument panel of an aircraft. Due to this, she decided to choose a different career path. At her new school, she met Yoko, a Japanese girl who was also pursuing a degree at the university. The two were roommates and quickly became great friends. From Yoko, Mandy learned the rudiments of the Japanese language, and in no time, she was speaking it fairly fluently. Mandy was also in a relationship with a guy named Rick Cinder. It was an affair that her family and friends were well aware of. In November 1989, Central Washington University observed Thanksgiving, and students were allowed to go home to spend time with their families and loved ones. Mandy said goodbye to her friends at school and traveled down to Acme to be with her family. Yoko also went along with her. When the two arrived there, everyone was happy to see them. It was a full house as some relatives were also around for the holiday. Mandy quickly went around to introduce her Japanese friend, and in no time, Yoko was feeling like she'd been part of the family for a long time. The atmosphere around the house was generally lively, and no one had any idea that a terrible disaster was close by. The present was what they were all focused on, and they went about eating and drinking with no worry for the future. The following day, which was November 24th, Mandy and Yoko got out of the house and took a walk around the neighborhood. She used the opportunity to show her sighted friends some points of interest. When they got back to the house, they settled down to a tasty meal. Around 2 p.m., Mandy announced that she was going out for a jog. Mary could not join her because she was busy attending to the relatives that were around, and Yoko also decided to stay indoors and busy herself with something else. Mandy changed into a light-colored sweatshirt and teal green sweatpants. On her feet, she wore light blue running shoes that had purple stripes. She also grabbed her Walkman so she could listen to music while out jogging. At around 2.30 p.m., she left the house and Kyra, the German shepherd, followed at her heels. 
That was the last time she would be seen alive by her mother. Two hours went by, and neither Mandy nor the dog returned. Mary began to slightly worry. She knew her daughter was someone who kept a routine, and so she should have been back from her jog. It was very unusual. I was panicked. Mandy was so consistent in what she always did. There was no reason for her not to come back, Mary said. While Mary was still trying to figure out what might be wrong, Kyra bounded into the house with her tail tucked between her legs. Mary looked around for Mandy, but realized that the dog had returned alone. She immediately dialed Rick's number, feeling Mandy might have stopped by her boyfriend's place before finally coming home. However, when Rick picked up, it wasn't the word she was expecting. He told her that he hadn't seen Mandy, and she knew immediately that something was terribly wrong. After getting off the phone with Rick, she called the sheriff and informed him about what had happened. She also reached out to as many people as she could think of to notify them about Mandy's disappearance. In no time, a majority of the community, as well as police officers, were out searching for her. People came forward, giving accounts of seeing her jogging around in the afternoon of that day. Lee, my son, he was at the Anderson's house, which is about halfway between my house and Highway 9 down Strand Road, Mary said. He was there visiting his friend, Jeremy. He remembered seeing her jog by coming home, she added. The search for Mandy that day proved futile, and she did not return home. The following day, the search intensified, and Detective Ron Peterson led a team of officers to comb through the woods in various places around the neighborhood, especially along the trail where she was known to jog but there was no sign of her anywhere. Two days after Mandy vanished without a trace, a team assigned to search for her came across something odd. They were checking the side of the road when one of them saw a pair of green sweatpants. Mary was called to the scene to identify if the clothing items were Mandy's. I didn't remember exactly what she was wearing, but I didn't think they could have been. For one thing, they were dirty, and they had ripped holes in them. And Mandy wouldn't have ever worn anything like that, Mary said. Due to Mary's uncertainty, the pants were collected and sent to the laboratory for analysis to determine if they were Mandy's, but the results returned nothing that could be of help. November 27, 1989, marked three days since Mandy went missing. Her family was devastated about not knowing what had become of her, but they remained hopeful that she would be found alive. The hope was that they'd find her alive, Mandy's older sister Molly said. We just prayed that they would find her alive. You think to yourself, God, maybe she's just hurt. She can't get home, she added. Officers decided to look at the surrounding water bodies and, with the help of a neighboring district fire department's boat, they began their search of the Nooksack River. Detective Ron led the team. We came around the corner and we got out of the main river and then into a little side channel and I could see pink. Something pink, Detective Ron said. The object they saw was stuck in some river debris and when they got close enough, they realized it was the body of the woman they'd been looking for. She was not wearing anything except for the striped running shoes she'd worn out to jog several days earlier. The search team stopped the boat, and Detective Ron retrieved Mandy's body from the knee-deep water. Afterwards, it was placed in a body bag and taken away for an autopsy. Mandy's family were informed about the discovery and the state in which her body had been found. They were shattered by the news. It was all too much to take in. I remember running out of the house. I ran off into the field, and I just remember screaming, screaming at life at God. How could something like this happen? Molly said. When news of Mandy's death spread, the community was thrown into commotion. The fact that a murder had been committed in a usually peaceful and instant-free place was unsettling, and residents began to eye each other suspiciously. Detectives immediately began an investigation to understand what had happened to Mandy. The state of undress in which she'd been found made detectives strongly suspect foul play. However, there was no way to tell this for sure since the area she'd been found in was undisturbed, and there was no obvious sign of struggle. There were scratches on Mandy's arms and legs, and detectives believed she must have gotten them while running through thorns. She also had an obvious injury at the back of her head. The autopsy conducted the following day after the body was recovered revealed that she had died by drowning. Detectives were puzzled by this because the part of the river where her body was found was shallow, so it seemed highly impossible that it had been an accidental drowning. There was also evidence to suggest that she'd been sexually abused, leading detectives to conclude they had a homicide case on their hands. They speculated that whoever killed Mandy had abducted her using a weapon, 
then sexually assaulted her. After trying to flee, the assailant caught up with her, striking the back of her head with an object and ultimately drowning her in the river. The first person suspected was Rick. He was questioned immediately, but detectives found nothing tying him to Mandy's death and he was cleared. To shed more light on the situation, Detective Ron, trained in DNA recovery, collected evidence from Mandy's body and sent it to the FBI for testing. An unknown male's DNA profile was established, but no match was found in the database. The investigation intensified, following up on tips and analyzing the DNA of about 30 men in Acme, but no leads surfaced. On December 4, 1989, a memorial service was held for Mandy at her former high school, attended by about a thousand students paying their respects. Mary, in pain, spoke during the service about Mandy's survivor attitude and the challenge to learn and grow from tragedies. It hadn't been easy. But on the other hand, I have made some friends. Since there was not much to go on, the case went cold. Years went by, and Mandy's killer remained a mystery. In 2009, the case was assigned to Detective Kevin Both. He got to work and began taking a close look at the available evidence. I started going through who's been interviewed, who's been talked to, Detective Kevin said. He found out about a drug dealer named John Wozniowski, who had been questioned in the past about the murder. At the time, John claimed to know who killed Mandy, but upon questioning, police were unable to extract any meaningful information from him. John's DNA did not match the DNA recovered from Mandy's body, so he was ruled out as a potential suspect. Detective Kevin decided to once again interrogate him and see what he could get out of him. He traveled to Cambodia, where John had moved, but ultimately, nothing came out of it. The case would remain stagnant until the unexpected happened three years later. One day in June 2013, two unrelated women, Mary Lee Anderson and Heather Backstrom, who lived near Bellingham, a city about 35 minutes drive from Acme, decided to take their kids to the local park. While their children played a short distance away, the two women sat with a group of other mothers and began chatting about their families and life in general. The conversation centered on the unsolved murder of Mandy that had taken place several years earlier. Suddenly, Heather said she knew who the killer was. With surprise written all over her face, Mary Lee also said she knew who it was. At that point, the two women barely knew each other, although they had both attended Mount Baker High School as teenagers. As it turned out, the two women had suspicions about the same man, Timothy Bass. Intrigued by the fact that they were both talking about the same individual, the two exchanged stories of their past encounters with Timothy. According to the story Mary Lee shared, Timothy was a friend of her husband, and one night while she was home alone with her child, he had stopped by from a hunting trip to use the house phone. After attempting to dial a number, which did not go through, he walked over to the bedroom where she was. There, he told her that he wanted to make love to her. Mary Lee was shocked by the audacity and threatened to call the police on him. He persisted with his talks, but in the end, she managed to get him out of the house. Heather's experience with Timothy, on the other hand, happened when she was 15. It was after a softball game in the summer of 1989, a few months before Mandy's murder, Heather said. We decided a bunch of us to go to Dairy Queen, she added. She had been sitting in the front seat of a truck driven by a guy named Dan. Sitting beside her was Timothy, and during the journey, he began to aggressively flirt with her. He would talk about her eyes, saying they were beautiful. Then he took a pin out from a cup holder and started rubbing it along her knees because she was wearing cut-off sweatpants. Timothy did not go too far with this act, probably due to the presence of Dan. However, since that day, the memory stuck with Heather, and she tried as much as possible to avoid him in the neighborhood. After sharing their disturbing experiences, they grew more certain that he knew something about Mandy's murder. Mary Lee reached out to Detective Ken Gates, who had been her high school classmate and was working at the Wetcom Sheriff's Office. She told of her suspicion about Timothy and also gave the reasons why she had them. I really wasn't ready because we're in a small town and to accuse someone of something we don't know for sure is a little scary, Mary Lee said. Detective Gates and the other detectives assigned to Mandy's case began unraveling as much as they could about Timothy. What they found out was that he had no criminal record, but something else about him caught their attention. Back in 1989, at the time of the murder, Timothy and his family had been living in a house that was right along Mandy's favorite running route. Where he lived was not too far from Mandy's house. 
His family was well-liked in the community, and he had also attended the same high school as Mandy. In January 1990, he had gotten married to a woman named Gina Malone and moved to Everson, a city in Washington that's about 19 miles north of A.C. Me. The union between Timothy and Gina produced three children, and he was leading a normal and quiet life working as a delivery driver for a bakery known as the France Bakery Outlet. Detectives also discovered that none of the male members of Timothy's family, including him, had been asked to provide their DNA for testing. Due to this, detectives decided to pay him a visit at his home. When they got there, they talked to him about Mandy, but his response suggested that he could barely remember who she was. That was definitely a red flag for me, which indicated to me that he was obviously lying, Detective Kevin said. Everybody knew what the Mandy Stavit case was, and she ran past his house every day. How could you not know it? Timothy was then asked for saliva samples so that they could obtain his DNA, but he refused. The reason he gave was that he did not trust them. He told them that he had watched crime shows and seen how people went to prison after giving their DNA. This only made detectives more suspicious of him, but since they could not force him to give his DNA, they took their leave. However, from that day, they began to watch him more closely. Detectives also went to his workplace and met with a woman named Kim Wagner, the manager of the bakery. They told her that they were investigating Timothy and needed help in obtaining his DNA, but they didn't reveal to her what exactly they were investigating him for. They came in, they said that there's an employee here under investigation for a case, and they'd like to get rude information and maybe collect a cigarette but in there. At that point, I just shut them down. I was like, yeah, no. This is way above my pay grade, Kim said. She immediately directed them to the Human Resources Department, and there, detectives met with a brick wall. The owner of the bakery refused to be of help after finding out what the detectives were there for. They wanted a subpoena or a search warrant, and we didn't have sufficient probable cause to get a warrant, said Wecom County Sheriff Bill Alpha. It was a disappointing period for detectives, and they had to accept a temporary defeat. Around 2017, the bakery manager Kim, her husband, and some friends were having a random discussion in the comfort of their home. The topic soon shifted to the 1989 murder and how Timothy used to live on the same street as Mandy. At that moment, it occurred to Kim that detectives had been to her workplace years back because they were investigating Timothy in connection to the murder. A short while after this, detectives went back once again to the bakery in the hopes of getting Timothy's delivery route. When they got there, they met with Kim. This time around, she offered to help them get Timothy's DNA sample. They had to decline her offer because they did not want to involve a civilian in their investigative work. However, they agreed to accept any evidence she brought to them. I 100% volunteered to do it, Kim said. The reason I wanted to know was I'm a mom now. If something happened to my daughter, I'd want someone to help me. And the thought of her mom never having an answer of who did that to her daughter. If I could help her find that piece, I wanted to do it. For several weeks, Kim had no luck with getting her hands on any item that contained Timothy's DNA. For some strange reason, he always took his trash home with him and was in the habit of wearing gloves while working. Then one day, he probably got carried away and threw away a plastic cup. Luckily, Kim saw him doing this, and she acted fast. I looked in the garbage, and my heart was beating out of my chest, Kim said. I grabbed it, and I put it in my desk drawer. I was like, oh my god, that just happened. She eventually passed on the cups to detectives who immediately sent them for testing. All that was left was to wait. So about three months later, we got the results from the state crime lab, and Katie from the crime lab says, Kevin, we've got a match, Detective Kevin said. After hearing those words, Detective Kevin was overjoyed. He knew that after so many years, the case was finally solved. On December 12, 2017, detectives went to Timothy's workplace and arrested him there. He was charged with the rape and first-degree murder of Mandy. When he was interrogated, he denied having anything to do with the murder, but told detectives that both he and Mandy had been having a secret relationship. The reason why his DNA was found inside her, according to him, was that he had slept with her hours before she disappeared. When Mandy's family heard Timothy's claim about a secret relationship, they immediately made it clear that he was lying. There's no way my sister would have a physical relationship with Tim Bass. Molly said. She was way, way, way out of his league, to put it bluntly. Since Timothy maintained his innocence, the case went to trial. 
but months before the trial began, his attorneys made attempts to have the DNA evidence rendered invalid. Their reason was that the way detectives had collected the evidence violated Timothy's Fourth Amendment right. However, much to their disappointment, the judge decided that the evidence would be presented at trial. During this period, Timothy's wife Gina filed for divorce. The trial began in May 2019, and during the two weeks it lasted, Timothy's attorney tried to convince the court that he was guiltless. However, many witnesses, including Timothy's younger brother Tom Bass, came forward to give testimony against him that further sealed his fate. When Tom was called to the witness stand, he revealed that while Timothy was under investigation, he had told him that he had slept with Mandy several years back. He then asked Tom to lie to the police that he had slept with her. Tom also recounted another incident where Timothy had asked his mother to also lie that they were Christmas shopping at the time of Mandy's disappearance. Despite all of these revelations, Timothy's attorney still tried to give an excuse for his actions, but the jury was not moved. They had made up their minds. On May 24, 2019, Timothy was found guilty of Mandy's murder. At the age of 50, he was sentenced to 27 years in prison. For Mandy's family, the sentencing brought a sense of comfort. Mary, who never thought the case would one day be solved, had the following to say. Definitely closure, I feel. After all, they've got the guy that did it. He'll spend enough years in jail, so if he ever does get out, his life will be practically over. Sadly, the life of a young and ambitious woman like Mandy was brought to an abrupt end. However, there's still relief in knowing that her killer has been brought to justice. But do you think there was a chance that both Mandy and Timothy had a secret affair? Or was it something he said out of desperation? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section. On October 11, 1991, Linda Little, a waitress at a restaurant in Daytona Beach, Florida, suddenly vanished without a trace after getting off work. Her disappearance puzzled detectives for several years until the killer received spiritual enlightenment while incarcerated, leading to a chilling confession. So what happened to Linda? Where did she go after leaving work that night? Was she followed? Or did an unfortunate twist of fate put her in the wrong place at the wrong time? Today's case will take us to the city of Daytona Beach, located on the east coast of Florida Panhandle. It's famous for its white sandy beaches and world-renowned International Speedway, making it a go-to spot for racing enthusiasts. The city boasts several resorts, attractions, and, of course, beautiful ocean views that attract millions of tourists yearly. Let's first go back to the beginning, though. Linda was born on the 29th of October 1947 in North Carolina. Not much is known about her early life other than she grew up with three siblings and a close-knit family. Joy Little, Linda's younger sister, described her as someone with a lively spirit and whom people enjoy being around. When Linda was around the age of 19, she gave birth to her first and only child whom she named Mike Parrish. It's not clear who the father of Mike was or at what point Linda became a single mother, but she eventually raised her son with the help of her family. In 1989, at the age of 41, Linda moved out of North Carolina and began living in Daytona Beach, Florida. Her apartment was a stone's throw away from the popular Broadway Bridge located in downtown Daytona, and she lived alone. To make ends meet in the new city, she took up a job as a waitress at the Chart House restaurant on South Beach Street. Everyone in her workplace loved her due to her positive energy. The pay she was getting at her new place of work wasn't really much but it was enough to get by. Linda enjoyed biking and would often cycle to and from work among other places. At the time, she owned a blue and rust-colored Murray Touring bike, which she rode almost everywhere. At some point, she began a romantic relationship with a man from New Smyrna Beach, an area about 24 minutes drive from Daytona Beach. Linda was at a good place in her life. She had her job, a boyfriend, family, and friends. Things were looking up and she seemed genuinely happy. Little did she know that her happy life would be snatched away from her all too soon. October 11, 1991, made it about two years that Linda had been living in Daytona Beach. Those two years had gone by in a flash, and it seemed to her like it had been less than that. On the morning of October 11th at around 1 a.m., she finished her shift at the restaurant and prepared to leave. Attending to hungry customers all night long had drained her, and she couldn't wait to be out of the place. She immediately changed into black stretch pants and a white shirt, said goodbye to her co-workers, and made her way out of the restaurant with a backpack. 
Linda was someone who was particular about her appearance and always had a change of clothes and makeup for after her shift, which she usually carried in a backpack. She got on her Murray Touring bike and headed towards a bar located on Broadway. This bar was known as Mady's Brig Bar. She had plans to have a drink or two with some friends there before finally going home. When she got to the bar, she hopped off her bike and parked it in a spot she felt was safe. After doing this, she made her way inside the noisy bar and, in no time, spotted some of her friends sitting and chatting animatedly at a table. She went to meet them and joined in the conversation. Their talk soon centered on Linda's love life, and she was more than happy to tell her friends all about her new romance. She told them that she and her boyfriend had plans to go on a vacation that weekend. She brought out a map of Florida from the backpack she was carrying and began pointing out the places she and her boyfriend planned to visit. Linda's friends were excited for her. The one thing they didn't know was that Linda was not telling them the whole truth. She and her boyfriend were not going on any vacation. Although it was something they had both agreed on, much to Linda's disappointment, the boyfriend had called off the plan at the last minute because he wanted to go deep sea fishing instead. It's not clear why Linda told her friends that the plan was still on. At around 2 a.m., Linda decided to take her leave. She said goodbye and made her way out of the bar. She got on her bike and pedaled in the direction of her house. She stopped at a 7-Eleven that was located a short distance from her apartment to purchase some chocolate milk and a donut. After paying for the items, she got on her bike once again and rode off. That was the last time anyone would see her. The following day, Linda did not show up for her shift at work. It was unlike her to miss a day of work, and both her co-workers and employer found her absence strange. On rare occasions when she'd missed work in the past, she'd call in to inform her employer or get someone to cover her shift. Despite that, her co-workers at the Chart House restaurant went about their duties religiously, and the day soon went by. They expected that by the following day, she would report back to work. However, the following day, there was still no sign of Linda. Her co-workers became even more worried and feared that something was really amiss. One of them decided to call Linda's sister Joy Little to inform her about what was going on. We all knew that something was wrong, Joy Little recalls when she was told about her sister's disappearance. A friend and co-worker of Linda by the name of Barbara Sheridan finally reported her as missing three days after she had mysteriously disappeared. Meanwhile, Linda's co-workers and friends were not the only ones who had noticed her absence. The landlord of the apartment where she lived had also gotten worried when he did not see her for days. He too called the police and reported her missing. Daytona Beach detectives, suddenly faced with the task of finding the missing woman, went to her apartment believing that perhaps they could find some clue there that would give them an idea of what had happened to her. With the aid of the landlord, they entered Linda's apartment and began looking around. Everything was in order, and it did not seem as if the living space had been disturbed. Her bed looked as if it had not been slept in. Due to this, detectives began to suspect that she had not made it home after work on October 11th. At that point, they knew they had much serious work on their hands, but they were determined to get to the root of the matter. After the search of her apartment was completed, they began questioning people in the neighborhood as well as her co-workers and friends. It was while doing this that they discovered that she had been to the Mady's Brig Bar and then the 7-Eleven store after her shift ended. But nobody seemed to know where she'd gone after that. It was all so mysterious. During their investigation, they also questioned her boyfriend since there was a likelihood that he would know something about the situation. But after interviewing him, they were still no closer to the truth. There was nothing that could be used to link him to Linda's disappearance. He told the detectives about the canceled vacation they'd wanted to go on and how it had been initially planned to celebrate their first anniversary. In addition to all this information, they also discovered that the boyfriend was a married man. When Linda's family found out about this, they were shocked. They believed that Linda had probably not known that the man was married before getting into a relationship with him. Police intensified their search and even employed the use of the K-9 unit to aid in the search for Linda. Areas around where she was last seen were thoroughly combed through. They even began searching bodies of water, but all of their efforts proved to be futile. There was no sign of Linda or the bike she had been seen riding. It was as if she had just vanished into thin air. Detectives knew that something bad had happened to her, but there was no evidence that could link her disappearance to foul play. There's no telling what happened. We had nothing to go on, 
said Daytona Beach Police Deputy Chief Steve Barrett. Linda's family also asked for the public's help in locating her. A $5,000 reward was offered for information about her whereabouts. In addition to this, they printed and distributed 3,500 missing person flyers. She was described as having brownish red hair, blue eyes, and a height of 5 feet 11 inches. Her weight was listed as 150 to 180 pounds, and a description of the clothes she was last seen wearing was also given. Some of these flyers were given to truck drivers to distribute throughout the country. Billboards with the same information were also put up in strategic locations within the city. As a last resort, Linda's family even turned to a self-proclaimed psychic to help find her. The following year after Linda went missing, her father died. The family was left to suddenly deal with the loss of another family member, which was no doubt devastating. In 1996, Linda's family received a phone call that was both shocking and mysterious. The man who called claimed that he had met Linda in North Carolina. When asked for his name, the man refused to provide this, and he immediately hung up. The man was never heard from again, and to date, no one knows who he was. In 2011, 20 years after Linda went missing, her family was interviewed by the local media. In an interview with the Daytona Beach News Journal, they revealed that they had not given up the search for her but remained hopeful that she would one day be found. I've never grieved for her, Joy Little said at the time. I've worked on her behalf because that's what I feel I'm supposed to do. I'm trying to get to the bottom of questions that have gone unanswered, she added. In 2016, the case was handed over to a new set of detectives in the Daytona Police Department, but regardless of how they looked at it, nothing made any sense. The evidence available was just not enough to make any tangible progress, and the detectives were left frustrated. The case would remain dormant for four more years until early January 2020 when something unexpected happened. The Daytona Beach Police Department was contacted by an inspector from the Tomoka Correctional Institution, also located in Daytona Beach. The inspector contacted them about an inmate who claimed to have information about an unsolved murder. The inmate in question was a 51-year-old man by the name of Michael Shane Thompson, who was serving a life sentence for the 2007 murder of a Titusville woman named Sherry Carmento. Thompson and Sherry had been childhood friends who had reconnected after he got out of prison in late 2006. He had been imprisoned back in 1994 on a long string of charges, which included robbery, grand theft, and burglary. After his release, Sherry allowed him to stay with her family for a few days. During his stay, he would end up beating her to death with a metal fence post and a hammer. He then dragged her body to the laundry room where he concealed her body under a pile of clothes. After this, he fled the scene in her vehicle. He eventually sold it to a group of people for an undisclosed amount. It did not take long for Sherry's body to be discovered by her boyfriend. Michael was soon found and arrested. During the interrogation, he admitted to killing Sherry. He revealed that she and Sherry had been intimate, and he believed that she might have knowingly given him AIDS. This, he said, was the reason why he had killed her. However, when an autopsy was conducted on Sherry's body, it was revealed that she did not have the disease. When detectives learned of these details, they were instantly curious to find out what he knew about the unsolved murder of Linda Little, which he had contacted them about. An interview was immediately set up, and Townsend sat down to talk to detectives from the Daytona Beach Police Department. During the interview, he confessed that he was the one who killed Linda back in 1991. Detectives couldn't believe their ears. To make sure that he wasn't mistaking Linda for someone else, they showed him a picture of her. He confirmed that she was the woman he remembered killing, saying, no doubt about it, no doubt. According to his statement, he'd been living in Orlando but decided to travel to Daytona Beach to celebrate his birthday. He had arrived in the city on October 10, 1991, and had met Linda the following day at a resort hotel bar that was located at 701 South Atlantic Avenue in Daytona Beach. Unfortunately, it just appears it was a random meeting. And unfortunately, on the wrong day at the wrong time, Linda just met the wrong person, Detective Sergeant Denardi with the Daytona Beach Police Department said. After having a few drinks, they left the club in Michael's car. While driving, he suggested to Linda that they should take a shower for some reason, and she had gotten very upset. According to Thompson, she then freaked out and began to yell and scream at him. He, meanwhile, was growing increasingly angry at all the noise she was making. 
and when he could not bear it anymore, he hit her hard across the face with the back of his hand. Afterwards, he proceeded to strangle her to death. When he realized that he'd killed her, he immediately thought of his next step. He drove to Kenton County in the state of Georgia, and there, he dumped her body behind a movable waste container. Detectives were amazed by all the details he was able to provide. They knew then that the case was finally solved. In addition to killing Linda, Michael also told detectives he had killed two women in Memphis, Tennessee. After the confession, he revealed that the reason why he had chosen to finally come out and tell the truth was that he had found God in prison. Michael also claimed that his predisposition to violence was because he had been sexually abused by his stepfather and some family friends when he was a child. Daytona Beach Police Chief Jakari Young stated he blames his mother and other women in his life for not protecting him as a child. As a result, he developed a hatred for women. Detectives have tried searching for Linda's remains in the area where Michael revealed that he dumped her body several years back, but they haven't had any luck. Through the dedication of detectives, the sustained hope of Linda's family, as well as the confession of the killer, Linda's case was finally solved. But what exactly happened to Linda's body remains a mystery. What are your thoughts on this sad case? Do you think Townsend's childhood abuse reinforced his hatred towards women? Or do you think it's just a pathetic excuse of a mindless killer? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section. Please don't forget to like. Lori Nesson Any detective will tell you that sometimes all it takes is one piece of information to solve a case. Reynoldsburg police got that tip on a cold case after four to six long years. On September 28, 1974, Lori Nesson appeared. She had attended a high school football game and subsequently a house party, according to the police. Nesson was last seen walking home just after midnight. Nesson's naked body was discovered in a ditch on Rose Hill Road, but her garments were strewn across several miles. Due to the limited technology available at the time, the case became cold. At the request of Nesson's family, the Reynoldsburg Division of Police reopened the investigation in August 2019. Officer Craig Bradford took on the case because his daughter was 15 at the time, the same age as Nesson. Officer Bradford claims that the more he looked at the files, the more he discovered contradictions. Pictures that, at the autopsy, showed some cuts on her lip, things that would indicate foul play. The time of death on Nesson's odyssey also didn't match up with when the teen was last seen. Bradford presented his findings to the Eckling County Coroner in 2020, who agreed to investigate the case. A few months later, the coroner's office amended the cause of death to undetermined homicidal violence. Then in December, a local news channel broadcasted an update on the nascent situation. After the program aired, someone contacted him with information that night. The caller was Karen Adams's cousin, and she said the news article of Lori's death was quite similar to her cousin's homicide. A similar case had happened six months after Nesson's death on March 9, 1975. Adams, then 17, was walking from her White Hall home to a friend's house when she disappeared. The next day, her body was discovered in a ditch on Vangert Road near Blacklick. The similarities were too strong to ignore. The authorities contacted the Franklin County investigator who was in charge of the Adams case, which had been solved in 2011. The Franklin County Sheriff's Office Detective Chuck Clark told him that they believed the two guys who killed Adams also killed Nesson. I've always suspected these two individuals were involved in something bigger than what they were caught for, Clark added. They drank, drove around the city, went anywhere they pleased, and approached girls and young ladies who were alone. Robert Meyer was 70 years old when DNA evidence tied Tim and Charles Weber to Adams' murder in 2011. He was apprehended by authorities in Cincinnati. He was sentenced to 15 years to life in jail, but he died in prison just a few years later. Weber, on the other hand, was already deceased and cremated, but his son submitted a cheek swab that revealed his DNA, proving his involvement in Adam's murder. Meyer and Weber were identified as the men responsible for Nesson's death by the Ohio Bureau of Criminal Investigations. Nesson's family is understandably troubled by the fact that her sister's final moments were probably spent in terror at the hands of two men they will never meet. According to investigators, Meyer and Weber both had a criminal background that put them in the old Ohio penitentiary in the 1960s. Meyer was sentenced to 10 years in prison in 1963 for murdering a man with a hammer. Weber was jailed for robbery. Following their release, the two moved in together and lived in Whitehall in 1974. 
Both men were convicted three years later of rape and kidnapping at least two women in the Toledo region. According to the investigator, one thing is certain. They were serial murderers and rapists. They would lure victims inside the car, joy ride with them, and then sexually assault and kill them. Of course, knowing what they did to Lori and Karen, and knowing that there were about six months between that and then their activity in Toledo a year later, they would have had plenty of opportunities to victimize other young girls. The police are actively seeking information regarding similar cases in that period. Nesson's family expressed hope that her cold case will provide hope to other families. I sincerely hope that this opens a door for other families who are waiting for answers, said her sister. No one should have to wait four to six years for anything. Number 2. The case of Junko Furuta is different. This is one of the few cases that will shake you to your bones and make you boil with rage from start to end. It's not fascinating. It's just horrible. The only mystery here is how human beings can be so unimaginably cruel and how a judicial system can fail an innocent girl so badly after everything she went through. Before we dive right into the case, please note that the content of this video may trigger people on the topics of rape, torture, and murder. Let's get right into it then. Junko Furuta was a 17-year-old high school student living in Saitama Prefecture in Japan in 1988. She was smart, ambitious, and generally well-liked by everybody around her. Her grades were great. She stayed away from alcohol and drugs, and she was working at a plastic molding factory in her free time to save up for a trip she planned on taking after graduation. She had also accepted the job that she planned to take on after she graduated. Needless to say, she had a bright future ahead. Unfortunately, for her, she went to school with some juvenile delinquents who were also ranking Yakuza members, Hiroshi Miyano, Jihugiro, Shinji Minuto, and Yasushi with the Nabi. Miyano had a history of committing crimes and apparently had been getting into trouble since elementary school. Reportedly, Miyano had a crush on her and had even confessed his feelings to her before. But she rejected him because she wanted to focus on her studies. Miyano's horrible reputation and his connections to the Yakuza scared most people quite a lot, but Furuta had the courage to outrightly tell him no. On November 25, 1988, Miyano and Minuto were wandering around to find a victim to kidnap and rape. It just so happened that Furuta was riding back home around 8.30 p.m. after her shift at her job. Under Miyano's orders, Minuto kicked Furuta off her bike and ran away from the scene. Miyano then approached her and pretended to help her out to try and get her to trust him. Unfortunately, she did. Miyano led Furuta to an old warehouse and immediately began threatening to kill her if she did not listen to him. She tried to fight back, but he managed to overpower her, after which he raped her and then led her to a hotel close by where he raped her again. When he called up his friends to brag about exploiting her, the group reportedly asked him to keep her there to allow multiple people to take advantage of her. Miyano eventually took her to a park where his friends were waiting, after which they went through her bag and found her address written in her notebooks. To force her to cooperate, they threatened to kill her family if she tried to escape. They finally took her to Minuto's house, which would be her prison for the next 44 days. On November 27, Furuta's parents contacted the police to report her disappearance. This made her captors force her to call her parents and tell them that she had run away and was otherwise fine. They believed her and dropped the case. The boys also forced her to act like Minuto's girlfriend when his parents were around, but quickly dropped the pretense when they realized that his parents would not report him to the police. The boys brutally tortured her over the next month. The brutality of the tortures escalated over time and initially began with humiliating her sexually before inflicting physical pain. While they also gave her limited food and water initially, they eventually stopped that and gave her a diet of cockroaches and milk instead. Their later statements revealed that their tortures included, but were not limited to, making her stand outside naked during the winter, force-feeding her large amounts of alcohol, making her smoke multiple cigarettes at once, urinating on her, beating her, penetrating her with various objects, and burning her with lighter fluid. They even stated that at one point, they penetrated her with a hot light bulb that exploded inside her. Take a moment to let that sink in. Animals treat other animals better. These boys turned into complete monsters while Furuta continued to do her best to defy them and fight back. Not before long, however, the severity of the attacks and her near-to-nothing diet began to take a toll on her body. 
she became crippled and could not move at all. Her face became swollen, she was severely malnourished, and her body was so injured that it became unable to urinate. As a result, her flesh began to rot while she was still alive. Her condition made her captors lose all sexual interest in her, and they found another 19-year-old woman to gang rape, who, like Feruda, was also on her way home from work. On January 4, 1989, a final brutal attack on her would end her life. Miano had lost a game of mahjong the night before and decided to vent his anger out on Feruda. For over two hours, her captors tortured her and beat her repeatedly. They poured lighter fluid on her and set her on fire multiple times, which she apparently tried to put out before she became unresponsive. They dropped dumbbells on her stomach, forced her to drink her own urine, placed short candles on her eyelids, and dropped hot wax all over her body. At some point, they covered their hands with plastic bags to continue beating her. She eventually went into a state of shock and began to convulse, after which she succumbed to her injuries and soon passed away. The following day, Minuto's brother called to inform them that Furuta may have died. After which, the panic group loaded her body in a drum and filled it with wet concrete. They went on with their lives until Miano and Aguru were arrested on January 23rd for the gang rape and kidnapping of the 19-year-old from December. Women's underwear was found at the redresses, and they were finally questioned over two months later. During their interrogation, Miano thought that one officer knew about his role in Furuta's murder, thinking that Igura might have been fast. Out of sheer chance, he told the officer where to find her body, which puzzled them since they thought that he might have been talking about another unsolved murder. The police found her body in the concrete drum the next day and identified her by her fingerprints. Several arrests were made immediately afterwards. The court initially kept the identities of the boys a secret because most of them were still minors. But a Japanese magazine called Shuken Banshu found out who the accused were and published them. They said that because of the severity of the crimes that they committed, they did not deserve to have the right of anonymity. All of the accused pleaded guilty to the charges of committing bodily injury that resulted in death instead of murder. This is where the case gets even more heartbreaking. The ringleader Miano was sentenced to just 17 years in prison. He appealed to the court, but they gave him an additional three years instead. The rest of the boys got much lighter sentences, serving only seven to eight years because they were below 18 at the time. All of them were released by 2010 and went on to commit more crimes, with Minato even being charged for beating and slashing the throat of another man. Another incident shows that after a guru was released, he was soon arrested again for beating a man for four hours because he thought that his girlfriend was involved with him. He allegedly boasted about his role in Furuta's rape, torture, and murder, and even told his victim that he had killed four and knew how to get away with it. Furuta's grave was also vandalized numerous times by a guru's mother later on because she believed that her son's life was ruined by her. Yeah, this case is beyond messed up. I know that while researching for this video, I was disturbed for days. It really makes you think about how messed up we have to be as a society to let the convicts of such a ghastly crime off so easily. Because guess what? If you don't give monsters like this the punishment they deserve, it only encourages them to commit more crimes. They learn that their actions have little consequence. Yep, this case really had the worst kind of resolution ever. What makes this case so unimaginably horrible is not just the gruesome treatment Junko went through for 44 agonizing days, but also that she never got the justice she deserved, even over 30 years later. Her rapists, torturers, and killers walk free in Japan today, and have carried out more crimes since then. To give you some perspective, people who have been arrested for carrying marijuana have received longer sentences than these actual monsters. While Furuta never got the justice that she deserved, we can only hope that by remembering the names and the faces of her captors and by remembering her bravery, we can play a part in contributing to what she never received at court. Minor Mini Soriano Murder Case it was a chilly winter day in 1999 when a 13-year-old girl, Minor La Soriano, aka Minnie never returned home from school. She used to study in 7th grade, was very smart, and was considered a bit mature for her age. Minnie loved poetry and have a deep fascination with rainbows. After several days of going missing, this flower-like girl was found dead in a dumpster in the Bronx, New York. She was found stuffed in a bag in that garbage dumping bin. Even though the medical examiner dismissed the idea of the occurrence of any sexual assault on Minnie, 
traces of semen were found on her sweatshirt. It was revealed that the cause of Minnie's death was strangulation. The task force formed by the NYPDD in 1999 looked into the case with Detective. Michael Legiovane is one of the chief investigating officers of this team. What followed was an intense round of interrogation of the near and far acquaintances of many family members. DNA testing was carried out at great lengths by sending samples from Minnie's clothing, hair, and nails. But guess what? The results did not show any matches. The New York City Chief Medical Examiner, Dr. Barbara Sampson, had said the hardest. Cases that we deal with as medical examiners are those involving children. What was done with her is something that has been haunting me for nearly 20 years. Since, when it's a homicide like this, and when there were no really good leads as to who did, it's the most troubling kind of case for us. When nothing conclusive came out, despite conducting an intensive investigation for a year, the team lost the leads, and the case literally turned hold. However, nearly two decades later, the NYPDD got the enthusiasm to reopen this case. Under Raymond, one of the first great detectives of New York, they went through a great deal of inquiries, interrogation, and investigation until they came up with the possible theory that Miterless was murdered by someone who was not a stranger, but known to hurt. By resorting to the latest technology, familial DNA, a major breakthrough was attained. Once the result of this DNA test was obtained, the detectives narrowed down the search result to five relatives of Martinez's people who could have connections to Minnie's murder. There is one fact about Minnie that we didn't really share with you all before. Did you know that this bubbly little girl had a great interest in astronomy? One of her classmates revealed that Minnie wished to become astronauts when she grew up, but that sadly did not happen. The detectives got a hold of her journals and found out a list of the astronomy websites that she used to follow. And undoubtedly, this showed how great an interest she had in this field. Later, when the DNA test reports were made, the investigating team narrowed down to three people, one of them being Martinez, aka Jupiter Joe. The team held him to be a prime suspect. Wondering why? Well, this is because Martinez was found to be on the 19 to 99 list of tenants who dwelled in the building where many used to reside with her family. Thanks to the upgraded technology of DNA testing, the investigating team came up with a vital result. They found out the DNA sample from Martinez matched the semen sample that was found on a mini sweatshirt. Martinez, popularly known as Jupiter Joe, was called so because he used to offer improvised astronomical lessons for several children worldwide. Oh, yes. He also had a YouTube channel where he used to upload his astronomy-based videos. This apparently good-natured soul was the one behind the murder of Little Minnie. He had brutally killed her by first compressing her neck and then attempting to sexually assault her. But in the course of trying to do that, Minnie died and the cold-blooded Jupiter Joe or Martinez was cold-blooded enough to dump her body in the dumpster in the Bronx. Martinez had thought that he had succeeded in escaping from the clutches of the NYPD. After all, the detectives did not get to catch him for over 22 years. Jupiter Joe, who is now 49 years old, was ultimately arrested by the investigating team. Raymond said that the arrest was indeed a tremendous relief. I hope she's smiling at us. I hope that she sees all the people who cared and that she knows she wasn't forgotten. Many will now be happy to see how her murder will rot in prison. Number 4. Emma Jane Walker, A Tragic Tale Emma Jane Walker was a 14-year-old high school student, a delightful young lady with a close-knit family and friends who adored her to death. Emma got admission to Knoxville Central High School, Tennessee, just two years before her death. Her friends described her as having a bubbly and fun personality. She was the only one in her junior year to get selected for the Central High Cheerleading Team. She had a bright future and wanted to become a nurse. Amidst her charismatic personality, Emma craved love. Therefore, while cheerleading, she caught the attention of William Riley Gall. William was two years older than Emma and was a star football player on his team. At that time, Riley was already dating a girl, but he broke up with her to be with Emma. It was a perfect love story, a popular football player and a cheerleader. They both seemed to be head over heels in love with one another. Emma's friends described Riley as a bit shy but extremely possessive about her. Their love story made Central High's headlines as Emma kept posting on social media about how happy she was with her boyfriend. 
Emma's parents also described Riley as a very sweet and generous guy who always made their daughter laugh. Despite their approval of Riley, they kept a close check on their daughter's phone to ensure the couple wouldn't cross any limits. Fast forward a few months later, Riley's behavior started changing immensely as he started controlling whatever Emma did. Her parents saw the toxicity in their daughter's relationship and decided to step in and take her phone away. This did not stop Emma from contacting Riley as he gave her an iPod touch with which she would text her boyfriend secretly. Two years had passed and Emma was 16 years old now. Her relationship with Riley kept getting worse day by day. Riley would text her things like, you are dead to me, and I won't ever see your face again, to things like, I am really sorry, you know that I love you. It was getting harder for the Walkers to see their daughters suffering because of her boyfriend. Riley's mom, Jill Walker, asked Riley to stay away from her daughter to protect her. Finally, in the fall of 2016, Emma broke up with her player boyfriend. Around that time, Riley had graduated from high school and had been a junior at Maryville College, which was only 30 minutes away from Emma's house. This was a deal-breaker for Riley as he tried to take his own life by swallowing Vicodin pills in his dorm room. His friends witnessed his behavior and how much he was obsessed with Emma. Meanwhile, Emma's life started getting better. She began spending quality time with her family and friends and realized that she deserved better. Things started getting back to normal for the Walker family, as the breakup proved to be healthy for their daughter. It was a normal Saturday, and Emma was at a house celebrating their victory in the annual football game. Around midnight, Emma started receiving mysterious texts. The text asked her to come outside alone, or they would kill someone she loved deeply. She told her friend Zach about these anonymous messages, and he suspected that it would probably be Riley trying to get back together with Emma. Terrified by the text, Emma and Zach went out and found a man lying face down near a ditch. To their surprise, it was Riley. He told Emma and Zach that he had been kidnapped and did not remember anything as he was unconscious. Nobody believed him and said that he was doing this just to get sympathy from Emma. A day or two had passed when Emma had been home alone and saw a man in a black hoodie standing outside her window. She was terrified and texted Riley out of fear, saying, I hate you, but I need you right now. He got a text from Riley that he was speeding over to her house to save her. Jill Walker came back to check up on her daughter and found Riley sitting in her front yard. She got furious and asked Riley to leave her property immediately. Emma told her mom the entire situation and asked her to be gentle with Riley, as he was only there to help her. Emma's friends again suspected that the mysterious man who was talking to her was none other than Riley himself. Following the days after this incident, Emma's parents never left her side, as they were scared for their daughter. By Sunday night, everything had returned to normal. November 21, 2016 It was a normal Monday morning when Jill Walker went to her daughter's room to wake her up for school. To her surprise, her daughter had no pulse. She freaked out and called 911 immediately. The ambulance came and rushed Emma to the nearest hospital, but it was too late. Emma was already dead. The hospital observed that she had been killed due to gunshots. The demise of a 16-year-old girl with a notably bright future made headlines throughout Tennessee. The investigations began as the Walkers and the entire Central High community mourned the loss of Emma Walker. Many condolences came in, including Emma's ex-boyfriend, who started posting her photos on social media, claiming how much he missed her and hoped that she would be in a better place. During the investigation, the police found two bullet holes outside Emma's room. The doctors told the police that Emma had been shot twice, with one bullet hitting her ear and killing her instantly, and the second one hitting her pillowcase. The police started interviewing all the suspects, and one name kept coming up, William Riley Gall. Emma's parents and friends testified that Riley had been trying to scare Emma into getting back together with him. Riley's college roommate made a statement that the night before Emma's death, Riley had asked him how to remove fingerprints from a gun. This intrigued the police, and they started investigating the 18-year-old college student further. Riley had shared a secret with his friends that after he got kidnapped, he had taken a gun from his grandfather to protect himself. This heightened suspicions even more. When the police checked the records, it came to light that Riley's grandfather had reported his gun as stolen. There was no room for confusion anymore. Noah and Alex, Riley's best friends, were also helping the police solve Emma's murder. The police asked them to secretly record Riley and try to get him to confess to the murder. 
They both agreed and asked Riley questions about the homicide. Riley asked his best friends if they would help him get rid of the gun in the Tennessee River, as he could go to jail because of that. At this point, it was all clear that Riley was the one who murdered his ex-girlfriend. The police took him into custody and asked him questions regarding the murder. He kept denying it, but his phone location showed otherwise. It was seen that Riley was outside Emma's house the night she was killed. It was 3 a.m. when Riley was seen going back to Maryville College. The police also found black clothing and shoes in Riley's car, making it clear that he was stalking Emma. The evidence was crystal clear, and 48 hours after Emma was murdered, Riley was in handcuffs. The trial of William Riley Gall began, and it was argued that he was Emma's hero, and it was just a clumsy act to scare Emma into coming back together with him. His intentions were never to kill her. However, this defense did not hold, and the jury eventually reached its final decision. William Riley Gall was charged with first-degree murder, stalking, theft, and possession of a firearm. He received a lifetime prison sentence with a maximum of 52 years before he could even be considered for parole. This has been a tragic case, a depressingly common type of homicide. Such cases are always hard to decipher, whether they are a reality or not. In this video, we will tell you what happened to Alice Gross. Alice Gross was born on Valentine's Day, February 14, 2000 in London. She grew up in a full loving family. She also had an older sister. From an early age, the girl showed an affinity for creativity. She loved to draw and play the piano on violin. Later, Alice began to write her own gorgeous songs and performed them to her own music. In addition, the girl was fond of Caleb's design and at age 11 even made herself a dress, which she planned to wear at a school graduation. When the girl was 13 years old, doctors died almost her with anorexia and depression. Despite all of this, Alice continued to pursue creativity and every chance of achieving tremendous success in the future. On August 28th, 2014, Alice told her mother that she was going on an outing. She had school vacations and plenty of free time, so the girl looked to walk along a small water canal and river near her home. The family lived in a suburb of London called Hanwell, and her usual routes was 4.5 kilometers. The girl went out at about 3 p.m., promising her parents she would return around 6 p.m. She later texted her father she would be home soon, but Alice did not return at the appointed time. And when it was already 7 p.m. on the clock, her parents began to worry. They tried calling her, but her phone was off. The fact that Alice suffered anorexia and depression only added to her anxiety. Her parents feared something might have happened to her because of her physical condition. She was constantly weak and could faint. Her parents called some of her friends in the hope that Alice might be with them, but no. One had seen the girl that day, and her mother and father decided to call the police. They immediately began a search, and the first thing they did was to investigate the route Alice usually took. Her relatives and friends of the family also joined the search. Alas, they could not find any trace of the girl, but detectives were able to find several witnesses. Thanks to their testimony about the places where Alice had passed, the police were able to determine her route more accurately, which in turn allowed them to narrow the search area and select several street cameras that could have captured her. After examining the footage, detectives did locate Alice. Almost immediately after leaving the house, she was caught on the first camera, heading along the Grand Union Canal. A short time later, she was spotted in the Bryan Ford area, which was further down the canal. The last time the camera captured her was on her way back near her home. The girl was walking near the Trapper's Way Bridge. The police also reported the missing teenager to the media, and they broke the news about the case all over London. In the first hours after her disappearance, Thanks to that, detectives received several calls from witnesses who had seen Alice. Unfortunately, none of this brought the police any closer to finding the girl. Based on camera footage and witness accounts, she disappeared on her way home, having traveled most of her usual route. But what happened to her remained a mystery. Three days went by as police continued to examine camera footage in nearby neighborhoods and surveyed local parks and other secluded areas. At the same time, patrol officers went door to door to homes along Alice's route and asked questions of local residents. On September 1st, the girl's relatives recorded a video message begging her to return home. 
They also asked anyone who had any information about her whereabouts to contact the police. At the time, investigators were considering several theories. The first and most troubling was the kidnapping version. Despite the fact that most of Alice's route was along city streets, there were many remote and hidden areas where the girl might have been attacked. In addition, the London police often encountered situations where people kidnapped, right in the center, let alone in the suburbs. The second was a theory about running away from home. Alice's parents feared that depression might have driven her to such a decision. They also didn't rule out the possibility that the girl might have taken her own life because of her illness, but to the police, this version seemed unlikely. At 14, Alice was unlikely to be able to run away and hide, especially without help. And if she had taken her own life, she would very likely have been found by now. The case attracted more and more public attention every day. And on September 3rd, it was handed over to a special unit of Scotland Yard. Although they usually only worked on homicides, the detectives rated the chance of getting the girl home as high. Scotland Yard organized a large-scale search, which was immediately joined by hundreds of volunteers. After seeing the heartbreaking appeal of her parents and sister in the news concerned, Londoners combed the area from early morning until late at night. And the next day, detectives announced the discovery of the first tangible clue. They managed to find Alice's backpack which contained her shoes worn that day. It was relatively close to her home. This find allowed the police to narrow their search focusing on a small area near the canal. Investigators realized it was unlikely the girl had taken off her shoes herself, thrown them in with her backpack and fled. She did not have a change of shoes with her, so the situation became more and more complicated. Scotland Yard decided to release all available surveillance footage of Alice. The backpack with the shoes indicated that the girl might be in serious danger. The main version was still an abduction, but the investigators did not completely rule out the possibility that the girl might have committed suicide. For that reason, they try to use all available resources to locate her. The publication of the recordings might draw more attention among the public, and someone might remember seeing Alice that day. Along with that, several hundred more people from various agencies were involved in the search and there were already 600 people working on the case. The investigation was thus the largest since 2005 in terms of the number of police officers involved. Some of them were directly surveying the area, while others were examining footage from hundreds of cameras that could have captured Alice. Scotland Yard also heard the £20,000 reward for any information that could help find the girl. Although police were unable to locate her phone, they asked the cell phone company for details of its less known location. It turned out that Alice had sent a message to her father from practically the same place where they would later find her backpack. Everything indicated that the investigators needed to focus on that particular location. The decision was made to conduct a thorough inspection of an area of several square kilometers. Every meter of land and water was examined manually. Police teams literally probed the river and canal bottoms for any evidence. Two days after the discovery of the backpack, it became known that the police arrested a 25-year-old man on suspicion of Alice's murder. The next day, they arrested another man, but refused to comment on the situation until all the details were clarified. However, soon both suspects were released and Scotland Yard stated that they were unable to establish the involvement of these two people in Alice's disappearance. More than a week passed, and during all that time, there was no progress in the case. It was only on September 16th that the police made another statement. They said they were looking for a 41-year-old man named Arna Sawkins in connection with Alice's disappearance. He moved to England from Latvia seven years ago. He lived in the area and worked as a construction worker. Scotland Yard became interested in him for two reasons that at first glance seemed unrelated. First, Arns's co-worker reported him to the police about his disappearance as earliest. September 3rd. The man did not show up for work, did not answer his phone, and was not at home. It seemed as if he had simply vanished. Second, detectives found that Sawkins' route from home to work was roughly the same. Route that the girl had taken the day she disappeared. All of this was not yet enough to draw any conclusions about man's involvement in a girl's disappearance. But detectives soon discovered something really disturbing. In one of the camera recordings, a sorrow middle-aged man riding his bicycle across the 
bridge where Alice had passed just a few minutes before. This man turned out to be Salkins. A short time later, he came to the next camera and heard that the tech ives noticed a very strange moment. The journey between these cameras should have taken only a few minutes, and it took the man on the bicycle practically a whole hour to ride down this road. A reasonable question arose. What was he doing all that time on such a short stretch? The police investigated the area and concluded that he could not have taken the longer route to the next cell because there simply was none. Even more disturbing was the fact that all this was taking place in the very area where Alice's path was allegedly cut short. The cops also concluded that the man's clothes were wet when he pulled onto the road. Continuing to study the cameras, detectives noticed so cons on his bicycle returning to the same location two hours later after riding back out 50 minutes later. In doing so, he was not caught on the camera located on the bridge. This indicated that the man had spent all that time inside a small blind spot. Besides, he was already wearing different clothes. About an hour later, he was caught on a camera at a local store buying beer. The next morning, the situation repeated itself. Zawkins returned to the same spot between the cameras at about 7 o'clock and also returned there again in the evening. All this was enough to get a search warrant for his house. It turned out that the man was living there with his girlfriend and their two daughters. Together, his roommate also had no idea where Salkins had gone. When she learned that he was suspected of killing the girl, she stated that Ernest could never do something like that. She described him as a caring and loving father. Along with this, Scotland Yard examined the man's biography and discovered a truly creepy moment. It turned out that the Saul cop had a rich criminal past. In 1998, being in Latvia, he killed his wife and called blood and calculatedly. Having dug a grave for her in the woods for which he got only seven years in prison. After serving his sentence, he moved to England and the local law enforcement. Agencies did not even know about his criminal record in his home country. Police officers searched Zakin's home and found a recently excavated plot of land on his property. They did not disclose whether they found an evidence there, but a significant find awaited them in the basement of their house. A broken back panel from a white iPhone 4S was found there. Alice had the exact same phone. After examining the contents of his computer, the police also discovered that the man had searched the incident for information about Alice Gross's disappearance a few days after the incident. On the basis of all this, Ernest Sawkins was put on the wanted list. Scotland Yard feared that the man might have fled back to Latvia or another European country, so they searched all over the EU, but law enforcement authorities were unable to find a single trace of the suspect. Meanwhile, a month had passed since Alice's disappearance, and on September 30th, police issued a depressing statement. A human body was found in a river near the Gill's disappearance. At the time, the identity was not yet known, but police shared one eerie fact. Someone had gone to great lengths to arrange for the body to remain underwater and not resurface. Only the next day, law enforcement authorities confirmed that the deceased was Alice. Gross, though number one doubted it anymore. The scene was in the exact spot where she had disappeared. The cause of death was asphyxiation. It turned out that Alice's buddy had been wrapped in construction bags and tied to a large tree stump. In addition, the perpetrator made a whole structure out of a bicycle wheel and bricks, which also prevented the body from surfacing. She also had no clothes on except for one sock. Detectives pay the visit to the setup where Sawkins worked and discovered that the same bags used to hide Alice's body were the same ones used at his construction site. After the discovery of the body, please continue to search for Sawkins, working closely with Interpol on local European intelligence agencies, but they were still unable to find any trace of him. This went on until October 4th when investigators made an expected discovery. They discovered the man's suspended body in a park just one kilometer from where Alice was murdered. Two days later, experts confirmed that the deceased was Ernest Sawkins. Number one expected such a turn of events. The main version of Scotland Yard was the escape of the suspect to Europe. Well, in fact, it turned out that all this time he was under their noses. Medical experts concluded that the man had committed suicide on the day of his disappearance, September 3rd, and that he could not be found for a month. Nothing surprising here, however. Sokins had chosen a very remote and hard-to-reach location where he was 
extremely difficult to spot. With Zokin's DNA in hand, investigators had even more evidence. Near where Alice's body was found, please found a cigarette butt, which was sent to a lab. Experts extracted DNA from the filter, which matched the Zalkin sample. In addition, the lab said that it was highly likely that the perpetrator's DNA was found on the victim's body. They could not assert this with 100% certainty due to how long the body had been underwater. His DNA was also found on the girl's backpack and shoes. By that time, police had discovered another gruesome fact. It turned out that two years after moving to England, Sawkins had molested a 14-year-old girl just a kilometer away from where Alice's body was found. The man attempted some indecent act, but the victim survived and the man was arrested. This is where the fun part begins. The girl did not press formal charges and the perpetrator was simply released. It is not entirely clear how this could have happened. But the fact remains, an adult man molested a girl, fell into the hands of the police and escaped punishment. Moreover, information about this case surfaced after the perpetrator's body was found in the park. Despite all this, the police continued to investigate, and it took them some time to put together a picture of what had happened. According to their version, on an unfortunate day, August 20th 8th, Soxons was riding his bicycle along the same route where Alice was walking. Having noticed her in a secluded area, hidden from prying eyes, he attacked her in order to commit depraved acts. How events unfolded next, we shall never know, but the outcome was tragic. So Kantz killed Alice and then hit her body in several approaches, constantly. Returning to the place, we will also never know why he decided to take his own life after what he had done. Whether this can be called a manifestation of conscience is very debatable. Alice's parents, who survived such a terrible tragedy, were outraged by the government's actions. They were perplexed how the British authorities allowed a convicted murderer to enter the country and stay here to live. They had spent years fighting for the government to increase its control over migrants and keep criminals out. Unfortunately, to this day, they have been unable to make any serious changes. A month after the discovery of Zulkin's body, another interesting event occurred. The medical examiner in charge of the investigation left a folder of case documents on the train. The 30 pages contained important information about the murder, including medical information and undisclosed detail. The public, the media, and Alice's parents harshly criticized the police, but there was nothing they could do about it. However, number one tried to judge the deceased perpetrator anyway. The investigators said that if he were alive, they would have had enough evidence to bring the case to court, but there was no guarantee of a conviction. The problem was that all the evidence against Salkins was circumstantial, and he had a small chance of getting away with it. Instead, a hearing was held in court in which the jury admitted an already obvious fact. Alice had been murdered. Her death was not an accident. The procedure was formal and played no role. Alice's funeral was held on October 23rd. Thousands of people came out to the memorial that day, and at the end of the ceremony, a beautiful song that the girl rolled and sank herself was shown on the big screen. Next, we will tell you the story of Molly Tibbetts and what her disappearance led to. Molly Tibbetts was born on May 8, 1988 in San Francisco, California. When she was in second grade, her parents divorced and Molly moved to Iowa with her. Mother and two brothers, her father, however, continued to maintain a close relationship with his children. After high school, she enrolled Iowa State University as a psychology major. In her spare time, she worked at a day camp at the Regional Medical Center. She had an active lifestyle, played sports, and had many friends. She spent the summer of 2018 in a tiny town called Brooklyn, which is also in Iowa. It is barely over three kilometers in size and only has 1,400 people living there. It would seem that in such a quiet place, where everyone knows each other, nothing terrible could happen. On July 18th, 2018, Molly was going for a run. She was living in Brooklyn with her boyfriend, Bolton Jack, at his brother's house. On the evening of that day, she was in the house alone. Her boyfriend was away at work in another town 210 kilometers from Brooklyn. Molly sent him a picture on Snapchat and went out for a run at about 7.30 p.m. The next day, Molly was supposed to go to work, but she never showed up. This seriously disturbed her family and boyfriend. 
They all knew that the girl was extremely responsible and never missed work without warning. In addition, she did not respond to calls and messages. As a result, the parents decided to contact the police who began a search for Molly. From the early days, the case began to attract increased attention across America. As for the residents of Brooklyn, for them, the disappearance of a young girl was a rail. Shark. Nothing like this had ever happened in this tiny town before. People had never locked their doors and were sure of their own safety. Molly's father, Rob Tibbetts, came to Brooklyn from San Francisco and took an active part in the search. He handed out flyers with her photographs, questioned people, and tried in every way to help the investigation. Parents did not give up hope until the very last moment that their daughter would be found alive and unharmed. Three agencies got involved in the search for the girl. The Iowa Division of Criminal Investigations, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and the Powashik County Police Department. Together, they worked more than 2,000 leads and interviewed about 500 people. The search for Molly was scattered throughout Brooklyn's neighborhoods. At one point, law enforcement received a report that Molly had been spotted at her truck. Stop in Kearney, Missouri, 380 miles from Brooklyn. Please check this information and could find no confirmation. The police says is proper in such cases, check the theory that her boyfriend was involved. Statistically, most crimes of this nature are committed by relatives or loved ones, but not this time. Boyfriend's alibi was ironclad. He really was in another city and physically couldn't have been in Brooklyn that night. Time passed, and the search for Molly yielded no results. The Criminal Investigations Division announced the cash reward for any leading to the Gill's return, alive and unharmed. The amount grew steadily and eventually reached $366,000. This was very substantial money even by U.S. standards. And for the state of Iowa, the reward was a record at one point. Police said they were. Narrowing the search for Molly to a few locations around Brooklyn, her boyfriend's house, several local farms, a gas station, a truck stop, and a car wash, or none of it, helped locate Molly. The police received hundreds of leads, each of which led to a dead end. There was one episode, however, that struck me as odd. The owner of one of the pig farms where the police concentrated their search was extremely reluctant to contact law enforcement. He denied any involvement in Molly's disappearance, but refused to take a polygraph examination. All this made him an excellent candidate for the role of suspect, but there was no evidence against him. This meant that the police could neither interrogate the man nor search his farm property. As a result, the investigation was again at a standstill. The police tried to find some connection between the farm and Molly's disappearance, but they were unsuccessful at least at the time. That all changed on the August 20th first. A few days earlier, a law enforcement source told reporters that the police had found a body of a young white woman. Of course, everyone immediately assumed it was Molly, and they were right. On August 20th first, the police issued an official statement. Molly Tibbetts' body was found in Pawasha County, where Brooklyn was located. The parents identified their daughter. Investigators immediately noticed she was missing two items she always took with her. A smartphone and a fitness bracelet. Soon, the medical examiner made an official conclusion. The girl was attacked by several blows with a sharp object. This further shocked the residents of Brooklyn. They all knew each other and could not even think that there was a violent criminal among them. The newspapers also broke the story, making the whole of America talk about it. Solution to this gruesome crime was not long in coming. Almost immediately after the discovery of the body, police arrested 24-year-old Christy Rivera, an illegal migrant from Mexico who had come to the United States illegally seven years before the incident. All the time he had worked on various farms, hiding under the name John Budd. Police came to the Riviera after reviewing camera footage near the route mall usually ran. In the footage, they spotted a Chevy Malibu car driving back and forth on the road with no apparent purpose. It's possible to say with certainty how the police got the confession. According to the official version, Riviera immediately confessed to what he had done as soon as they came in with questions. According to his story, he was driving by the road along which Molly was running. He took a fancy to the girl and drove by her several more times. Apparently, it was these movements that the police noticed on the surveillance cameras. At one point, he stopped the car, 
got out, and ran alongside Molly at the same time. He began harassing her verbally trying to gain the girl's affection. Molly did not like it and throw and to call the police. When the girl reached for her phone, Riviera attacked her. He then dumped her body in a cornfield and fled. Already under arrest, Riviera suddenly changed this strategy and claimed that he remembered nothing of that night. It is possible that his lawyer persuaded him to withdraw his confession. The charges against Riviera were filed on August 20th 2nd. At the trial, which began on September 19th, he pleaded not guilty. The trial dragged on for three years, largely thanks to the lawyers. Riviera's relatives hired two lawyers who tried all their might to get an acquittal or the minimum possible punishment. The whole of America watched a trial. The thing is, this crime was committed during Donald Trump's presidential term. As many of you know, Trump has advocated stricter immigration laws, and it was Mexico, that he focused on the most. The Trump administration used the crime that Riviera committed to its advantage. The sad fate of Molly Tibbetts was cited as an example of why Trump's reforms are necessary for America. The girl's father spoke out strongly against his door to being used in political disputes, but number one listens to her father. One girl's story resounded across the country in the context of the immigration laws. After all, it is difficult not to agree that illegal migrants are a danger when literally under. The nose appears just such a case. The speed of the criminal trial was also affected by the pandemic and it wasn't until May 17, 2021 that the main part of the hearing began. Riviera continued to insist on his innocence, but he didn't stand a chance. On May 28, the court handed down its verdict guilty of first-degree murder. Riviera received a maximum sentence for the state of Iowa, life in prison without parole. He will now spend many years in prison at the expense of American taxpayers. Politics aside, Molly Tippett's story once again shows us a sad truth danger can await. Anyone when they are not expecting it, and none of us are immune. Number 3. This incredible story, which began in 1977, shocked the world with his denouement. 34 years later, a young mother took her six-month-old baby and went to a store near her home. She never returned home, and the police could find no trace of her. It took several decades for everyone to learn the truth and to see that such twisted plots do not only happen in the movies. This story began in the sunny American state of Hawaii. In early 1977, a young couple, 26-year-old Mark Barnes and 31-year-old Charlotte, Moriarty had a son named Marks. It seemed that a happy and carefree future awaited the family among palm trees, sunshine, and boundless ocean. Mark worked as a veterinarian, and Charlotte was an artist. The couple wasn't married, which didn't stop them from loving their child and giving him the best of everything. Before meeting Mark, Charlotte had been married and had a daughter who stayed to live with her father in New Mexico. After the divorce, her mother kept in contact with her and tried to visit her whenever possible. Fast forward to June 20th, 1st, 1977. On that day, Mark had been working on the property since early in the morning, and the man was planting Charlotte's favorite flowers around it. The girl told him she wanted to walk to the store, so as not to distract Mark from his work, she decided to take her son with her, put him in the stroller, and left. A few hours passed, Mark was so worked up that he didn't immediately realize Charlotte should have been back by now since the store was only a few blocks away. After waiting a few more hours, he decided to walk to that store in hopes of meeting Charlotte on the way. As he stepped away from the house, he saw his son's empty stroller standing near the bus stop. Neither the child nor Charlotte was anywhere to be found. It would seem that he should have gone to the police immediately after that, but Mark didn't. As he explained later, Charlotte could sometimes go somewhere for a few days. Unannounced, and then returned home. The man decided that this time would be no exception. It sounds strange enough that if Charlotte had gone out alone, Mark's logic could still be understood, but she had taken her six-month-old baby with her, abandoned the stroller in the middle of the street, and seemed to have vanished. Two days passed, but Charlotte never showed up. Then Mark decided to call the police, and they advised him to wait a few more days. What if the girl and the baby still returned home? So he did. And two days later, he called the police again. This time, he was asked for a description of Charlotte and the child. And then they promised to start a search. But after that call, number one contacted Mark, 
and the fate of his girlfriend and son remained. A mystery. Three weeks passed. Mark decided to go to the police station to see how the search was going and hear the strangeness continued. There he was told that no calls had been received from him. The police allegedly couldn't find any evidence that Mark over the phone had told them about the missing girl and child. Of course, no case was open and number one was looking for the missing all this time. List well on this point in more detail. Mark assured everyone that he had called the police twice. The police said that every call was registered and that there had simply been no calls. It is unclear which of them is right, but both scenarios are plausible. If the police really did refuse to start looking for the six-month-old, they could have been in serious trouble. Missing small children obliged the police to search immediately, even if only a few hours have passed since the disappearance. So in this case, the police may well have covered up the fact they did not search for the infant. The father's behavior also seemed strange. Why he wait several days before calling the police, and were there any such calls? Even if he did call, why did he wait three more weeks after those calls and only then decide to go to the station? After all, in all that time, he had even called there to find out anything about the progress of the investigation. In this conversation with the detectives, Mark reported that Charlotte might have some kind of mental health problem. In the 70s, psychiatry was still gaining ground, so no treatment had been given to the girl. Neither she nor Mark even went to the hospital, even though there were very serious reasons to do so. According to Mark, Charlotte walked around the house for the first few weeks after giving birth with only a blindfold on and couldn't properly explain why. Given that there couldn't possibly be a logical explanation here, Mark was worried beyond belief and was already thinking about seeing doctors. But then Charlotte removed the blindfold and began to behave completely normally. The man decided to forget the story and not to pay any attention to it. That Charlotte's disappearance could be related to mental problems was indirectly suggested by another fact. Mark said that her daughter, who was eight years old at the time, was going to fly to Hawaii in June to visit her mother. Charlotte was looking forward to that meeting, but at the last minute, the girl's father canceled all plans in Charlotte that they will not come this summer. This very much upset the girl and mental disorders can be provoked by strong negative emotions that Charlotte experienced. Even in the quietest stages of a live person does not show any signs of unstable psyche. But all these theories did not bring the police any closer to finding the girl and her son. They opened a case, posted flyers all over the place, and couldn't find a single clue. Mark later recounted that for a year and a half after Charlotte and his son disappeared, he became obsessed with searching for them. He drove all over the island, hoping to find them alive and unharmed. But it never happened. Two years after they went missing, he moved to California nor did the police have much. Hope in the case, given the complete lack of evidence, number one believed that a girl and child could be found. Compounding the situation was the fact that crucial time for the had been lost in the first few days. 24 years had passed. Mark had started a new family, and he had two daughters. He had long ago stopped believing that he would one day see Charlotte and Mark's alive. But in 2001, the case took a new turn. Charlotte's daughter from her first marriage, Jennifer flew to Hawaii and went to the police station. She convinced them to reopen the case of her mother's disappearance. The detectives agreed, put Charlotte and Mark's information into the missing person's database, and created a computer portrait of Mark's growing up based on his childhood. Photo. The first thing the detectives decided to do was to interrogate Mark because his behavior in the early stages of the investigation seemed strange to them. There was no mention in the old documents that the man had called the police station. By phone two days after the girl and child disappeared, it said he not come to the police station until three weeks later. This led detectives to believe that Mark may have been involved in their disappearance. Even though 24 years had passed since then, the police tried to find any witnesses who lived near Mark and Charlotte's home. Of course, most of the residents had already changed. But the detectives were lucky enough to find one senior citizen who had lived there back. Then, he remembered Mark and Charlotte and told the detectives an interesting fact. According to the pensioner, the couple often quarreled, and he heard them shouting. The detectives then decided that the case was getting close to a solution and Mark was indeed guilty. He was called in for questioning and told about the witness who had heard his regular 
arguments with Charlotte. Mark did not deny that there had indeed been verbal altercations between them. He also asked to see a married couple who would never fight. Detectives tried with all their might to prove his guilt and offered Mark to voluntarily undergo an interrogation with a polygraph. The results were ambiguous. The specialist who read the testimony could not give a clear answer whether the man was guilty or not. A pause graph is inherently an overrated instrument. It is not physically capable of showing whether a suspect is lying or not. Dozens of factor can affect its results can be mistaken for the truth and vice versa. If an innocent person is very nervous during an interrogation or withholds completely different information that is relevant to the questions, the polygraph can make him out to be a liar. In Mark's case, the polygraph was of no use there. But the detectives decided to go at it from a different angle. They obtained a warrant to examine the house where Charlotte and Mark lived in 1977. What interested them the most was the terrace, built shortly after the girl and child went missing. They speculated that Charlotte might not have gone anywhere that day, but might have been hurt by her husband in another quarrel and ended up in the ground under the terrace. It is not clear how the police imagined the events of that day and how an infant fits into the story, but they had no other versions. Forensic dug through the backyard and examined the terrace, but they were unable to find any trace of anyone's remains there. It is not known if they compensated the new owners of the house for the two days of digging in the backyard. The detectives admitted they had nothing else to work with and set the case aside. Again, as the last resort, they took DNA samples from Jennifer and Mark, hoping it would someday help. The case went into a long drawer again for a full 10 years, but after that time came the finale to this whole tangled story. Steve Carter, 35 of Philadelphia, had wondered about his past from an early age. He grew up in an orphanage, and at the age of four, he was installed by a wealthy new Jersey couple. The U.S. Army officer and his wife loved the baby and cared for him as their own. Steve also loved his foster parents, but he always wondered how he ended up in the orphanage. In 2011, he stumbled upon an internet article that told the amazing story of Caroline White, who had been kidnapped from the hospital when she was just 19 days old. Decades later, Caroline was browsing missing children's websites, found her childhood photo there, and realized with horror that it was her current parents who kidnapped her from the hospital. Steve Carter was inspired by the story and began researching the same sites. He entered his birth information on his certificate was immediately speechless. The first result showed an adult photo of him taken by artists based on a baby picture. Resemblance was so strong that Carter could not even move in shock. He realized he was the same Max Barnes who had gone missing in Hawaii with his birth mother. After recovering from his shock, Steve made the decision to take a DNA test, taking the opportunity through a missing child search service. Their database contained DNA samples of Mark and Jennifer taken by the police 10 years earlier. After eight months of waiting, the test showed an exact match. Steve Carter turned out to be Mark Barnes. Police instantly reopened the investigation. The missing infant found himself 34 years later, but the circumstances of his disappearance were still a mystery, but not for long. His birth certificate helped solve the mystery. First, the certificate was not issued until a year after the birth of the child. Second, his name was Tenzin Amaya, and his mother's name was Jane Amaya. That's what helped the police to connect the two key strands because that name had already appeared in the reports not long after Charlotte and the child disappeared. The police received a strange call. A woman reported that a girl with an infant baby had knocked on the door in her house and asked for milk to feed her. The police arrived on the believing that the girl was in an inadequate state. She was taken to a psychiatric clinic for evaluation, and the infant was handed over the guardianship authorities. This girl was Charlotte. After a few days in the hospital, she secretly escaped and was never seen again. And the child remained in the care of the state because he did not even have a birth certificate and it was impossible to identify his relatives. When the truth came out, everyone had a legitimate question. Why the police did not compare the disappearance of the girl and the baby to another? Situation especially when the infant was left in the care of the state. Couldn't they have realized that they had the very same child in front of them? Now, they 34 years later, it's hard to answer that question. Perhaps the police simply didn't know about the disappearance because the two cases 
handled by two different precincts. Steve, who by then was working in a prestigious job and had a family of his own, decided to make contact with his half-sister and biological father. They were shocked when the man revealed his own disappearance. Number one believed anymore that the infant might still be alive. Although we don't know what happened to Charlotte, the ending of the story can definitely be considered happy. Sat statistics tell us that the chances of finding missing children after so many years are zero, but the case of Marks Barnes was one of the rare exceptions he grew up in a wonderful family, received a good upbringing, and became a successful man. Most likely, Charlotte was indeed suffering from serious mental disorder. She knocked on the door of a stranger asking for milk to feed her son. Perhaps the call to the police saved infant's life. Who knows how Charlotte's mental state would have changed in the future? It is still unknown what happened to her, and it is unlikely that the mystery will ever be solved, considering that she never tried to contact her husband or find her son. The woman could have died time after escaping from the asylum. Perhaps timely medical care could have changed the girl's condition for the better, and this whole story would have never happened. Number 4. In a small town, a 13-year-old girl disappeared, and her disappearance was not noticed. Until 24 hours later, this case could not be solved for more than 10 years and only in the summer of 2021. It came to its conclusion. In this video, we will tell you what happened to Haley Dawn. This story took place in the American town of Colorado City, Texas. This place is a typical low-rise America, with an area of 14 square kilometers, only 4,000 people lived in the town. On Christmas Day 2010, the town had a New Year's atmosphere, residents decorated. Their homes participated in festive events and had fun. 13-year-old Haley Dunn was no exception. For Christmas, she was given a new iPad, which she was very happy about. Haley lived with her mom, Billy, and her boyfriend Sean and older brother dated. Her mother divorced her own father named Clint when the girl was 10 years old, but they never stopped communicating. In fact, her father lived literally across the street from Haley's house, so they saw each. Other almost every day, the girl was very close to her father and tried as often as possible to spend time with him. Family and friends described the girl as cheerful, funny, and energetic. She was a member of her school's cheerleading team, participated in athletics, and played the saxophone. Haley was also on three sports teams. On December 26th, the girl spent most of Christmas at her father's house, unwrapping presents. Afterwards, she came home, played video games, and went to bed. The next day, her stepfather and mother went to work. As usual, Billy left her cell phone at home so the children could contact her. Before she left, she peeked into her daughter's bedroom while she was still asleep. Sean was working in another town, which was about a half-hour drive away. According to him, he had an argument with his boss that day which resulted him being fired and leaving work just 10 minutes after he arrived. He then drove to his mother's house, spent some time there, and returned to Colorado City about 3 p.m. In the evening, Sean went to pick up Billy from work. When they arrived home, Billy noticed that her daughter wasn't home. Sean told her that the girl had gone into his room that afternoon and told him she was going to her father's house. After that, she planned to go to a friend's house and spend the night. Haley often stayed overnight at her friend's houses so her mother took this information. Calmly, small towns like this often have the illusion of safety, so parents are less worried that something might happen to their child. The next day, December 28th, Haley never came home. Billy decided to call the parents of a friend at whose house her daughter was supposed to spend the night. To her mother's surprise, they weren't even aware that Haley had planned to spend the night at their house. She hadn't shown up. It was further revealed that the girl hadn't even stopped by her father's house. Then, Billy got worried and decided to ask her neighbors if they had seen her daughter. She went door to door, and number one had seen the girl that day. Around 2 p.m., Billy went to the police, but they decided to take easiest route. The police's main theory was that she had run away from home, which initially hurt the Investigation, a voluntary escape is not investigated on the same level as a missing minor. They searched Billy and Clint's homes and brought search dogs to the scene the next day. They picked up Haley's trail from the house to a local motel. It was very strange. None of the motel employees had seen this girl. 
She wasn't on any security cameras and a full search of the building yielded no results. Trained dogs pointed to a motel, but the girl apparently never showed up there. As news of Haley's disappearance spread through the city, dozens of concerned people joined the search. Some looked around the area, others printed and handed out flyers, and here we come to another strange moment. Clint, the girl's own father, practically never left the street. He looked in every corner, looked in every possible nook and cranny, even looked in dumpsters. According to him, he just couldn't sit at home and wait. Meanwhile, Billy and Sean were not so enthusiastic. The mother handed out flyers, but refused to go around the neighborhood looking for her daughter. She explained that searching gave her the impression that they were already looking for her body and that there was no chance of finding the girl alive. As for Sean, he took absolutely no part, but that's not the strangest thing either. On December 31st, for days after the girl went missing, Billy and Sean threw a New Year's Eve party. They had friends over, listening to music, drinking, and partying. Such behavior on the part of a mother whose daughter had disappeared without a trace seemed simply absurd. On January 3rd, a week after Haley's disappearance, the police finally officially declared her missing. This meant that more serious agencies such as the FBI and the Texas Rangers could become involved. And so it happened. Representatives of these agencies arrived in Colorado City and began their investigation. Volunteers continued to the area and more than a hundred billboards were posted throughout Texas and beyond about the missing girl. Detectives completely ruled out the possibility of an escape. For one thing, they could find no reason why Haley would choose to take such a step. The day before her disappearance, she had been in a fine mood. And for the rest of the time, the girl showed no signs that might indicate a tendency to run away. Secondly, absolutely all her belongings were left in the room. If the girl had decided to run away, she must have taken something with her. The detectives quickly realized that they should take a closer look at Billy and Sean. Their passive attitude toward the girl's search and the New Year's Eve party made one seriously wonder if they cared about Haley. Detectives discovered that on December 27th, the same day Haley allegedly spent the night at a friend's house, Sean and Billy had withdrawn $140 from their bank cards. They admitted that the money was used to purchase illegal substances, which the couple had taken that evening, taking advantage of the absence of their children from home. On January 6th, it was reported that police had questioned Billy and Sean using a polygraph. The results were very interesting. Billy failed on two attempts. During the first interrogation, she was under the influence of substances, and the second result showed her lying. Sean also failed two interrogations, and from the third, he simply walked away before he even finished answering the questions. And after that, Billy suspected that Sean might be involved in her daughter's disappearance and demanded that he move out of her home. On January 12th, police officially announced that Sean was being treated as a suspect. Several facts helped them come to this conclusion. First, it became known that the couple's relationship had been strained at times. During some of their arguments, Sean had threatened Billy and her daughter with violence. Secondly, among his belongings were found many sheets on which was printed information about serial killers. It later turned out that he and Billy had taken an interest in similar topics together. Next, the police examined the geolocation data from Sean's phone and found that his account of the day Haley disappeared did not match reality. He did arrive at work where he stayed for 10 minutes except that afterwards, Sean didn't go to his mother's house as he had said before, but headed back to Colorado City, to Billy's house. It wasn't until some time later that he drove to his mother's house. Here is worth bearing in mind that the police tracked the phone so vassal towers, which have a range of several miles, so detectives could only roughly estimate where Sean might have been. On top of that, it turned out that he wasn't fired. He left on his own initiative. The man arrived at work, told his bosses he was leaving, and headed back to Colorado City. After interviewing Haley's friends and other acquaintances, detectives found even creepier details. The girl repeatedly spoke of being afraid of Sean. Haley admitted to her best friend that she preferred to spend time outside or at friends' houses because she didn't feel safe around Sean. She once told her grandmother that she often saw Sean standing in front of her bedroom door in the middle of the night. 
Each time, she was afraid he would come into the room. Soon, the police became aware of a conversation with Haley's uncle. Discussing the girl's disappearance, her uncle said roughly the following, I can't believe. Anyone would hurt a child. Sean's response was extremely strange. He said, it's like killing a deer. With all this information in hand, the detectives concluded that Haley had not lived in the most prosperous family. Her mother and stepfather often drank and used illegal substances and threw parties. Sean's behavior seemed highly suspicious, but there was no direct evidence against him. Eventually, the police contacted Child Welfare, who made the decision to remove Haley's older brother. On February 24, police searched the house in which Sean lived with Billy, as well as his mother's house. A huge discovery awaited them. They found more than 100,000 obscene images of minors on a removable drive and hard drive. The police also seized his laptop, but apparently didn't have time to examine its contents. Sean's father came to the station and demanded his son's equipment back. It is not known for what reason, but the police did, but that is not the most interesting part. Sean received no punishment for so much illegal material on his computer on March. 17. Police officers went to Billy's house to ask Sean some questions. A woman opened the door and said he wasn't home, but the officer showed her a prearranged warrant and entered the premises, finding Sean hiding there. For concealing a suspect, Billy received 90 days in jail and a year of corrections time. She was sent to a correctional facility in Travis County. Upon her release, she stayed in the area with Sean. In 2012, however, the couple finally broke up. Billy began to seriously think that Sean might be involved in her daughter's disappearance. Since then, the case had effectively stalled. The police had no new evidence. Volunteers could find no trace of the girl. This continued until March 16, 2013 when a hiker discovered human remains near Lake J. B. Thomas in Scary County. And experts conducted the necessary tests and determined that the remains belonged to Haley Dunn. Her body was about 20 miles from her home. Police have not disclosed the cause of death, but sources say it could be blunt force. Trauma. After the discovery of the body, the investigation boiled over again. Authorities offered a $15,000 reward for any information leading to the capture of the culprit. Their eyes turned back to Sean, but nothing had changed since the girl disappeared. The police simply didn't have direct evidence against him, but they had circumstantial evidence. The girl's body had been found only a few miles from Sean's mother's house that matched the geolocation data on his phone because they are determined by the towers. Given such a short distance, Sean could very well have left the body in said area, and number one would have known about it. Moreover, he grew up in the area and could easily orientate where it was best to hide the body. But the investigators could not find any other clues and the case was frozen again for many years. Despite this, the girl's family had to wait four years to bury her remains. A memorial service was held in January 2017. In 2018, Haley's father, Clint, said he believed Sean and Billy were guilty. In his version, his mother either helped cover up the truth or was directly involved in the murder. In the same year, he began giving numerous interviews and tried to actively publicize the case. The man said that in the early years of the investigation, he tried not to pester the police with constant questions, but his patience had run out. The detectives did little to investigate and his last hope was to spread the word widely. In an effort to bring the perpetrators to justice, and it did pay off. In 2019, an unknown person wrote to Clint and told him that in 2011, he had found several items that might have belonged to Haley. At the time, this person was in high school and hadn't heard about the missing girl, so it didn't even occur to him to report his find to the police. True, information about the items has not yet been disclosed. The police have not disclosed what the items are. Clint only mentioned that they were found in an area that had been repeatedly combed by volunteers and police. Some time later, new information emerged. Private investigator Erica Moore, who was handling the Haley case and kept in touch, with Clint, presented some very creepy information related to Sean. In October 20, 19, she began receiving messages from various women in Texas. They all said they were being harassed online in an aggressive manner by a man, registered under the name Casey. 
Not only was he harassing them with lewd messages, but he was also sending them explicit photos and videos of himself. Given that Sean had the same middle name, Erica asked the women to send her photos and videos of the man sending the girls. Her theory was confirmed. It really was Sean. She persuaded one woman to go to the police station and file a report on Sean, but they refused to press charges and even accused the woman of falsifying the facts. Erica's plan was simple. She was convinced that Sean was involved in Haley's death. Given that the police couldn't arrest him for it, the story of stalking women on the internet could have put a potentially dangerous criminal behind bars at least for a while. But that plan didn't work. The case went quiet again until something really unexpected happened in May 20, 21. Erica and Clint were invited to the district attorney's office for an urgent talk. There, they received the long-awaited announcement. Hagley's killer would be arrested in June. Of course, this information was not disclosed after the meeting. It was kept secret until June 14, 2021, when after 10 years of waiting, the arrest finally happened. Police took Sean into custody and charged him with the murder of Haley. He is currently in bail awaiting trial on $20 million bail. But police are still not disclosing what new evidence allowed them to make this arrest. Apparently, this information is being kept secret until the trial. All we know now is that shortly before the arrest, the police received permission to take a DNA sample from Sean. There may be some connection here to Haley's belongings, which were found back in 2011. Upon learning of her ex-boyfriend's arrest, Billy made a very strange statement. She said she wasn't the least bit surprised that Sean was involved in the murder and added that she wanted to believe in his innocence until the last minute. She also thanked God that the man would now be punished for what he had done which Billy herself had actively obstructed during the early investigation defending. Sean, a date for the trial is to be announced in the near future. At this point, it's hard to say whether a conviction will be obtained. It will depend solely on the significance of the evidence that police are now withholding. In any case, Sean spent more than 10 years at large, even though everything pointed to his involvement in the murder. Haley's complaints to friends and relatives, forbidden materials with children, and constant lies during interrogations. The man looked suspicious on all sides. As for Billy, she initially showed no desire to get justice for her daughter. Clint, unlike her, put forth his best efforts and got his way. Erica Moore in one interview hinted that the case would not have been solved without his active participation. She didn't give any details, but here again, we can remember the story of Haley's found. Objects. The person who discovered them only found out about the whole story thanks to Clint's social media posts. More details of this case, and most importantly, a court decision are sure to come our way in the near future. Right now, all indications are that Sean could really get a conviction and in Texas that would mean only one thing, a guaranteed death penalty for what he did to the child. Too bad there's no way this is going to help Haley Dunn live a long and happy life. Number 5. A 16-year-old girl who lived in the same house as her parents and younger sisters had gone to sleep in her room, and in the morning she was found dead. The police immediately realized they were dealing with the murder, but none of her relatives heard anything that night. It took 31 years to finally solve the case, but number one was prepared for this turn of events. Fawn Cox was born March 20, 4, 1973 in Kansas City, Missouri. Her parents soon had two more daughters. The family lived in a small two-story house located in a rough residential neighborhood. From an early age, she helped her parents take care of the younger children, went to church regularly, and enjoyed swimming. When she turned 16, Fawn got a part-time job at a local amusement park. Her family lived quite poor, and the girls sought to earn at least some money in her spare time from school. She spent most of the summer vacations of 1989 at work. Mostly, the girls stood behind the cash register and sold tickets to amusement rides. On Wednesday, July 26th, she finished her shift at about 10 p.m. Her mother and younger sister picked her up in the car as it would have taken a long time to get from the park to her home on public transportation. Almost immediately after returning home, Fawn went to bed since she had to go to work again the next morning. The girl slept on the second floor. She had her own room. Her sisters usually slept in the next room. But that night, she was alone on the floor. 
Her sister Amber, who was only a year younger, was babysitting for a familiar family. That night, the other sister, Felicia, decided to sleep on the first floor because it was much cooler. There, it was a very hot night, and the only air conditioner working was downstairs, and there, parents also slept on the first floor. The next morning at about 9 o'clock, the whole family woke up to the sound of the alarm clock in Fawn's room, but the girl wouldn't turn it off for some reason. Then her younger sister and mother went up to her room, where a horrible sight awaited them. Fawn lay on the bed with no sign of life, her neck visibly bruised. The girl also had no pulse, and her parents immediately called an ambulance, but they were no longer able to help her. It was apparent that Fawn had passed away hours before. After examining her body, medical experts determined this triangulation was the cause of death, and the girl had also been abused. From the first hours, the police realized they had a very difficult investigation ahead of them. Despite the fact that Fawn was killed right in her room in a small house with very poor soundproofing, her parents and sister heard absolutely nothing. However, there was an explanation. The air conditioner on the first floor was old and very loud, blocking out any other noise. In the house, the only strange thing that night was noticed by Fawn's sister. Their poodle was behaving anxiously and barking, but they did not pay much attention to it. This behavior was attributed to the fact that the dog was pregnant. After examining the scene, the police made several important discoveries. Their theory was that the attacker or group had entered the house through a second story window overlooking the backyard. There was an old trailer park near the house that could easily be used to climb up to. The canopy of the outbuilding, which was almost level with the window. The window itself had been left open because there was no air conditioning on the second floor and one had to fight the heat somehow. In Fawn's room, the experts found the first important clues, a few short hairs, small bloodstains, and traces of semen on the sheet from her bed. All of this was sent to the lab for analysis. In addition, several items were missing from the house, including radios, a Nintendo, game console, and a stereo recorder. The several other items were found on the ground in front of the house. It looked as if the burglar had thrown them out the window to take them with him, but left them there. For some reason, detectives also found that various items had been removed from a closet in an adjoining room on the second floor. They believed the perpetrator was hiding in that closet while waiting for everyone in the house to go to sleep. Normally, Fawn's sister slept in that room, but not that night. For this reason, number one noticed the items on display. The police discovered another strange clue. An old army cap was found in Fawn's room. All her relatives said they had never seen the girl wearing it, so detectives assumed the killer might have forgotten the cap at the scene. Despite the impressive array of evidence, police were unable to quickly identify the suspects. The problem is that in 1989, DNA forensics was rather underdeveloped, and there were no common genetic databases at that time. Detective Benjamin Caldwell, who handled the case, put forward the main version of what happened. In his opinion, there could have been several assailants, and they must have known the house well. Not only did they know how to get to the second floor through the backyard in total darkness, but they must also have known the layout of the rooms. The next step for the police was to look for witnesses. They interviewed neighbors, friends, and relatives of Fawn, but all were inconclusive. The detectives had one weighty problem before them. The neighborhood in which the house was located was very poor and criminal. Various criminal gangs separated there, and their participants were quite difficult to bring to justice. A month after Fawn's murder, the case finally got off the ground. The police had a witness who pointed them to three suspects. This witness knew a number of important details that the police never divulged, so his story was taken seriously. The suspects were three teenagers, one of whom was in the same class as Vaughn. They were arrested and questioned, but the boys denied any involvement in the murder. During a search of one of their homes, police found items stolen from the victim's room. This was enough to charge all three of them with murder, but even here, the detectives were disappointed. First, the witness suddenly recanted and stopped cooperating with the police. Second, DNA analysis of blood, hair, and semen found at the crime scene did not show an unambiguous match with the suspect's samples. In those years, experts could not yet establish an exact match of the samples and all. 
their test showed questionable results. In other words, the analysis could not confirm either a full match or a guaranteed mismatch. Despite this, the police were able to obtain useful information from one of the detainees. During one of the interrogations, he confessed that he had indeed broken into Fott's house that night in the company of other boys and stolen some things. He painted how he made his way to the second floor through the canopy of the canopy and even revealed unknown details. According to him, when he threw a tape recorder out the window, its handle fell off. The boy hid it under a nearby bush, and the police did find the item in that very spot. Except that the young man quickly retracted his statement and no longer cooperated. With the investigation, which would have prevented his confession from being used in court. Because of this, the police had to let the men go, and the investigation was at a standstill again. Most likely, the witnesses were simply intimidated, but without their testimony in court. The case had almost no chance. All we know is that one of them spent eight months in jail for stealing items from Fonts. House. The case has since gone into a long drawer. The police didn't reopen the investigation until the early 2000s. And the first thing they did was upload DNA samples from the crime scene to the CODIS database. It had been created several years before and contained DNA samples from people tried for serious crimes. Unfortunately, no matches were found for the Fawn killer. The emergence of this database was the result of major scientific advances in the study of DNA. It also allowed police to recollect DNA samples from the three original suspects and conduct more advanced tests. This time, experts unequivocally determined that the hair semen and blood did not belong to any of them. This was rather odd given the fact that the suspects were found in possession of fonts, belongings. Detectives speculated that the three guys had indeed robbed her house at night, but was another man with them. He was the one who had abused and killed the girl. All of this raised even more questions. Could it be that four criminals entered the house unnoticed, killed Fawn, and just as unnoticed left the scene of the crime? The police still had no answer to this question. Since then, the case has once again stalled. With each passing year, the Fawn family believed less and less that the murder would ever be solved. They continued to believe that those three suspects had been in their house at night and could point to the killer, but would never do so. The only thing that could help them learn the truth was a DNA sample stored in the police lab. In 2018, something interesting happened. Amber, Fawn's younger sister, revealed some disturbing details about the crime. She put her thoughts and facts unknown to the police on a popular American forum for unsolved crimes. Over the 20 years of its existence, the forum had gained a very reliable reputation and, as participants have helped the police solve several high-profile cases, Amber has been verified and confirmed that she really is who she says she is, so her post is worthy of attention. She herself worked as a nanny from Monday to Friday and was only at home during the day. On weekends, the girl slept in the very room on the second floor through which the burglars had snuck in. Accordingly, the criminals would have been immediately spotted. In addition, they would have watched the house and waited until Fawn's mother and her younger sister went to pick up the girl from work. Despite all this, Amber's story didn't bring the case any closer to solving it. But it was already 2018, and the science of DNA research had come a long way. Dozens, if not hundreds of long-forgotten cases were being solved, thanks to new analysis tools. Fawn's relatives saw it all and resented why the police were in no hurry to reopen the murder investigation. They kept talking to detectives about the case, and each time they got the same. Answer, extended DNA testing requires money, and the police have dozens of cases. For that reason, the relatives were left to wait for their turn and funding to come in. But they decided to take the initiative and launched a fundraiser in 2019. The family wanted to cover the full cost of the DNA samples and also offered a $10,000 reward for any information that would lead to the perpetrator's capture. Due to the extensive media coverage of the case and numerous interviews given by the family, many people who cared respond to request for help. The family quickly collected the necessary amount of money. But even here, they were disappointed. The police department refused to initiate this investigation at the expense of the relatives of the victim. The lead detective explained that there was bound to be a big problem in such a situation. 
If the relatives of one victim could pay for such tests and expedite the results, then hundreds of other families who have been searching for years for the murder of their loved ones should have the same right. But it is simply impossible to implement such a thing in practice. Since only a few laboratories in the world conduct innovative DNA tests, and with such a simultaneous influx of those wishing to do so, their resources are simply not enough. The leading company in this field is Parabon Nanolabs, which we have already repeatedly mentioned in the other reels. They have made tremendous progress in the study of DNA from finding a person's relatives from the smallest genetic samples to creating an approximate portrait of the owner of the DNA. It was this lab that was to take over the study of the samples left in Font Bedroom the night she was murdered. The girl's relatives believed that the police were in no hurry to pursue their case for another reason. They were a poor family from a bad neighborhood, and murder was not a priority for investigators there. In an interview, Sister Fawn said that if it had been a murder of a family of rich or high, ranking people, all the necessary investigations would have been done instantly. Unfortunately, they never managed to expedite the process, and it wasn't until late 20. 20 that the long-awaited breakthrough happened, but the family wasn't ready for that. Kind of truth. With funding from the FBI, the police did send samples from Vaughn's room to a lab. There, they began a detailed examination of the DN and a search for possible relative of its possessors. It was the semen sample found at the murder scene that they mostly worked within. November 20th, 20, they are finally able to find the person to whom that DNA belonged. It turned out to be Fawn's cousin, Donald's Cox. Of course, such news shocked the whole family. At the time of Fawn's death, Donald was 21 years old, and number one had even considered his possible involvement. That said, Donald was a pretty troubled man and was constantly behind bars. He was tried for misdemeanors such as theft and possession of illegal substances. Unfortunately, in those years, they did not yet take a DNA sample from such criminals. Otherwise, this case would have been solved much earlier. Donald died of an overdose in 2006, but the police investigated his death because certain circumstances seemed suspicious to them. It was because of that investigation that a sample of his DNA was preserved, but it was not entered into the FBI database because the man in that case was a victim, not a perpetrator. Once the experts informed the police of their discovery, they matched the Sam with a semen found at the murder scene and got a 100% match. Despite the gravity of this discovery, the relatives have received an answer to a question that has plagued them for 31 years, but there remained one very important point in the whole story. A great deal of evidence indicated that the three original suspects had also been in the Fawn house that night. It was now becoming clear how the perpetrators knew the house and the family's routines so precisely. Donald was a frequent visitor and knew all these nuances. However, the police closed the case, and no new charges were filed against the three men. Sister Fawn said she saw no point in trying to get a confession out of them, even though the men had been present in the house at night. They may not have even witnessed the murder itself. Donald may well have stayed in the house alone and only then attacked Fawn, Felicia, added that the three suspects had already paid for their act. Throughout this time, while the case remained unsolved, the entire neighborhood was 100% certain of their guilt. Because of this, they were treated very negatively, with all the consequences that would follow. According to Sister Fawn, their lives were effectively ruined. In addition, after the case was closed, it turned out that the police had originally learned about the suspects from the family of one of them. Relatives noticed a Nintendo set box among his belongings and remembered that this was the one that had been stolen from Fuan's house. It was on the news and everyone in the neighborhood already knew the details. In any case, it is simply impossible to prove their guilt. And the relatives of the victim finally know the name of the killer. He lived for 17 years without any punishment for what he had done and all that time. As if nothing had happened, communicated with his family, but eventually his addiction to illegal substances drove him to his grave, and he was no longer a threat to anyone. Share your opinion on this story in the comments. At 42, she had spent her entire adult life locked in a basement cellar and used as a sex slave by her own father, who raped her over 3,000 times and fathered seven of her children, one of whom even died due to neglect. This is the story of Elizabeth Fritzel that shocked the whole world.
The horrific story unfolded in 2008 in a small Austrian town and inspired a hit US movie. But the true story of Elizabeth and her surviving six children is far more chilling than any fiction could ever be. With a warning of adults and triggering content ahead, we take you through the frightening events of this case in this video. Let us start the story with some background on Elizabeth's father, the Austrian pensioner, Joseph Fritzl. He was an oppressive patriarchal figure in the family, and the fact that his daughter wanted to go out with friends, party, kiss her boyfriends, and live her life bothered him to such an extent that he eventually used criminal means to put chains around her. Joseph's grandfather had been married to a woman who couldn't conceive children. Because of this, the grandfather would have affairs with other women and then coerce his wife into adopting the children they bore. Yosef's mother was one of those children whom a trial lawyer described as unloving and sadistic. It's common that child abusers have often suffered child abuse themselves, and the people who mistreat others have often been treated in various ways themselves. This is no excuse or justification for the monstrous acts of Yosef, but just speculation on what could have triggered his descent into pure evil. Monsters are not created overnight. They are bred and fed over the generations. With that in mind, let us look at what happened to Elizabeth Fritzl during those 24 years in the basement and how it all began. On August 28, 1984, 18-year-old Elizabeth Fritzl went missing. Frantic over the whereabouts of her daughter, Rosemary hastily filed a missing persons report. For weeks, there was no word from Elizabeth, and her parents were left to assume the worst. Then out of nowhere, a letter arrived from Elizabeth claiming that she had grown tired of her family life and ran away. Her father, Joseph, told the policeman who came to the house that he had no idea where she would go. He told the police that she had most likely joined a religious cult, something she had talked about previously. But the truth was that Joseph Fritzl knew exactly where his daughter was. She was about 20 feet below where the police office was standing. Elizabeth was a girl full of dreams and aspirations, and she grew tired of her father consistently imposing harsh restrictions on her. She had previously expressed to her mother and her sister about her interest in leaving the family, traveling around the country, and starting a new life on her own as soon as she turned 18. Yosef overheard this conversation and decided to do something about it. On August 28, 1984, Yosef called his daughter into the basement of the family's home. He was refitting a door to the newly renovated cellar and needed help carrying it. As Elizabeth held the door, Yosef fixed it into place. As soon as it was on the hinges, he swung it open, forcing Elizabeth inside and knocking her unconscious with an ether-soaked towel. For the next 24 years, the inside of the dirt-walled cellar would be the only thing Elizabeth Fritzl would see. Her father would lie to her mother and the police, feeding them stories about how she had run away and joined a cult. Eventually, the police investigation into her whereabouts would run cold, and for a long time, the world would forget about the missing Fritzl girl. But Joseph Fritzl wouldn't forget, and over the next 24 years, he would make that very clear to his daughter. For the rest of the Fritzl family, Joseph was a hard-working husband and father, thoroughly dedicated to his career. For them, he would head down to the basement every morning at 9 a.m. to draw plans for the jeans that he sold and occasionally, he would spend the night there. Joseph's wife never doubted the actions or intentions of her husband since she didn't know what disgusting acts were happening right beneath her feet. At the minimum, Joseph would visit his daughter in the basement three times a week, usually every day. For the first two years, he left her alone in captivity. Then he began to rape her, continuing the nightly visits he had begun when she had not even entered the adult phase of her life. Two years into her captivity, Elizabeth became pregnant and miscarried 10 weeks into the pregnancy. Two years later, she fell pregnant again, this time carrying to term. In August of 1988, a baby girl named Kirsten was born, and two years later, she gave birth to another baby boy named Stefan. Kirsten and Stefan remained in the cellar with their mother for the duration of her imprisonment, and Joseph brought weekly rations of food and water for them. Elizabeth attempted to teach them with the rudimentary education she herself had and gave them the most normal life she could under terrific circumstances. Over the next 24 years, Elizabeth Fritzl gave birth to five more children. Point one more was allowed to remain in the basement with her. One died shortly after birth, and the other three were taken upstairs to live with Rosemary and Joseph. In order to conceal what he was doing from Rosemary, he staged elaborate discoveries of the children. 
He often placed them on bushes near the home or sometimes on the doorstep. Each time, the child was swaddled neatly and accompanied by a note allegedly written by Sabbath, claiming that she couldn't take care of the baby and was leaving it with her parents for safekeeping. Shockingly, social services never questioned the appearance of the children and allowed the Fritz cells to keep them as their own children. Officials, on the other hand, remained under the impression that Rosemary and Joseph were the baby's grandparents. It is not known for how long Joseph Fritzl intended to keep his daughter captive in his basement. He had gotten away with it for 24 years. And for all the police knew, he was going to continue probably for another 24. However, in 2008, one of the children in the cellar fell ill. Elizabeth begged her father to allow her 19-year-old daughter Kirsten to get medical attention. She had fallen rapidly and critically ill, and Elizabeth was beside herself. Grudgingly, Joseph agreed to take her to a hospital. He removed Kirsten from the cellar and called an ambulance, claiming that he had a note from Kristen's mother explaining her condition. The police eventually grew suspicious of Joseph and reopened the investigation into Elizabeth Fritzl's disappearance. They began to read the letters that Elizabeth had supposedly been leaving for the Fritzels and began to see inconsistencies in them. Police questioned Kirsten and also asked the public for any information on her family. Naturally, no one came forward, as there was no family to speak of. Whether Joseph finally felt pressure or had a change of heart regarding his daughter's captivity, the world may never know. But on April 26, 2008, he released Elizabeth from the cellar for the first time in 24 years. She immediately went to the hospital to see her daughter, where hospital staff alerted police to her suspicious arrival. That night, she was taken into custody to be questioned about her daughter's illness and her father's story. After making the police promise that she never had to see her father again, Elizabeth Fritzl told the tale of her 24-year imprisonment. She explained that her father kept her in the basement and that she bore his seven children. She explained that Joseph was the father of all seven of them, and that Joseph Fritzl would come down during the night, make her watch pornographic films, and then rape her. She explained that he had been abusing her ever since she was 11. The police arrested Joseph Fritzl that very same night. After the arrest, the children in the cellar were also released, and Rosemary Fritzl fled the home. She had allegedly known nothing about the events taking place right under her feet, and Joseph backed up her story. The tenants who had lived in the apartment on the first floor of the Fritzl home also never knew what was happening right beneath them. As Sio Seth had explained away all the sounds by blaming faulty piping and a noisy heater. Prior to his trial, Joseph confessed to the repeated rapes, claiming that the rape of his daughter was an addiction and the redirection of incestuous feelings he felt towards his own mother. He also claimed to be a loving, attentive father to the children he sired in the basement, bringing them books and stuffed animals, watching videos, and eating dinner with the children just like a family. At the trial, the father admitted guilt on an incest charge, but pleaded innocent to enslavement and to the murder of his child. After he saw Elizabeth's taped testimony, he changed his plea to full guilt, acknowledging that his failure to care for medical care for the newborn may have directly contributed to the death. For his crimes, Fritzl was found guilty on all counts, negligent murder, enslavement, incest, rape, coercion, and false imprisonment. He was sentenced to life imprisonment in 2009. He has been in solitary confinement in Austria's Kremlin prison since that time. According to Austrian media, he now suffers from dementia, and none of his family has visited during his decade behind bars. Today, Elizabeth Fritzl lives under a new identity in a secret Austrian village known only as Village Acts. The home is under constant CCTV surveillance and police patrol every corner. The family doesn't allow interviews anywhere within their walls and has declined to give any information about themselves. Though she is now in her mid-50s, the last photo taken of her was when she was just 16 years of age. How do you form an intimate relationship after the people who are supposed to protect you have done so many horrible things to you? What do you guys think? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. This is the story of 9-year-old Marie Shirella and her family. The tragic story began on the morning of March 18, 1964. Marisha Varela, a quiet girl from Hazleton, Pennsylvania, enjoyed playing the organ and aspired to be a nun. One day, she set out to bring some canned goods to her teacher at St. Joseph's Parochial School. She then later planned to attend the morning mass. But Shavarella never made it back. 
She was last seen walking east on West 4th Street at 8.10 a.m. Reports claim that on the cold morning of March 18th, while Maurice was on her way back to the school, she was asked by the neighbors to come up and get warm. But Maurice refused as she had to get back to her teacher with the goods. Neither the neighbors nor Maurice could have anticipated that from that moment, Maurice and her obedience would be history for the next five and a half decades. Somewhere along her way, she crossed paths with evil at approximately 1 p.m. the same day. A man noticed what looked like a large doll in a coal mining waste pit. When he looked closely, the doll was actually Marie Chivarella. Her body was discovered north of Route 309 in Hazel Township close to the Hazelton Airport. The investigation revealed Maurice was physically and sexually assaulted, murdered, and left at the scene with all her clothing and personal belongings. Before dumping her in a coal mining waste pit, the killer bound, gagged, raped, and strangled her. The discovery of her body shocked the entire Hazelton community. It was a heartbreak that was felt by everyone in the town, especially by the children. Children who were Morris's age started to be afraid while they were alone or unescorted. The case changed the way people lived and how they approached their children's safety in the town. It didn't take long for the Pennsylvania State Police to begin their investigative efforts, which would ultimately last for decades. The authorities did not know that in this case, to even get a lead to work on, it would take years of grinding and scanning through databases. There were no lead suspects immediately after the killing. The police could not retrieve any useful evidence from Morris's body that could lead them to her killer. They had no idea that it would take them over 50 years to find a single lead in 2007. Investigators were able to develop a DNA profile of the suspect from fluids left on Chevalis' jacket, but the DNA didn't match any criminals in their system. They checked the database monthly against all other criminals that had DNA in the system, but there was no successful match. Then in 2019, police tried a different approach and uploaded DNA from Shavar Alice Jacket to the genealogical database. This time, there was a match, but to what appeared to be a very distant relative. The DNA match was insufficient to get the relative into custody or charge him with murder. To generate public interest and garner leads in the case, in 2018, Pennsylvania State Police used technology provided by Paraben Nano Labs to generate a snapshot phenotype facial prediction of the suspect from his DNA. The technology generated possible photos of the suspect at 25, 40, and 60. The pictures generated were released in the public domain. Unfortunately, no witnesses came out with any leads that could lead to Morris's killer. This was at a time when even Morris's parents had died. They did not live enough to see what would unfold in Morris's mystery ahead. Her siblings had said that her parents never sought revenge or punishment for their daughter's killer. They just wanted justice, but they did not make it alive to the other end of this investigation. Finally, in 2020, the police got help from an unlikely source. An 18-year-old named Eric Schubert emailed the department and offered to build out a family tree. He had volunteered with other cold cases before, and police accepted his help since Eric was known as a hard-working boy and a genius genealogy wizard. Schubert identified a number of family members, many of whom voluntarily shared their DNA with the police. The family tree eventually led the police to Moore Chivarella's killer, James Paul Fort. Fort was 22 years of age back then, and he had a criminal history of sexual assaults prior to Chivarella's killing. A lot of emotions surfaced as state police announced they now know who killed a nine-year-old girl back in 1964. Unfortunately, police could not prosecute Fort because he had already died in 1980, and the cause of his death had been a heart attack. Police exhumed his body in January 2022. They found out a month later that his DNA was a match to the fluids left on Shavar's jacket. This information was released to the press in a press conference by Pennsylvania police, which left for more than an hour for Chivarella's surviving family. The news was bittersweet. Her sister Carmen Marie Radke stated that their family will always feel the emptiness and the sorrow of Marissa's absence. She added further that they will continue to ask themselves what would have been or could have been on that fateful day. Her family also went ahead and praised the persistent effort of Pennsylvania State Police because now they have gotten closure and a sense of being at peace with Morris's murder and the determination of the Pennsylvania police to solve this case was applaudable. They left no stone unturned to find out who the killer was, and this was also a success story of a 19-year-old Eric Schubert, 
who utilized his genius for very right purposes. But the question here still remains. After five and a half decades into the investigation, when the killer was already buried in his grave, was justice actually served to Maurice and her family? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. This is the story of Paulette Gebrefera. It's every parent's worst nightmare to put their child to sleep at night and then find them vanish before daybreak. Well, that's exactly what happened to Paulette Gebrefera. The worst part was that she was unexpectedly found between something no one ever thought about. Paulette Gebrefera was four years old when she disappeared from her house on March 22, 2010. The case became prominent because she lived in one of the most upscale neighborhoods in Mexico, Hewis Calucan. She had recently returned from a trip with her father, Mauricio Gubera, and sister. But her mother, Lizette Farah, had gone on a trip with her friend, Amanda de la Rosa, her lover, and multiple other men. Suspicions of her infidelity made Lizette the prime suspect in the case. The case became even more complicated when the family and two housekeepers provided inconsistent statements to the authorities. Paulette was born with both a physical disability and a language disorder and had two nannies who helped care for her, Erica and Martha Casimiro. The family was considered relatively affluent. Paulette's father, Morisha Gubera, worked in real estate while her mom, Lizette Farah, was an attorney. One evening in 2010, Lizette claimed she had put her little girl to bed as normal, but when her nanny Erica came into her room the next morning, the little girl was nowhere to be seen. There were no signs of forced entry into the house or any indication that a struggle had taken place. The CCTV cameras surrounding the property where Paulette Gubra Farah lived failed to show either when the child was leaving or being taken. The house had two family dogs that never made any noise during the night either. Where could the four-year-old have gone without a single trace? This story quickly turned into a media frenzy. Flyers were posted, billboards were erected, and ads were all over the TV and on public transport. Lizette even made a public plea on television for her daughter's abductor to come forward. The search sparked a great deal of public interest, but soon, many started placing the blame on Paulette's parents. The local community all came together to search for Paulette, but nothing was found. Alberta Buzzbuzz, the Attorney General of the state, became involved and launched what would become a huge nine-day intensive search investigation. His involvement became the initial controversy. Many children are said to be reported missing in Mexico, but it wasn't until Paulette Gubra Farah, from a richer family, went missing that authorities put all their resources into finding her. Ultimately, police were baffled and found it very difficult to find the lead. What followed was the huge nine-day search with the community coming together to begin a tireless hunt for the little girl. A week after the disappearance of Paulette, it was announced that her parents and nannies were taken into custody. The first suspect identified in the case was Lizette. The stories which Paulette's parents and the nannies shared had inconsistencies, and the media and public began to become suspicious. This is when a shocking revelation came to light. According to a Mexican news report, Zocalo, there were some undercover recordings of Paulette's parents and their other daughter found. This contained a conversation that sounded like Lizette, how her daughter not to admit anything to the investigators, otherwise, she'd get in trouble. Was she responsible for the disappearance of Paulette? However, Lizette claimed she was taken out of context. Both of Paulette's nannies, Erica and Martha Casimiro, claimed that the girl's parents seemed unconcerned while everyone was frantically searching for her. Even Lizette's media appearances made people uncomfortable. Her cold nature made people wonder if she was the one responsible for the death of her daughter. It was revealed that Lizette could have had a personality or mental disorder. According to Sandra Adam, a legal psychiatric expert working with investigators, Lizette has always remained very distant in matters of affection and emotional attachment. In short, some characteristics pointed toward a mental disorder. A further twist in this story was that when Paulette, who had gone missing for nine days, was somehow found in the same bedroom in which she was sleeping before her disappearance. An officer in the case caught a whiff of a putrid smell. This led him to find where Paulette, the very bed from which she disappeared. On March 31, 2010, Paulette's body was finally found. It was a bizarre finding as she was tucked away at the foot of the bed. The autopsy, as reported by CNN, ruled that Paulette's death was an accident. 
as it was reported that she had seemingly rolled to the foot the bed and accidentally fell and lost herself in the gap between the mattress and footboard. She then suffocated to death. According to reports at the time, the autopsy showed that Paulette died via asphyxiation that obstructed the respiratory airways and compressed the abdominal thorax. There were no drugs or toxic substances found in her body or any signs of physical abuse. According to the San Diego Union Tribune, moreover, as Buzz believed that Paulette's body hadn't been moved. The position the child was in when she was found was the same as the position she was when she died. That is the original and final position is the same. He claimed in the Union Tribune, but conspiracy theories around Paulette's cause of death still abound. Someone noticed a pair of pajamas on top of the bed while Lizette was giving a TV interview before Paulette was found. When Paulette was discovered, she was wearing those same pajamas. It could be true that the girl had multiple pairs of the same pajamas, but the coincidence was still eerie. Conspiracy theorists, however, focused on how everyone managed to miss where Paulette's body was for nine long days. The police even brought in search dogs at one point. BBC reported that over 100 people had been in her room, searching for her. More disturbingly, friends and family had slept in her bed during that period, per the Union Tribune's report, and didn't notice anything. The only explanation given was that there was enough bedding and blankets to mask the smell of the decomposing body for nine days. But the nannies were adamant that they would have noticed disheveled bedding or any kind of evidence that the child had fallen in between the bed and frame. The public found it hard to believe that authorities had investigated Paulette's room multiple times and came up with nothing. Many still believe that because of the negative publicity and Busby's initial inclination to point fingers at Lizette and Mauricio, the parents were possibly involved in their little girl's death somehow. Lizette and Mauricio ended up turning on each other publicly. According to Mauricio, he said, The only thing I can say is that for me, it wasn't an accident. I can only speak for myself. In a separate interview with Tala Visa, Lizette cried and said she didn't understand why her husband would be suspicious of her and claimed investigators had possibly manipulated him to turn on her. They have played a lot with their minds. Maybe he didn't have enough trust in me because I have never doubted him, Lizette claimed. What do you think of this little girl's death? This is the story of a sociopathic 16-year-old girl with an antisocial personality disorder who plotted the murder of her family with her teenage lover and later went on to have sex with her accomplice while her house burned down to ashes. The crime was so unimaginable and ugly that it shook the whole nation, and every parent wanted to know what would make their children commit such a cruel act of violence. Erin Caffey, the daughter of Terry Caffey and Penny Caffey, came from a conservative and protective family. She had two little brothers, Matthew Cathy, 13 years old, and Tyler Cathy, 8 years old. Her family began homeschooling her when she was 13 after her family moved from Albuquerque, Texas, to Celeste, Texas, so that they could be closer to a conservative Baptist church where her parents worked as ministers while she sang in the choir. Her beautiful voice would sometimes move her audience and the church to tears. But for Aaron, Homeschooling was like an isolated existence for an otherwise social girl. She reportedly didn't have many friends, and her life was largely confined to the church and her parents' house, which she later tried to burn down. When Erin turned 16 in July 2007, she was allowed to work at the local Sonic. One of her co-workers observed that she was so sheltered, it was like she was seeing the world for the first time, and that was where she met her soon-to-be boyfriend, 18-year-old Charlie Wilkinson. He was a high school senior and known as hot-tempered, but he had never been arrested previously and had no serious discipline problems at school. This was the first pivotal moment in her life. The kind and sweet Aaron that her family and friends had known and loved so much slowly went away. Nobody knew it yet, but at that moment, other lives were changed forever. However, Aaron's parents did not approve of Charlie. He had given them an impression of a rude, arrogant, full 18-year-old. Although it's up for debate that these traits might have been more Aaron rather than Charlie. As time went on, Aaron and Charlie's relationship grew intense and more passionate. They didn't care what anybody else thought in regards to their relationship. They started spending more and more time together. It was almost like they became parts of each other. In fact, they had only been dating for a few months when Charlie presented Aaron with his grandmother's engagement ring. You know how it is to be young and in love. Your brain gets foggy. 
all common sense goes out of the window, and sometimes it's hard to see what is so clear to everyone else around you. As Erin began to shut off everyone from her life except Charlie, secluded herself from the rest of the church, and started to engage in inappropriate PDA, her parents also began picking these changes in her behavior. This absolutely infuriated Terry and Penny. And from then on, the Caffeys limited Aaron's time with Charlie to once a week, in their home and under their watch. Charlie had to leave home by 9 p.m., and Aaron could use her cell phone to talk to him only until 10 p.m. These restrictions made Aaron very furious, and she planned to run away with Charlie. In February, Aaron was grounded for talking to Charlie without permission and got her keys and phone taken away. Eventually, it all became clear to her parents that this relationship will continue to cause problems as long as it will go on. Penny put her foot down and asked Aaron to stop seeing Charlie. Allegedly, this was the moment when she decided that drastic steps were needed to be taken so that she and Charlie could finally be together with nobody around to disrupt them. Maybe this was the moment when seeds of a highly dangerous idea had taken root in Aaron's mind, and her parents, unaware of all these barbaric ideas that were making a home in Aaron's consciousness. Terry and Penny thought that with the imposition of grounding restrictions and ending their relationship, they had fulfilled their parental responsibilities. But they had no idea they were totally ignoring Aaron's increasing obsessive antisocial behavior and what it was going to lead to. And so came the early morning of March 1st, 2008, when the Caffey family could not see the sunrise. It was 2 a.m. in the morning when a loud bang of their bedroom door opening woke up Terry and Penny. The two little kids, Matthew and Tyler, were asleep in the rooms upstairs. The two intruders burst into the couple's bedroom and opened fire, shooting them several times. Bullets showered the bedroom, and before Terry and Penny could make out what was happening, they were shot multiple times on their bodies. It was a horror that they had not even thought of in their lives. To save Benny from the shots, Terry jumped on her and took two bullets straight on his face. Not only did they break and start shooting hysterically, but they also came in carrying two samurai-style swords. After Terry took blows on his face, he flung out of the bed, and the intruder shot Penny several times more. Then they shot Terry three more times in the back and once in the back of the leg. All in all, Terry took 11 shots on his body. Terry could not feel the right side of his body, and even when he tried to speak, nothing came out of his mouth. Then one of the killers took a sword and stabbed Penny in the neck, nearly decapitating her. This is the harrowing account of Terry Caffey's experience as he faced a horrific attack on his family. Terry began to panic as he thought of his children who were asleep, knowing that they would wake up to a nightmare. His attempt to get up was thwarted when he heard his son Matthew cry out pleading with someone named Charlie. It was revealed that Aaron's boyfriend, Charlie, along with his friend Charles Wade, was attempting to murder the entire family. Upon hearing Charlie's name mentioned by Matthew, Terry realized who was in the house and why. A gunshot rang out, and Terry, trying to get up, collapsed as blood rushed to his head. Matthew had been shot dead, and Tyler, the other son, rushed and hid in the closet. Wade found him, and both assailants took turns stabbing Tyler to death. Once they were sure they had killed everyone, Charlie and Wade set the house on fire with pocket lighters and fled the scene, leaving behind a horrific sight of a slaughtered family and a burning house. Despite the assailants' intentions for the entire family to die, Terry miraculously survived. He managed to crawl through the woods to a neighbor's house roughly two hours after the attack. When the neighbor, Tommy Gaston, called 911, Terry, bleeding from various wounds, was taken to East Texas Medical Center in Tyler and admitted to the critical care unit. In the ambulance, Terry named his daughter's boyfriend, Charlie Wilkinson, as the killer. Chief Deputy Commissioner Kurt Fisher realized that Charlie was a friend of his son and had even gone fishing and four-wheeling with him many times before. Fisher spotted Charlie's car parked outside Matthew Wade's trailer, the brother of Charlie's accomplice, Charles Wade. The detectives rushed to Matthew Wade's trailer, where they encountered a teenager named Grugly. As the officers entered the trailer, they discovered Wade and his girlfriend, both of whom were woken up by the officers. Fisher informed them that he needed to talk to Charlie Wilkinson. During the search, they found Charlie lying on a mattress, wearing only blue jeans, with a semi-automatic handgun on the floor beside him. Charlie was taken outside in handcuffs, and Fisher asked him about the attack. Charlie denied involvement, 
claiming he got drunk the night before and passed out. Upon further investigation, the officers found evidence linking Charlie to the crime scene, including blood-spattered clothing. Charlie was brought to the county jail, where he hung his head in silence. Fisher questioned him about his involvement, and Charlie maintained his innocence, asserting that he got drunk and passed out. The story continued to unfold, revealing that Aaron, initially claiming to be drugged, had lied about the events of that night. Despite her father's belief that Charlie sought revenge, Charlie's version of the story differed, stating that he did it for love rather than rage. As the investigation progressed, Charlie eventually disclosed his accomplices' names. Charles Wade and his girlfriend, Bobby Johnson, were promised $2,000 by Aaron within 24 hours. All four suspects, Charlie Wilkinson, Charles Wade, Aaron Cathy, and Wade's girlfriend, Bobby Johnson, were in police custody, and they were all talking. According to the boys, Bobby drove Charlie, Aaron, and Wade to Kathy's home. They wandered around the house for a long time before being scared away by the house's dog, which immediately started barking loudly. Aaron repeatedly called Charlie, forcing him to come back and kill his parents. She said she would bring the dog inside so it wouldn't wake anyone up. But as the boys hesitated, Aaron, in her pajamas, convinced them to continue. Bobby drove them to a cemetery where they sat for an hour and planned the murder of the Kathy family. Charlie tried to convince Aaron to run with him, but she insisted on permanently getting rid of them. Not just her parents, she wanted her little brothers killed too. As she put it, they were annoying. They drove back to the house again. This time, Aaron took care of the dog and sat in the car with Bobby outside the house, while her friends carried out the murder of her family inside. Once Aaron confirmed that her parents were gone, she gave Bobby and weighed the combination to the lockbox in which the money was kept. They also took $400 from Terry and Penny's wallets. As the plan was being executed, Aaron's words were, holy shit, that was awesome. She celebrated the death of her family by sleeping with their killer the same night. Aaron was under arrest but denied plotting the murder. She couldn't be questioned immediately as she was a minor, and she didn't agree to speak with investigators. So she wrote a statement claiming that she was forced by her boyfriend into this act, and she was just going along with it. Aaron was sent to a juvenile detention center where she was held on murder charges. On January 2, 2009, she was sentenced to two life sentences plus 25 years for capital murder. Charlie and Wade were sentenced to life imprisonment without any possibility of parole. Bobby, on the other hand, was sentenced to 40 years in prison. Terry Cathy, the only member of the Cathy family who survived that night except for Aaron, still visits his daughter's jail and fights for her early release. To this date, he cannot believe that his daughter could do such a thing, maybe because during those jail visits, Aaron has told him a different story of her innocence. Terry later went on to remarry and now has one more biological child and three adopted children. He even wrote a book on the horrors of that night. It's called The Terror by Night, The True Story. Aaron's case is no less than an alarm for mental health issues among teenagers, and this case goes to the extremes of it. Aaron showed extreme signs of antisocial personality disorder during all those years of her relationship with Charlie, but her parents didn't seem to notice the severity of symptoms. What do you guys think? Was this a case of bad parenting? A teenage romance gone wrong? Or a sociopath manipulating her boyfriend for her evil desires? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. The Lynn Family Murder The Lynn family lived in North Epping, New South Wales, Australia, and they were a proud family who had their needs met. The husband, Min Lynn, and his wife, Lily Lynn, ran a successful family-owned newsagent in Sydney. Min and Lily had three children, June Brenda, who was 15, Henry, who was 12, and Terry, who was 9. The Lynn family also had Lily's sister, Irene, living with the family. The family had a cordial relationship where everyone openly expressed whatever was on their mind. It was a family with no secrecy as they lived and worked together. Things were all smooth and rosy for the Lynn family before something unexpected happened, which ruined the family forever. During the early hours of one Saturday morning in July 2009, when the busy shop of Lynn's family didn't open for business, it was odd for almost everyone who knew the shop. However, Kathy, who was also Lily's sister and happened to work in the news agency, began to receive calls from curious customers about why the shop was locked. 
Upon hearing the situation, Kathy began to suspect something wasn't right with the shop being locked. This prompted Kathy and her husband, Robert She, to go check the home of Min and Lily. As they arrived at the Lin family residence in the quiet suburb of North Epping, the front door, which was usually locked, was unlocked. Kathy was beginning to feel frightened about the development. As she and her husband took steps forward, they could see sprinkles of blood here and there. They took a bold decision to be sure of whatever was happening or might have happened. They went upstairs to the bedroom, and what she found next was a horrifying scene that kept her shivering for some minutes. Both Min and Lily were drenched in a pool of blood, bludgeoned to death by a weapon later described as hammer-like. In the next room, they found Kathy and Lily's sister, Irene, with the same awful fate. Both Henry and Terry, Lily's young sons of 12 and 9 years old, were not spared either of this gruesome attack. They too were brutally murdered similarly to every other person in the house, in their bedroom. Blood splattered all over the walls of Lynn's house suggested that a great struggle had taken place before the gruesome attack. Kathy placed a call to the local police, informing them about the gruesome situation at the residence of the Lynn's. She could not utter her words fluently as she was shivering about her extended family who had just been horrifically murdered. The situation had a little twist here. Brenda, who was the only member of the Lynn's family, was spared as she was away on a school excursion in New Caledonia at the time of the gruesome attack. Brenda is still on the school excursion when she learned about the gruesome killing of her family through Facebook. The police and paramedics did arrive at the scene, but it was so gruesome that they had to implore forensic analysts to help identify the members since the faces of the family were beyond recognition. They later concluded that the weapon that was used was likely to be a hammer. It only went from bad to worse as Brenda and the extended family had to live with a new harsh reality. Days after the incident, Kathy and her husband were finally composed enough to make emotional public pleas. Calling for support to help solve the murders, Brenda, the only daughter and sole surviving child of Lynn from the gruesome attack, went on to live with the Shays. They initiated the idea for her to come live with them and be a part of their new family, as she had no other place to go at the time. However, the lack of strong leads, as well as the nature of the vicious attack, suggested a more personal motive than a simple burglary gone wrong. The authorities turned to family members and possible connections for their investigation. Robert Shi, a former ear, nose, and throat specialist in China before moving to Melbourne in 2006, was one of the early suspects, as many indications pointed to him. According to the Daily Telegraph, he had opened a restaurant in Melbourne, but when his new venture soon failed, he and his wife, Kathy, moved to Sydney and had been unemployed ever since. Various reports also suggested that he was close to his extended family. It would take over a year for any breakthrough evidence to surface. During a forensic examination of She's Garage in May 2010, experts found a tiny stain on the floor of the unkempt garage known as TY91. According to The Australian, one of the forensic experts trained in blood stain pattern analysis was convinced that TY91 looked like a transfer stain, the kind produced from coming into contact with an object such as clothing, a weapon, or a bag what with blood. Lab tests, however, proved that the tiny mark was consistent with the DNA of the Lin family members. She was subsequently arrested in May 2011, while his wife Kathy maintained his innocence. As all these new developments were happening, Brenda was still living with her new family. It took four trials spanning over seven and a half years before he was convicted. The first trial was aborted when a possible sexual motive emerged, but the court refused to identify the victim as she was still a minor at that point. She later opened up on how Robert has been sexually assaulting her in her home while her parents were still alive, and how he continued to assault her after Kathy and Robert took her in as a new family. The second trial was halted when the judge fell ill, while the third trial ended in the hung jury. Finally, in 2017, she was found guilty of murder. After the verdict was announced, she proclaimed, I did not murder the Lynn family. I am innocent. In a recount by Brenda, the only surviving child of the gruesome incident that claimed. The lives of the Lynn family, she said that it was 2009, and the high school student was preparing to fly to New California for an excursion and looked around a departure gate to see her classmates kissing their families. Goodbye. Being a prideful teenager, I did not say anything to my father. I just stood there awkwardly and thought to myself, 
It's just going to be a week I am. Going to see them again really soon. Miss Lynn, now in her 20s, told the sentencing hearing for her Uncle Robert she last. Week. But while she was overseas, she murdered her entire family. Her father, Min, Norman Lynn, her mother Unlai Lily Lynn, her Aunt Yoon Bin Irene Lynn, and her two little brothers Henry and Terry in the bedrooms of their North Epping home. On July 18, 2009. To this day, my biggest regret was not hugging my father and telling him I loved him too. Say thank you for being an amazingly loving and caring parent. This is a story of love gone bad. Ryan Poston was born on December 30, 1982, in Fort Mitchell, Kentucky, to Lisa Carter and Jay Poston. He had three younger sisters, Allison, Catherine, and Elizabeth Carter. He attended the International School Manila in the Philippines and the International School of Geneva in Switzerland during high school. Later, he attended Anna University, where he tripled majored in history, geography, and political science, then went to school at the Salmon P. Chase College of Law, Northern Kentucky University, and Highland Heights. Poston was a promising American attorney working in Cincinnati, Ohio, and was 28 years old when he met his post-lover. While his lover, Shane, and Michelle Ubersa was born on April 8, 1991, in Lexington, Kentucky, United States, she was 19 years old when they met. Ubers was a student at the University of Kentucky in Lexington, majoring in psychology. In 2011, Shana Ubers and Ryan Poston met on Meta, formerly known as Facebook. Poston stumbled upon a beautiful profile picture of Ubers on his mobile phone while surfing the social site. He was intrigued by Uber's beauty, prompting him to further check her profile. Poston was sure he wanted to be more than a friend to the person he had seen in the picture. He sent her a friend request. The duo began talking, and things were going smoothly with their conversation. During their talking stages, there were arguments, but that didn't put off a relationship, as the duo were so attached to one another. The reality between the duo differed from what had appeared to the public. However, the two shared an on-again, off-again romance for 18 months, often arguing over trivial matters. Poston and Ubers's on-off relationship was noticed by friends of the duo, which helped in figuring out what transpired when things got out of hand. Something bizarre happened, which turned a supposed beautiful evening into a morning evening. During the recount of Ubers before the major incident that happened in the story, she claimed on October 12, 2012, she was in the condo over lover ex-lover Poston. The duo was reported to have ended the relationship between them before the aforementioned date. On the said date, her ex-lover had a date with Miss Ohio USA 2012 Audrey Bolt that evening. Ubers, at some point, had claimed her relationship with Poston was abusive, and that was one of the main reasons the relationship with him didn't work out. On the evening Poston was to have a date with Miss Ohio USA 2012, things went sour with him and Ubers, his ex-girlfriend. In the pace of the evening, Ubers claimed Poston was calling her mother stupid and crazy. She further said he called her unstable and deranged, which triggered her, and she decided to leave his condo. But things didn't go as planned as he came for her as she approached the exit of the condo. Ubers said Poston grabbed onto her body, onto her person, with both hands. She claimed he had picked her up from an awkward angle in the house and threw her from the doorway of his bedroom into the other room to the edge of the short sofa. The ensuing struggle, Ubers said, Poston fell on her and pinned her against a footstool, thereby grabbing her hair and screaming in her left ear. She thought he was going to snap her neck because of the way he was jerking her head around. Ubers claimed all of his weight was on her at this point, and there was no way for her to escape for her life. In a further recount by Ubers, she claimed Posen had pushed her again the TV in his room, but during the investigation of the crime scene, the TV set was in perfect condition which contradicted her story, to get herself free from the pinning weight Poston had on her. She claimed to have punched him with the right arm, and when she did, it knocked the glasses off his face. She could get herself free, and the duo wrestled standing up. Ubers during her trial, recounts said. The four things got messy, eh? Poston was standing over her and grabbed the gun that was sitting on the table and pointing it at her, saying, I could just kill you right now and get away with it. Nobody would even know. She said she was shocked and afraid at the same time. This pipe Poston's words, he didn't shoot. 
Instead, he set the gun back on a table and continued to yell hurtful things at her. She was losing it, and to defend herself against Poston, she shot him six times. But what the investigator discovered was something that would leave you wondering what could have transpired between the two that evening. After Ubers had shot her ex-lover six times, she called the police immediately to report what had happened. She dialed 911 and told them she shot him in self-defense. After the initial report, she continued to tell the dispatcher that because he was twitching, and I knew he was going to die anyway, and he was making funny noises, I shot him a couple more times. Uber said he was twitching so badly, and I didn't want to watch him lay there and twitch. Police on the crime scene searched and recorded all information that could help with their investigation in the case. However, what Ubers had told the investigators was contradicting everything that was in the condo of Poston, which led the police to suspect Ubers murdered sitting in cold blood. Police brought Ubers to the police station for further questioning and interrogation. Officer Dave Fornash was the officer who interrogated her. She initially stated that she wanted an attorney but began to share details of the murder with him. During an interview with police, she said she knew Poston would die or be seriously injured. This was referred to according to a clip that emerged from her trial. Officer Four stated Ubers appeared unremorseful during a recount of the ugly incident and made several morbid jokes about the murder, including telling officers, I shot him right there, pointing to her nose. I gave him the nose job, which he had wanted. After the back and forth between the interrogator and Hubris, he left the interrogation room, and Hubris' behavior got stranger at this point. As she danced around the room, singing aloud and snapping her fingers as if she had just won a huge sum of money from a lottery. With all of Uber's actions and what she had recounted, it was evident that she had an active motive for killing Poston, which the police couldn't find out. However, most people who had weighed in on this case believe Ubers hadn't originally killed her ex-boyfriend for letting go of her and having a date with Miss Ohio USA. In April 2015, Ubers claimed Poston was violent toward her while the prosecution countered all she had to say with evidence that what she was saying was the opposite of what had happened. At some point, the prosecutor said that she was obsessed with the attorney. As the investigation revealed, she was sending about 50 to 100 texts per day sometimes to her ex-boyfriend. During the back and forth, the jury concluded and sent her to 40 years in prison for Poston's murder. She appealed, and her sentence was overturned the following year because it was revealed a convicted felon had served on the jury, which is not allowed by Kentucky law. While she was still in prison awaiting a conclusion to the case, Ubers was granted a second trial. Nivens and other former cellmates testified about her behavior behind bars and what she allegedly told them about Poston and his killing. One inmate, Cicely Miller, discusses Hubert's behavior after being arrested and how she never pressed remorse about killing her boyfriend. During Shane Uber's second trial in 2018, tech the then 21-year-old center of France before she murdered Ryan Poston seemed to display an escalation and violent ID, one that by all appearances went virtually unnoticed at the time. The prosecution brought forward witnesses who testified that Uber sent them a text message, joking that you wanted to accidentally shoot Poston at a gun range. Another witness testified that she had heard Uber's telling a co-worker that she was going to kill her boyfriend. Some text read, When I go to the shooting range with Ryan tonight, I want to turn around, shoot and kill him, and play like it's an accident, read the text, which was received by Uber's friend Christy Euler. Another one described Uber's growing rage at Poston, with Uber's state belief in a thin line between love and hate, and that her love for Poston had turned into hate. Toward the end of their relationship, Shauna Uber's had conducted many internet searches for a woman, which her ex-boyfriend had fronted on Facebook in January 2012 named Adri Belt. Belt, who was named Ms. Ohio USA the same year, eventually agreed to meet up for a date with Poston, having ended things with Hubers at that time. In an interview with a local Kentucky station via CBS, Bolt recalled her impression of Poston. He was very funny and very smart, and I found him very entertaining, and that led me to accept an invitation to go on a date with him. She recalled, Poston, it seemed, was also as excited and enthusiastic about the proposed date, but he reportedly told his stepfather, Peter Carter, that he was struggling over how to tell Ubers about it, effectively putting the final nail in the coffin to their year and a half long relationship. I told them to make sure that he was kind to Shayna and that he told her honestly what was going on. 
said Carter at Hebrew's second trial in 28 per CBS before recounting how Poston had also expressed worry that Ubers would ultimately sabotage Tajit describing her as always around. Tragically, Post would be murdered by Ubers only hours before he was due to meet Bold in person. A psychologist testified that she suffered from PTSD and borderline personality disorder and claimed the emotional abuse and distress caused by posting led to her violent act of murder. Ubers was convicted of murder again in 2018. This time on August 28, 2018, she was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole in 2032. In her most recent mugshot taken in 2019, she is smiling. What do you think about this cold case? Let me have your thoughts or opinions in the comments section. Patricia Colombo Having been sentenced to 200 to 300 years in prison means a lot. And that is what this case is all about. 20-year-old Patricia had left her family home two years earlier to live with DeLuca, a 36-year-old married man. When Patricia was 16 years old, she worked in a suburban coffee shop where she met pharmacist Frank DeLuca, who managed the pharmacy next door to the coffee shop where she worked. DeLuca and Patricia developed some sort of chemistry, and with the duo, things led to another in which he hired her to work in a store, and the two began an unusual sexual relationship. Patricia showed classmates pictures of her having sex with DeLuca's dog. DeLuca and Patricia's relationship was growing so deep and out of hand at the same time, considering the fact that her lover was a married man, and the relationship was made public. In April 1974, DeLuca brought Patricia to stay in his own home, even though he still lived with his wife and five kids. However, she accepted to move into her lover's home, but she simply told her parents she was moving to her apartment. Her parents were relieved when she told them she was going to move into her apartment and not some random person's home, which prompted her parents to give her money for upkeep. Patricia wasn't able to keep up with the lies that she had told her parents, and soon they found out that DeLuca had left his wife and moved in with her daughter, prompting Patricia's father to beat DeLuca severely. The situation triggered some sort of hatred from the duo towards Columbus's family, which made them come up with a plan that changed things from bad to worse. On May 4, 1976, Patricia Colombo, who was 19 then, and Frank DeLuca, 39, decided to carry out a plan on Columbus's family after several deliberations on how to carry out the plan. The duo came up with a plan. The duo was ready to execute their much deliberated plan. They observed the environment and later crept into the home of Columbus and shot every living creature found therein. On May 7, 1976, Chicago police found a car belonging to one Elk Grove resident, Frank Colombo, abandoned after apparently being stolen. The Chicago police informed counterparts in Elk Grove, however. The bodies of everyone killed weren't discovered until three days later on May 7 when a village police officer showed up to inform Frank that one of the family cars had been found in a poor black neighborhood on the city's west side. The responding officer who went to Frank Columbus's residence to inquire about the car noticed the front door ajar and delivered newspapers piled up on the front step of the otherwise immaculately landscaped home. The patrolman pushed open the door and saw Frank's bodies piled across the living room stairs with a piece of the bowling trophy sticking out of his gashed skull and immediately radioed for backup. Even though the family's car had been found miles away in Chicago, there were no indications that anything else in the house had been disturbed or taken. What he had seen was no ordinary crime. The Elk Grove community was thrown into confusion when the family was discovered dead. Police began investigation upon investigation to connect the dots of the murder, but there was no lead. Frank, 43 years old, who was the father, had been shot four times in the hat. Before he died, however, he had been cruelly tortured and beaten. Police reported he had been beaten with a bone trophy and the lamb so severely that the back of his head was disintegrated. There were several cigarette burns on his body, and he had also been stabbed in the throat and chest. His wife Mary, who was 41 years, was shot once between the eyes. It was reported that her throat had been slashed, and she also had been beaten, this time with a glass face. She was clad in a nightgown, and her underwear had been pulled down to her ankles. However, an autopsy later revealed there were no signs of sexual assault. Their son, Michael, who was 13 years old, was also killed. He had also been shot, beaten with a bowling trophy, and stabbed over 80 times 
mostly in the neck with a pair of sewing scissors. There were indications that he had been sleeping when the attack occurred and was awakened and forced out of bed by his killers. The only surviving member of the family was the Columbus 19-year-old daughter, Patricia, who was living apart from her family with a 37-year-old co-worker, Frank DeLuca. Police questioned Patricia but had no reason to back her until the following week, as some of her behavior raised red flags to investigators. Ray Rose, the investigating detective, said that he has never forgotten what he saw that day. Evil, death, tragedy were his initial thoughts when he saw the carnage. What I saw was very curious. Rose saw the Sun-Times in May 2006. If you had just found out your whole family had been killed, you'd run to the scene. Patricia and DeLuca had initially wanted staged murders to make them look like mob hits or the work of black street gangs. Patricia went to the police stage and began suggesting possible motives and leads. One, which was quickly ruled out, was that Frank Columbus was the target of a mob hit. There was never any sign that he was in any way connected to organized crime. Lying to police in the course of a murder investigation is never a good idea. And when you're the sole surviving member of the family, it's an even worse decision. As a result of Patricia's statements and behavior after the crimes, Patricia Colombo became the chief suspect. In all bids to unravel the true case of the murder of Columbus's family, a hint came in. Inspired by the promise of reward money, a friend led police to the men who had discussed killing the Columbia family with Patricia. The detectives quickly established roles for themselves to make Patricia crack. Instead of good cop, bad cop, one detective described as looking like Tom Jones assumed the role of a boyfriend. At her family's wake and funeral, Patty flirted openly with the detective, to the point where her grieving relatives thought he was the displaced DeLuca, who had alienated her from her family. DeLuca's caught a notice in the corner of the funeral home. When Patricia wasn't joking, smoking, or flirting, she flung herself on top of her parents' and little brother's close caskets wailing with grief. After the couple was arrested, DeLuca's employees revealed that they had seen him wash and burn blood-stained clothes on the day after the murders. He had kept them silent by threatening their families. DeLuca attempted to have these witnesses killed by a cellmate, but another inmate thwarted the plan by telling the police. Ross, the investigating detective, chronicled how Columbus, the 19, plotted for eight months to kill her family, soliciting friends and acquaintances to carry out the murders. The investigating detective revealed that in December of 1975, Patricia met two men that she seduced and tried to hire to kill her family. Patricia claims one of the men forced her to have sex. She provided them with a diagram of the Columbus home and photos of the family. However, the men did not act on her request. And on May 4, 1976, she and Luca, her 37-year-old boyfriend, entered the home and attacked her family. During the course of interrogation, Patricia revealed that she wanted to beat her father to the punch, claiming she feared he had ordered a hit on her and her lover. Evidence revealed that the duo were willing participants in the murder, with Patricia acting as a decoy to be admitted to the house. When Frank Colombo opened the door and turned around, DeLuca entered and shot him with a 32 caliber handgun. During a detailed narration of how the incidents occurred, it was revealed that DeLuca, who did the shooting, shot Frank who had been killed first as he tried to escape by running up the living room stairs. Patricia bludgeoned her father with a bully trophy. Mary was found cowering in the bathroom, her favorite room in the house where she had once lovingly hand-painted each bathroom tile with gold filigree. She had been shot dead center between the eyes. Patricia or DeLuca slit her throat just in case the bullet didn't take care of her. Although the Cook County Medical Examiner said that Mary was probably dead before she even hit the floor. The last victim was Michael, who had slept through the initial gunshots. The two woke Michael up and stood him upright, half asleep in his bedroom, while DeLuca shot him. Patty then stabbed Michael 87 times with her mother's sewing scissors. When police found Michael's body, they said at first glance, it looked as if Michael has had a case of the measles. Until they realized that the measles were dozens of tiny red gashes. DeLuca admitted to shooting the victims. However, Columbus's date has not owned up to her part in the murder. A few days later, Patty was charged with three counts of first-degree premeditated murder. In detailed evidence tended to the court, the cops determined that Patricia had originally set out to hire him in, a couple of losers she met in a motel cocktail lounge, to murder her family. 
She had even gone so far as to draw a map of her parents' house, along with the warning that the family's white miniature poodle was a yapper. After the supposed hitman had strong Patty along, having sex with her and ripping her off of $2,000, Patty persuaded Aluka to help her carry out the job. Columbo and DeLuca were convicted of shooting her parents, Mary and Frank Columbo, and brother Michael and mutilating their bodies. They sentenced both to 200 to 300 years in prison for the murders and another 150 years each for conspiracy to commit murder. Columbo received an additional 50-year prison term for solicitation to commit murder. It all ended badly for the lovers who wanted to have it all at all costs. Bonnie Baker Murder Case it was June 19, 1998 when Bonnie Baker was last seen alive. She had a vibrant personality and had gone partying with her friends at the Fort Restaurant in Morrison to celebrate her pay raise at work. And guess what the most horrifying thing is? Her body was not even discovered until the following year. It was only in 1999 that her body was discovered on Navajo land. But this is not yet the end of the mystery. Sadly, the identification process of the skeletal remains took another 14 years. An unknown woman dialed 911 to inform the police that a woman had been murdered in her apartment on Louisiana Avenue. She even informed the Denver police that the suspect, Cressman Nina Perez, who was Bonnie's boyfriend, was heading towards Mexico with the body of the woman being stored in the trunk of his car. Later on July 1, 1998, a great breakthrough was achieved. The police got their hands on a red geoprism car that had crashed near Globe, Arizona. The striking thing is that the car had a resemblance to the description that the caller had supplied the police with. Police visited the site of the car crash and got evidence of blood from the car's truck. Yes, things do get murkier at this point. Coming to the most horrifying point, it was on July 31, 1999 when a couple of boys who were enjoying horse rides came across a human skull on Navajo land in New Mexico. Not only the skull, but several other skeletal remains were also found. Exhaustive forensic research and an autopsy failed to identify whose body it was and what was the cause of death. After several years passed on, it was only in 2021 that the Denver Police Department came to know that the DNA samples from the skeletal remains actually belonged to Bonnie Baker. The police, after getting confirmation that these skeletal remains were that of Bonnie, took rapid action to arrest her boyfriend, Nina Perez. The very day when Bonnie was partying with her friends for her pay raise, Perez was fired from his job. Both of them had the same workplace. He was already furious with Bonnie celebrating with her friends. When he had come to the party, he struck out. It was only in 2021 that named Perez was arrested by the Denver Police Department from Mexico. He will now have to go through a series of trials, hearings, and whatnot. Bonnie Baker's soul will now rest in peace and we are happy that she deserved her share of justice. Murder in the Vatican Emmanuel Orlandi was born and raised in Vatican City, the Pope's residence and a major tourist destination. She was on her way home from a flute lesson on June 22, 1983 when she vanished. She called home later that evening and spoke with one of her sisters, but her family never heard from her after that. Orlandi was last seen at a bus station in Rome City Center before disappearing forever. In July 2019, forensic researchers discovered a strangely empty crypt while searching for Orlando's remains. Since 1983, the Orlandi family has been following leads concerning Emmanuel's disappearance, which has taken them down unusual paths. They petitioned the Vatican in 2019 to gain access to Princess Sophie of Owen Lewis's grave, who died in 1836. In an anonymous letter, a source directed them to the tomb and they opened two burial sites where Orlando's remains were allegedly buried. There was no trace of Orlando or anyone else when the experts opened the tomb. Although no one had been inside the tomb since 1836, it was evident that something unusual had occurred. There were no human skeletons or burial urns to be found. The Vatican had anticipated finding two tombs, but not two empty tombs. They were absolutely baffled. The Orlandi family has had to deal with a slew of bizarre tips and suspicions regarding Emmanuel's whereabouts. The evidence varies from hearsay to cryptic musings, all of which raise more questions than they answer. Pietro Orlandi has received a plethora of information concerning his sister, and he is prone to following up on any leads he has provided, no matter how bizarre they may appear. The Manuel Orlando's family has heard every explanation about her disappearance. 
Many of the tips they get come from people who think they saw her in a crowd, but the details seem more like movie plots than real-life scenarios. Regardless of how bizarre some of these leads are, the family investigates them in the hopes of learning more about Orlando's disappearance. In 2008, Sabrina Minardi, who dated mobster Enrico de Pettis, claimed that Orlandi had been kidnapped by American Archbishop Palmer Chinkis, the former president of the Vatican Bank. But it's unclear why he allegedly wanted her off the streets. Marchand Cass died in 2006, and despite his involvement in an Italian banking crisis in the 1980s, no allegations of kidnapping or child endangerment were ever made. The Vatican simply stated that Minardi's claims came from a source whose value is exceedingly doubtful. Some have claimed to have seen Orlando alive over the years. The Orlandi family is still hoping to find her alive after three decades of searching, no matter how unlikely it seems. Some of those who claim to have seen Orlando believe they've run into her on the street, with tales coming in from as far as Turkey and England. Others, on the other hand, appeared to be more interested in personal gain. An anonymous phone call was made to a television show about Orlando's disappearance in 2005, alerting the family to a local mobster's tomb. To solve the case, Gosai who's buried in the crypt of the Basilica of Santa Apollinari, the caller stated, referring to the burial of former mobster Enrico Depis, who died in a gun duel in 1990. The same caller stated that Cardinal Hugo Paletti, Rome's vicar general at the time, ordered Orlandi to be taken off the streets. The tipper, however, did not provide any additional information on Paletti's involvement nor did he provide any evidence to back up his claim. When forensic experts explored the grave, they discovered not just Petty's remains, but also numerous more bones. The police claimed they'd analyzed the remains to see if any belonged to Orlando at the time, but no findings have been released. Despite all of the hints that have been thrown out to the press since Orlandi's disappearance in the early 1980s, no one has ever been arrested. Anonymous sources have mentioned several Italian mobsters in the news, but none have ever been officially linked to Orlando. Mammoth Alia Slukra's assertions were essential in hindering further investigation into the issue. Bulgaria and Spice and the KGB have also been blamed for the crime, in addition to the Grey Wolves and a nebulous Masonic organization. Roberto Calvi, one of the suspects, was discovered hanging in London just before Orlandi vanished. Everyone, including prominent members of the Vatican, seems to have an opinion about Emmanuel Orlandi's disappearance. The Vatican's leading exorcist, Father Gabriel Amorth, believes Orlandi was kidnapped to be shuttled around sex parties and used as a slave. The allegation is debatable, and Amorth has no evidence to back it up, but he is adamant in his conviction. In addition to his theories concerning Orlando's presumed captivity, Amorth is convinced that someone from the Vatican assisted in her abduction and that she has since died. He told the publication Les Tampa, this was a sexually motivated crime. Parties were planned with the Vatican Jean Darmory serving as the girl's recruiter. Diplomatic staff from a foreign embassy to the Holy See were participating in the network. Emanuela, I feel, became a victim of the circle. Emmanuel Orlandi's family has concluded that more than one person is responsible for her abduction. Decades after she went missing, they haven't indicated whether they believe the death was caused by a government or religious organization. But her brother Pietro Orlandi finds it inexplicable that no one has come forward with concrete evidence. I'm incapable of accepting injustices, especially when it involves my sister, especially knowing that there are people who know what transpired throughout the years. Their right to know the truth and their right to be treated fairly are precious rights to me that no one can ever take away. Ricky McCormick's Last and Only Cipher Ricky McCormick was discovered dead in a cornfield in West Alton, Missouri, on June 30, 1999. Two pages of handwritten notes in McCormick's front pocket included a complicated cipher that the FBI, the American Cryptogram Association, and countless amateur code breakers have yet to decode. According to a family relative, McCormick was a high school dropout who could not write in code. He couldn't spell a word and could only doodle. Authorities had to use fingerprints to make a definitive ID because McCormick's body had been rotting in the field for several days before being discovered. Even after an autopsy and a toxicology report, the medical examiner struggled to pinpoint a cause of death due to the rate of decomposition. However, Detectives classified his death as a homicide after considering the suspicious aspect of where his body was discovered, 
as the region has previously been used to dump murder victims. The two notes discovered in McCormick's pocket had 30 lines of seemingly random letters and numbers on them. Some of the code is enclosed in parentheses, while others are circled. McCormick was an ex-con who worked part-time at a gas station and went back and forth between staying with relatives and living on the streets. He also had heart and lung problems and was receiving disability benefits at the time of his death. He had a slew of offenses on his record, as well as a spell in prison for statutory rape. Even though McCormick did not own a car and public transportation did not serve the region where he was discovered, his body was found 50 miles from his home. According to his ex-girlfriend, McCormick traveled by bus to Florida sometimes, where he allegedly served as a mule for drug dealers, transporting marijuana back to Missouri. McCormick's mental state has been the subject of various reports. McCormick's public attorney claimed he was suffering from some mental sickness or defect while awaiting trial for statutory rape. They had him evaluated by a local psychologist who determined that McCormick was mentally capable of standing trial. McCormick was described as street smart, with an active imagination and a naive, childlike attitude toward the world, while never having been diagnosed with any mental illnesses. McCormick's fiancé reported a few days before his death that he was agitated and apprehensive after returning from a cocaine smuggling job in Florida. In the days leading up to his death, he visited various hospitals for treatment of chest problems and asthma. Some investigators believe he wasn't asking for medical help, but rather a safe place to remain since he feared his life was in danger. The FBI's Cryptanalysis and Racketeering Records Unit had spent all of its efforts cracking the encryption by 2011. In a 2011 statement, the FBI stated, Breaking the code could expose the victim's whereabouts before his death and potentially lead to the solution of a homicide. According to some family members, Ricky had been writing in code since he was a child. The notes are said to be real by experts, including the FBI agent in charge of the case. Small characteristics in the handwriting, such as circles around sections of the code, suggest it was a personal document, potentially a to-do list. According to the FBI, the most difficult aspect of this case is that McCormick most likely wanted the notes to be read only by him. Unlike other well-known ciphers, such as the Zodiac Killer, who wish for their codes to be solved at some point. Of course, there's a chance McCormick didn't develop the code. Specialists haven't been able to establish the notes are in his handwriting decisively. It's also possible that the code was developed for him by the drug traffickers for whom he worked, or that he was simply carrying the cipher from when he looked to another without realizing its significance. The FBI has set up a website dedicated to the case, inviting amateur code breakers to participate in the investigation. Ultimately, it is thought that the code contains information that will aid in the capture of McCormick's killers. Gail Barrett, Rape and Murder Case A 30-year-old woman named Gail Barrett from Battle Creek did not return home after she was last seen at Speed's coffee shop. Battle Creek got shaken to its core by this brutal homicide of the 30-year-old woman. Almost two weeks after Gail's disappearance, her body was found by the investigating team. It was on River Road in Emmett Township where the police got their hands on the remains of the lady. And that was exactly when they learned that Mrs. Barrett was raped and then stabbed to death. There was one person who had not lost hope through this entire ordeal of investigations and inquiries. It was Mrs. Barrett's son, James Barrett. He had relentlessly tried to help the police in every way he could. Ultimately, on January 25, 2021, James received the call he had been waiting for for several years. He said, Sergeant Marshall called and informed me that it had just come through from Michigan State Police Labs. In fact, some of the early tests ruled Plato out. DNA was still in its infancy, and I have documents that indicated he had been ruled out. However, there were subsequent tests conducted on other pieces of evidence, including blood, that came back inconclusive. The police investigated the family and a couple of Gail Barrett's friends to see if they could provide any leads. Out of the two friends of Mrs. Barrett, there was a person called Mr. Roger Plato, who was already killed after being shot by the police during a violent confrontation, which occurred three days before the police came across the remains of Mrs. Barrett. Although Plato's body was cremated, the police had collected his blood sample. This very blood sample helped them trace the murder of Mrs. Barrett. The rapist and murderer was none other than Gail Barrett's friend, Roger Plato. The murder of Mrs. Barrett went unsolved for a long span of 30 years. Eventually, the case turned cold, 
and nothing came out of it. Now, 30 years is a long period, and we can't even imagine how James and his family went through such a tormenting time. The lives of the Barrett family changed forever since that traumatic incident, and all they had been hoping for was to see the murderer brought to justice. Destiny has its way of punishing people for their deeds, and probably that is why Roger Plato died in that confrontation, long before Mrs. Barrett's body was even found. I think it is a relief for most of us and a weight off our shoulders. Having an answer. And that, to me, was the biggest thing, said Barrett. He even said, I think if somebody was around today, now we've got to endure a trial, which then creates a lot of other issues. And then we potentially don't get a conviction. And then what? Even with a DNA match because so much time has elapsed, eyewitnesses have either passed away or they can't be relied upon for their statements 32 years later. So I'm kind of glad it wound up the way it is. Stephanie Isaacson The discovery of Stephanie Isaacson's school books was the first clue that she had been murdered. They were discovered by her father while searching for her at a desert lot, a half mile from her home. His 14-year-old daughter returned home from school on June 1, 1989. When Isaacson called El Dorado High School, he discovered she had not been able to make it to class that day. Stephanie had been bludgeoned in the brush near the residential area of Stewart Avenue in Lynn Lane, where a Las Vegas police dog found her at 11 p.m. She had been sexually assaulted and strangled to death. Isaacson went home after the coroner had departed the parking lot and dialed a local radio station. And he told them to play her favorite song, When Beneath My Wings, by Bette Midler. The case would remain unsolved for the next 32 years. The case only heated up again in 2020 when local entrepreneur and philanthropist Justin Wu donated $5,000 to the tech-based Othram Lab who requested that the lab process a cold case from the Metropolitan Police Department to serve the community. The department then began debating which case should be chosen for the test. Dan Long, a cold case investigator, said his associate, Terry Miller, was the one who dug up Stephanie's file first. Miller built a friendship with her family over three years and gave updates every six months. At first, the lab was unable to match the DNA found in Stephanie's clothes. Nonetheless, Miller pressed on. In January, police sent the remaining 12 tenths of a nanogram of DNA that is the equivalent of 15 human cells to the lab. For reference, a normal consumer genetic test on a site like Ancestry.com uses at least 750 nanograms. In July 2021, the department announced a match, breaking the global record for using the least amount of DNA to solve a case in the process. Authorum Lab was able to create a DNA profile of the suspect using the limited usable sample. From there on, genealogists created limbs of a family tree. Investigators probed deeper into the case and came up with two plausible culprits. They eventually settled on Darren Roy March, who was charged in 1986 with killing a 25-year-old woman. Unfortunately, there will never be a trial. He committed suicide at the age of 29 in 1995. The DNA logged at his suicide was a match for the semen on Stephanie's garment. Stephanie's family was devastated by the news. During a recent phone conversation from his home in South Dakota, her father stated that son of a bitch got me twice. The first time he killed my daughter, and the second time I didn't get a chance to see him in the eyes. March's biography has become hazy over time, and his family has declined to comment. However, some facts have been preserved. When he was 20 years old, he was charged with strangling 25-year-old Nanette Van Inberg in March 1986. Vandenberg was discovered naked in her East Tropicana Avenue apartment's bathtub, and March's fingerprints were discovered near the body. According to his arrest report, Martin was with Vandenberg at the now-defunct Nirvana Place Casino when she was killed. He confessed to detectives that he had left her there and gone to bed. After two days of testimony, the lawsuit was dismissed. The fingerprint evidence was deemed insufficient to proceed by the Department of Peace. Since then, Police have linked the DNA found in the case to that found in Isaacson's case, and it was a match. According to Clark County District Court documents, Martin was also awaiting punishment for open and gross lewdness when Stephanie died on July 1, 1989. He was charged with five counts of open and gross lewdness in January 1989, one for each of the ladies he was accused of publicly exposing himself to. March pleaded guilty to one offense in April, and the others were dropped. He was sentenced to a maximum of one year of probation on August 29th, and nine months later, he was released from probation. 
With the money donated to Othram Lab, Metro hopes to analyze at least one more cold case. Investigators are now trying to figure out why Martin killed himself and if he had any other victims. I'd like to think that he committed suicide because of the things he was doing, Long said, but I can't tell you that at this point. Julie and Hansen Julie and Hansen was 15 years old when she disappeared on July 7, 1972, in Naperville, Illinois. She sang in the school chorus, was a member of the school band, and taught Sunday school. She took her brother's bicycle one summer evening after school to bike to a baseball game. She was never going to come back. Julie was reported missing to the police after she failed to return home. Officers and community volunteers investigated the area around 80th Street and Knollwood Road and recovered her abandoned bicycle. Julie's body was discovered the next day in a cornfield near Modiff Road and 80th Street. She had been kidnapped, raped, and murdered, and she had 36 wounds on her body from a sharp instrument. Despite their best efforts, investigators were unable to identify a suspect in the case and make an arrest. Major Morris, a convicted killer, was a suspect in the murder, but there was no evidence linking him to the crime scene. Morris assassinated Roberta Bobby Anderson, a 16-year-old girl, on September 1973. Bobby had been thrown on abandoned farmland less than a mile from her home and was discovered with 60 stab wounds. Both killings took place in the early 1970s, and the victims were adults and girls who had been raped, stabbed multiple times, and dumped in rural places. Morris was a kid working as a trash collector at the time of Anderson's murder, and he relocated suspiciously a few days after his body was discovered. Major Morris was free for 23 years before being apprehended in 1992 for the murder of Bobby Anderson when authorities received a blood sample linking him to the crime. Morris then confessed to the rape and murder in a police recording. Morris' involvement came as a great shock to his wife, friends, and family. When asked to describe him, they described him as a gentleman, and police discovered he had no criminal record. Margaret Stern went missing in September 1978 after attempting to hitchhike home from work. Morris was later accused of Stern's murder, and he later admitted to it. Both of his victims' remains were located close to where Hansen's body was discovered in 1972. However, Morris was not Julie and Hansen's assassin. Bruce Everett Lundahl, an American serial killer and rapist, was ruled out as a possibility in 2020. Lundahl was a suspect in a dozen other rapes and killings that occurred in the 1970s and 1980s, including the 1976 murder of a 16-year-old girl in DuPage County. In April 1981, while stabbing a teenage kid to death in his flat, the attacker accidentally stabbed himself in the thigh. Lundahl's injury was fatal, and he succumbed to his injuries immediately. Bruce Everett Lindahl was active around the time of Julie and Hansen's murder and used a similar method to her killer. He raped his victims and repeatedly stabbed them to death. He also lived in Illinois. His DNA was compared to that found at the Hansen crime site in 2020 and determined to be unmatched, ruling him out as the perpetrator. In 2021, a suspect was finally found and charged for Julie's murder. Barry Lee Wellay, aged 76, was arrested in Mankato, Minnesota. Hansen was in his late 20s at the time of her murder and lived less than a mile from the victim's family home. The key to cracking the case was genetic genealogy and Hansen's assassination was never regarded as a cold case. Despite the lack of evidence, cold case investigators never gave up on the case and worked on it for nearly 50 years. With the advancement of DNA technology, investigators were able to get closer to the criminal. A small amount of DNA left behind at the crime scene was used to create a genetic profile of the killer. The profile was then entered into commercial genetic genealogy databases, where a DNA sample from one of Welpley's relatives had been uploaded. Detectives then put out a family tree that led them to Barry Lee Welpley. Julie Hansen's family said in a statement, As you might assume, it has been a long journey for our family. We are forever grateful for all those who have worked on this case throughout the many years. Welpley was arrested for Hansen's murder and held in a Ramsey County jail on a $10 million bond. He has been extradited to Illinois, where he will stand trial for his crimes. Progress in DNA technology is going on at an amazing speed. With such great development, we can expect hundreds of other serial killers to be caught and brought to justice for their crimes. Here's to hoping that the victim's families finally find peace and closure. She should not be forgotten, 
and neither should the failure of the legal system. Hubert Alive eased Dow women. In 1970, at the height of the Cold War, a burnt body of a woman was discovered in a remote part of Norway. She had taken sleeping pills, ingested carbon monoxide, and had been burned alive. According to an autopsy, luggage belonging to the woman was later discovered containing money from several different countries. She was eventually detected traveling around Europe with several fraudulent passports using various aliases. A family trekking in the East Dal Valley near Bergen in western Norway came across the woman's burnt body. She was badly burned in the front and discovered with her hands lifted to her chest in a defensive stance. Personal items such as a watch, an umbrella, some jewelry, and many empty bottles were strewn about the body. Authorities believe the items were unusually positioned around the body, almost as if they were part of a ceremony. Her clothes were composed of synthetic fibers and didn't have any tags on them. Initially, it was assumed that she was in her 30s. She had ingested between 50 and 70 tablets of vino barbital and had bruises around her neck. She had also inhaled carbon monoxide, suggesting that she had been burned alive. Her death was considered suicide by Norwegian officials due to the lack of identifying documents and the presence of a substantial amount of sleeping tablets in her system. A few days later, a pair of luggage containing fingerprints matching the murdered woman was discovered at a train station in Bergen. Inside were wigs, makeup, clothing, eczema ointment, non-prescription eyeglasses, maps, and small sums of money from Norway, the United Kingdom, Switzerland, and Belgium. 100 Deutsche Marks were also hidden inside the case's lining. Any identifying information had been removed, cut out, or rubbed off, even the eczema cream, which usually included the name of the prescribing doctor on the packaging, couldn't provide a clue. The sophisticated dental work of the Istel woman was unheard of in Norway at the time. According to stable isotope research of her teeth, she was born in Nuremberg and grew up on the German-French border. Inside a luggage, the investigation detectives discovered a shopping bag, which they used to trace the woman's movements before she died. She had visited Norway numerous times over the years, staying in various hotels using counterfeit passports and false aliases. According to a 2017 investigation, she claimed to be Claudia Teeld from Brussels at one hotel. She was Elizabeth Bean Hofer at another. People who interacted with her were eventually tracked down and interviewed. They all spoke of a stylish woman with black hair and brown eyes who was attractive, pleasant, and only paid in cash. She also wore wigs, spoke numerous languages, including French, Flemish, and English, and seemed tense most of the time. Years later, the Norwegian National Defense released information indicating that the woman may have been traveling around the country observing the testing of the top-secret anti-ship Penguin missile. A fisherman had noticed a woman following the movements of Norwegian army troops. Is there any logic to the spy story? During the Cold War, Norway was a hotspot in the early 1970s. It not only shared a border with the Soviet Union but also assisted the United States in the United Kingdom during Russian nuclear testing and submarine warfare. Russian intelligence assets, as well as personnel from the CIA, MI, and Mossad, were known to be present in the country. After seeing a sketch of the Istel woman in 2005, a man from Bergen came forward. He reported seeing a person matching her description, hiking on a hillside approximately an hour away from Istel five days before her body was discovered in 1970. She was dressed inappropriately for the weather and was being pursued by two men who looked southern. According to him, he told the police what he observed, but they dismissed his claim. A section of the lower jaw of the Istel woman was removed and saved before she was buried. Her teeth showed traces of extensive dental surgery which was unusual for Norway at the time. In 2017, a stable isotope examination of her teeth revealed that she was born in Nuremberg around 1930 and grew up near the French-German border. Her dental work was found to have been done in Central Asia, East Asia, Southern Europe, and South America. The case continues to pique people's interests. In 2018, the BBC World Service and the Norwegian Broadcast Corporation released a podcast called Death in Ice Valley, which delves into the death of the Istel women in great detail. While the stable isotope study provided answers to some questions, such as the woman's age and birth country, many more remain unanswered. Was she a saboteur? If that's the case, who killed her and why? Who was she employed by? What's more, why haven't any friends? family, or loved ones come forward. 
This is a case that might remain shrouded in mystery forever.